Good evening, I am Trinice Riggs, Chair of the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach, Virginia, and I hereby call this meeting to order at 6.02 p.m. on this 23rd day of May 2023. Thank you to those who have joined us in person and online. Madam Clerk, will you please announce those school board members in attendance? Thank you, Madam Chair. Present in the Holland Road Annex School Board Room is Chair Riggs, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Brown, Mr. Callan, Mr. Culpepper, Ms. Manning, Ms. Martin, Ms. Melnick, and attending via Zoom is Ms. Owens and Ms. Weems. Remote participation for school board members. In accordance with School Board Bylaw 1-36D, a school board member may participate remotely in a school board meeting when notice has been provided to the school board chair and the remotely participating school board member notes the reason for remote participation and the location from where the school board member is participating. For today's meeting, I have been notified that the following school board meeting members are participating remotely. Jessica Owens, can you state the reason for your remote participation and where you are participating from? Yes, I'm in uh, Maryland. Uh, assisting my husband recovering from surgery. Thank you. Carolyn Weems, can you state the reason for your remote participation and where you are participating from? Um, yes, I'm uh, zooming in from home. I'm sick. Thank you. And um, is Jennifer Franklin online, Miss? Ms. Franklin is not online. Okay, and she stated that she probably would not be able to uh, be participating she is out of town, so um, she's moving around. She would not be able to, to zoom in. So our moment of silence will be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me in observing a moment of silence. Please stand as you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We will now have the Student Employee and Public Awards and Recognition, and our presenter will be Ms. Kim Melnick. This evening, the school board has the pleasure of recognizing division students and staff for their achievements. And tonight, we will start with the Class of 2023 E.E. E. Brickell Scholar from Princess Anne High School. Our first honoree this evening is the class of 2023 E.E. E. Brickell Scholar. Please welcome Princess Anne High School IB student Vikram Kohli. The E.E. E. Brickell Scholars Program recognizes excellence in scholarship, leadership, and service among high school students in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. It awards a $6,000 scholarship to a single student yearly. The scholarship committee at each high school selects two students who will have the opportunity to attend a series of three seminars arranged by members of the Virginia Beach Rotary Club. The recipient of the E.E. E. Brickell Scholarship is chosen from this group of scholars. Vikram is a senior and the 2023 class president at Princess Anne High School. He plays violin and is an avid reader. Vikram engages in the literary community to the fullest extent and advocates for students by speaking at school board meetings. He works with the Department of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, drafting plans and evaluating di district initiatives on the VBCPS Equity Council. Vikram will be furthering his education at Harvard University, where he hopes to concentrate in history and literature with a secondary study in economics. Congratulations, Vikram. That's a wonderful achievement.
Our next recognition this evening is to a first place winner in the 2023 Virginia DECA State Leadership Conference. Please welcome Abby Marcus. <laughs> Abby placed first in the Quick Serve Restaurant Series event. There were over 60 students from all over the state in her category. The competition consisted of a written test and two role play events. Last month, Abby also represented Kemsville High School and Virginia Beach City Public Schools at the International Career Development Conference in Orlando. Congratulations, Abby, we are so proud of you. Our next recognition this evening is for the first place winners of the National Brain Brawl Championships. Please welcome the Princess Anne High School NJROTC Brain Brawl Team. The Princess Anne High School NJROTC Brain Brawl team placed first in the National Brain Brawl Championships held in Colt Neck, New Jersey. Brain Brawl is a team academic concept similar to Scholastic Bowl, but focused on the Navy science curriculum, along with current events, pop culture, and leadership fundamentals. Each of the 12 NJROTC district, districts contain about 60 high schools. Only the top two teams from each district can compete. At the national competition, the team faced the top 24 brain brawl teams from across the country. The Princess Anne NJROTC won this national competition last year, making them back-to-back -back national champions. The brain brawl team members are Kiona Kang, Ryan Otto, Ella Schofield, Kenul Ventwest, and Austin Zowell. Congratulations, students. We are proud of you. Our next recognition is for the students who have been named to the Virginia Music Education Association's All Virginia Band, All Virginia Chorus, All Virginia Orchestra, Honors Choir, and All Virginia Elementary Chorus. These students were selected from among their peers throughout the Commonwealth for inclusion in the state's prestigious musical groups. These are the highest awards possible for state recognition in music. To be selected means that the student has distinguished themselves as a top performer in their strand. Let's start by meeting those who have earned this honor, and please hold your applause until the end. From Bayside High School, Brianna Massenberg, All Virginia Chorus, and Nancy Phillips, Virginia Senior, Senior Honors Choir. From Cox High School, Gabriel Lerner, All Virginia Band, Braden Cruz, All Virginia Orchestra, Elias Shapiro, All Virginia Orchestra. From Kellum High School, V. Rose Doucette, All Virginia Chorus, Benjamin Goodman, All Virginia Band, Anna Rockmore, All Virginia Band. And from Lansdowne High School, Kimberly Cherry, Virginia Senior Honors Choir. From Ocean Lakes High School, Vincent Yee, All Virginia Orchestra, Amanda Sue, All Virginia Orchestra, and Nathan He, All Virginia Orchestra. And from Parkway Elementary School, Elise Formillion, All Virginia Elementary Chorus, Ariana Correa, All Virginia Elementary Chorus, Madison Cedino, All Virginia Elementary Chorus, and Miranda Cedino, All Virginia Elementary Chorus. From Princess Anne High School, Sadie Ford, All Virginia Band, Matt Malpia, All Virginia Band, Max and Taxter, All Virginia Chorus, Matthias Chambers, All Virginia Chorus, Christina Wong, All Virginia Orchestra. And from Salem High School, Alex Joes, All Virginia Band, Mackenzie Estrada, All Virginia Chorus, Adriana Cran, All Virginia Chorus, Madison Salisbury, All Virginia Chorus, CJ Tanau, All Virginia Chorus and Virginia Senior Honors Choir, Dylan Cohen, All Virginia Chorus, Peyton Roberts, All Virginia Chorus, Maggie Southall Bartz, All Virginia Chorus, Marissa Arnold, All Virginia Chorus, Anya Kohler, All Virginia Chorus, Lucas Gordon, All Virginia Chorus, Elliot Drew, All Virginia Orchestra, Gabriella Ramsey, All Virginia Chorus, and Virginia Senior Honors Choir. 
Sam Wachowski, Virginia Senior Honors Choir, and Jalen Whitmore, Virginia Senior Honors Choir. And from Tallwood High School, Wesley Chauvet, All Virginia Chorus. Congratulations to you all for your outstanding work. Now please, everyone join me in a huge round of applause for all these outstanding accomplishments. Next, we will recognize our school music departments for receiving a blue ribbon distinction or an honor band award. Please hold your applause until the end. Let's meet our staff honorees. From Corporate Landing Middle School, Band Director Amy Schaefer, Chorus Director Leanne Blaisdell, and Orchestra Director Victor Hugo. From Cox High School, Band Director Mike Lane, Virginia Honor Band. From Great Neck Middle School, Band Director Heather Smith, Chorus Director Luann Mead, and Orchestra Director Elizabeth Winters, Virginia Blue Ribbon Music School. From Landstown Middle School, Band Director Justin Thornton, Chorus Director Jeff Bailey, and Orchestra Director Amanda Ellis, the Virginia Blue Ribbon Music School. From Old Donation School, Band Director James Reed, Chorus Director Ashley Landon, and Orchestra Director Paul Baird. From Plaza Middle School, Band Director Manuel Hernandez II, Chorus Director Aaron DuBose, and Orchestra Director Sarah McGee, Virginia Blue Ribbon Music School. From Princess Anne High School, Band Director John Boyd, Virginia Honor Band and Virginia Blue Ribbon Music School. Chorus Director Catherine Davis and Orchestra Director Alex Kelly, Virginia Blue Ribbon Music School. To earn this award, these schools received a superior rating at both the State Marching Band Assessment in the fall and the Concert Band Assessment in the spring. Selection as a Virginia Honor Band is the highest honor awarded to a high school band in the Commonwealth. Please join me in congratulating these outstanding teachers and their very successful program. the music recognitions this evening by recognizing students and staff who have performed at Carnegie Hall in New York City this year. Please welcome music teacher Corbin Pinto from Salem High School and students Braden Cruz and Ilias Shapiro from Cox High School representing the Falcon Orchestra. The Falcon Orchestra was invited to perform at Carnegie Hall as part of the National Band and Orchestra Festival at the world-famous Carnegie Hall in New York City. Ensembles are invited to apply for this program based on their previous success at local, state, and national levels. Only nine ensembles were selected to perform on this festival date after a nationwide process. The students performed a 30-minute program on April 7th and received a standing ovation from the audience. In addition to the outstanding performance, Corbin Pinto, along with 55 of her VPAA vocal students, performed the Sunrise Mass at Carnegie Hall on March 11th. They performed alongside Virginia Wesleyan University and the New England Symphonic Ensemble. Congratulations to all of you for your outstanding performances at Carnegie Hall. We are so proud of you. This evening, we are proud to recognize the top two recipients of the annual Virginia Beach Future Teacher Award from each high school, as well as the Technical and Career Education Center. These students participate in either the elective Virginia Teachers for Tomorrow course or the Early Childhood Education Program. Selected winners must successfully complete their class, submit a final portfolio, and participate in a panel interview before finalists are selected by a committee at their school. 
Winners who successfully go on to complete a teacher preparation program and graduate from a university and or a college may return to Virginia Beach City Public Schools to accept a position as a teacher or a school counselor. This quote unquote grow your own program is an opportunity for the division to develop and cultivate new teachers from our very own students. This year, a total of 41 contracts have been awarded, and this evening we would like to recognize the top two recipients from each program. Please hold your applause until the end of the presentation, at which time we will celebrate all of our future teachers. We are excited to present to you our 2023 Future Teacher Award recipients. From Bayside High School, Kaylee Dean, who will be attending Virginia Wesleyan University. She is still undecided about what she will teach when she returns to Virginia Beach. Also from Bayside High, Shelby Jankowski. She too will be attending Virginia Wesleyan and will return to Virginia Beach as an elementary teacher. From Cox High School, Ava Black. Ava will be traveling to Longwood University in the fall and will return to us as an elementary teacher. Also from Cox High School, Michaela Westra, who will be attending Virginia Wesleyan and plans to pursue a future in elementary education. Next from First Colonial High School, please welcome Laura Lay Edwards. Laura Lay will be attending Tidewater Community College to pursue fine arts. From First Colonial High School, we would also like to recognize Jada Holt Corpru. Jada will be attending Hampton University and will return to Virginia Beach as a secondary history teacher. From Green Run Collegiate, Shana Grimes. Shana will be attending Randolph College and pursue a future in special education. Next, from Green Run High School, we have James Higgins. James will be traveling to James Madison University to pursue a degree in music. Also from Green Run High School, Julia Ravino. Julia will be attending Norfolk State University and will return to Virginia Beach in hopes of teaching biology. From Kellum High, we would like to recognize Madeline Hott, who will be attending Virginia Commonwealth University to pursue a degree in elementary education. Also from Kella, Kellum, Marissa G G Gukowski, excuse me, Marissa will be attending Tulane University to pursue a major that is yet to be determined. From Kempsville High, please welcome Madeline Diaz, who will be pursuing her degree in elementary education at Virginia Commonwealth University. Also from Kempsville, Catherine Lowe. Catherine will be attending Longwood University and will return to Virginia Beach to teach secondary English. Next, from Lansdowne High School, Jasmine Link. Jasmine will be attending Northern Illinois University and will return to us as an elementary teacher. Also from Lansdowne, Regina Mendoza, who will be attending James Madison University in the fall to pursue a degree in secondary English education. From Ocean Lakes High School, we have Unia Patel. Unia will be attending Virginia Commonwealth University. While her major is still undecided, we know she'll make a great choice. Also from Ocean Lakes, Isabella Martinez. Isabella will be attending the College of William and Mary and will return to Virginia Beach as an elementary teacher. From Princess Anne High School, please welcome Emma McCluskey, attending Virginia Wesleyan University to pursue a degree in elementary education. Also coming to us from Princess Anne, Isabel Grandella, Isabel, too, will be attending Virginia Wesleyan and will return to Virginia Beach to teach elementary school. From Salem High, we would like to recognize Abigail Regal. Abigail will be traveling to James Madison University in the fall to pursue a future in Virginia Beach as an elementary teacher. Also from Salem, Elizabeth Wogue, who will be attending Longwood University. Elizabeth will return to Virginia Beach as a special education teacher. From Tallwood High School, Eliza Hendrick. Eliza will be attending Smith College or Bryn Mawr College to pursue elementary education. Next, from Tallwood High, please welcome Abigail Thomas. Abigail will attend Virginia Wesleyan University and will return to Virginia Beach to teach elementary school. 
from the Virginia Beach Career and Technical Education Center. We have Alexandra Alicia. Alexandria is, Alexandra is also a student at Salem High who will pursue an elementary education degree at Virginia Wesleyan University. And last, but certainly not least, from the Virginia Beach Career and Technical Center, Elias Paulino, also a student at Kempsville High. Elias will be attending Virginia Wesleyan University and will return to Virginia Beach as an elementary teacher. Congratulations to all of these amazing students. We can't wait to see you back teaching in Virginia Beach City Public Schools after college. Now you're supposed to join me in applause. This concludes the school board recognitions for this evening. That took <laughs> Okay, we're going to start with the adoption of the agenda. Are there any other modifications to the agenda as presented? Hearing none, I call for a motion to approve the agenda as presented and modified. So moved. So moved by Mrs. Anderson and seconded by Mrs. Martin. Any discussion? Hearing none, I call for a vote to approve the agenda as presented and modified. All in favor, please raise your hands. Ms. Owens, how do you vote? I vote yes. Thank you. Ms. Weems, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. So now we have the superintendent's report and recognitions. Thank you and good evening, Madam Chairwoman and members of the board. Here are a few items of interest for you and our families to know this evening. First, students, parents, organizations, community groups, and our school leadership did a great job celebrating our educators during Teacher Appreciation Week earlier this month. Pictured here are just some examples. For example, at Ocean Lakes Elementary, students Emma and Sebastian Williams delivered candy and thank you notes to faculty and staff. At Indian Lakes Elementary, Assistant Principal Tammy Moore and Bookkeeper Megan Hood made a pancake breakfast. At Brandon Middle, New Light Full Gospel Baptist Church served up a delicious breakfast. And Old Donation School's National Junior Honor Society treated teachers to donuts and clementines. And a nearby poster read, we don't know, donut, but we do without you. What great fun, what a great week of celebrating teachers who serve our students uh, every day of the year. Also this month, student entrepreneurs recently earned thousands of dollars to pursue their products and uh, product ideas during pitch night at the Entrepreneurship and Business Academy at Kempsville High School. Virginia Secretary of Commerce and Trade Karen Merrick said any business would be lucky to employ the talented, well-spoken students who presented their ideas at this Shark Tank style event. A year's worth of schoolwork and planning goes into this annual event where teams present business ideas and respond to rapid fire questions from panelists, including the event's host, Virginia Beach developer Bruce Thompson. Three teams received the funding they requested. Cleat Skins, which promoted a slip-on device that protects athletic shoes. Grip and Go, which pitched a product that prevents slippery sports rackets. 
and beach balm, which came up with an insulated koozie that prevents chapstick from melting in hot weather. Congra right? <laughs> Congratulations to all 16 teams that participated this year, along with the mentors and teachers who support our students as they become leaders in the business world and in the community. Also, May is Bike Month, and City Council recently recognized Lansdowne Middle School for its bicycling program. Lansdowne is the only middle school in Virginia that participates in Riding for Focus. This is a program funded by a grant from Outride, a nonprofit that helps students improve their physical and mental health through cycling. The curriculum teaches safe and sustainable biking and encourages students from all socioeconomic groups to bicycle. Health and PE teachers Alan Boston and Christopher Martin lead about 30 students in this program. Nearly all of the students successfully completed a road safety ride in March, and on May 2nd, they were thrilled to accept City Council's proclamation from the mayor declaring May as Bike Month in Virginia Beach. The students, Mr. Boston and Mr. Martin, are excited about growing the program next year, so we wish the best to Lansdowne's Riding for Focus program. As you all know, Memorial Day weekend is almost upon us, and every year, tourists and local visitors to the boardwalk are able to learn about history thanks to over 80 banners produced by Salem High School students. This project would not be possible without the leadership of AP American history teacher W. Tab Pearson. The effort started with just six banners about 20 years ago. Mr. Pearson says highlighting the sacrifices made by Americans who give Memorial Day its meaning has been rewarding for him and for his students. This year's banners focus on two topics, the Tomb of the Unknowns at Arlington National Cemetery and the story of four Navy chaplains of different faiths who sacrificed their own lives to save U.S. soldiers aboard a sinking ship attacked during World War II. Mr. Pearson, his principal, Ms. Leanne turnbull Pallet, and his students do a great job with this project. We also appreciate our partnership with Oceanfront event organizer, Bobby Malati, who's pictured here with Mr. Pearson, and seniors, Emily Euler and Lucas Gordon, who helped create this year's banners. Thanks to this collaboration, beach visitors learn about history while enjoying the holiday weekend and showing respect to those who paid the ultimate sacrifice to protect our freedoms. And a reminder to you and our families, a candlelight vigil will mark the fourth anniversary of our city's tragic mass shooting at 8 p.m. on Wednesday, May 31st in front of City Hall. The names of the 12 victims will be read and music will be provided by Virginia Beach City Public School students at the event. The city is also holding a moment of silence that day at 4.06 p.m., which is when the first 911 call came in from the shooting at the Municipal Center, and everyone is encouraged to pause no matter where they are at 4.06 p.m. The public is also invited to wear blue as a symbol of remembrance on May 31st. Finally, Virginia Beach City Public Schools is hosting a first-of-its-kind event to connect families with local resources for wellness, family engagement, and student support. The Family and Student Wellness Expo will be from noon to 3 p.m. on Saturday, June the 3rd at Bayside High School. This event will provide fun and healthy opportunities for all, including a vaccine clinic, the VBCPS scratch food truck, and inflatables for kids. Exhibitors will be sharing resources related to finances, health, wellness, and education. So we invite the entire community to join us on June the 3rd for this Get Well, Be Well experience. Madam Chair, that does include my report, but I do have one recognition this evening. If I could ask Laura Purvis to please stand up. Mrs. Purvis has served in Virginia Beach since 2013 as a teacher at Shelton Park Elementary School, a teacher at Thoroughgood Elementary School, and a teacher at Independence Middle School. Most recently, she has been teaching at Plaza Middle School. Last week, you accepted our recommendation for her to serve as the next coordinator of the Middle Years program at Plaza Middle School, and we wanted to bring her back and offer our congratulations. And Mrs. Purvis, I understand you have a few guests with you. Would you like to introduce them? Thank you again, and thank you all for being here this evening. Madam Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you. 
So we're now at the approval of the meeting minutes for May 9th, 2023, our regular school board meeting. Are there any modifications to the May 9th, 2023 school board meeting minutes as presented? Okay, hearing none, I call for a motion to approve the May 9th, 2023 minutes as presented. Do I have a motion? Mr. Um, Culpepper and second, Mrs. Manning. All in favor, please raise your hands. Ms. Owens, how do you vote? I vote yes. Thank you. Ms. Weems, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. So we're now at our public comments. Um, before I start reading uh, the information for the public comments, I want to share something um, because we've been receiving um, some concerns from the public and emails and calls. And um, I just wanted to make this very clear. When we reviewed our bylaw 147 a couple of years ago, um, it was on the minutes show, it was September the 28th, 2021. And one of the, it was talk about, talked about public comments. And one of the things that we changed was number four under C. Priority will be given to students currently enrolled in the school division to address the school board during public comment sections of the agenda and the school board clerk or designee is authorized to develop procedures to affect this priority. And I just wanna make it noted to the public that this was a um, unanimous vote from the school board at that time. And that was changed, we talked about it because we were thinking of our students and that is what we are here for obviously and for our um, public, but our students making sure that they uh, could speak and get back home to be ready for the next day for their classes. So I just wanted to make that uh, noted. The school board will now hear public comments on matters relevant to pre-K through 12 public education in Virginia Beach and the business of the school board and the school division from citizens and delegations who signed up with the school board clerk prior to noon today. The purpose for the public comment section of the school board agenda is for the school board to offer an orderly forum to receive public comments during the school board meeting. Members of the public have the opportunity to provide comments during the meeting by signing up to speak from the podium. Other methods of public comment are not offered during the school board meeting. As a reminder to persons in attendance at tonight's meeting, school board meeting decorum guidelines prohibit disruption of the meeting through clapping, calling for audience members, holding signs that interfere with audience members' ability to view the meeting, or otherwise take an action to communicate with the school board or disrupt the meeting. Also, I want to note this portion of Bylaw 147. Speakers are responsible for being in the school board room auditorium or online when they are called to speak. And when a person speaker's name is called, the speaker should line up in the aisle to wait for that turn at the podium. Speakers lined up for their turn at the podium may also take a seat right near their podium to wait for their turn to speak. If a speaker is not present when called to speak or is not online or unable to unmute when called to speak, the school board at its sole discretion may allow the speaker to speak at the end of the public comment session. The school board also invites the public to submit comments through our group email account, which can be found on our website. And I just wanted to note that portion of bylaw 147. So hopefully uh, having everyone down when, they, when she calls your name and close to the podium will hopefully expedite the time and give everybody a chance to speak tonight. So, um, Madam Clerk, would you please introduce our first speakers? Thank you, Madam Chair. As a reminder, we're gonna be calling uh, three speakers at a time. So again, please line up. Our first speakers are Emily Labar, Alana Spencer, and Natalie Gonzalez. Welcome. 
Good afternoon, my name is Emily Labar and I'm the president of First Colonial High School's Gender Sexuality Alliance. It goes without saying that the school board should be committed to ending all forms of discrimination within the educational environment, including discrimination that targets LGBTQ students. Ms. Owens's resolution affirms that goal. Last meeting, there were complaints about the vagueness and the verbiage of the resolution, but the updated resolution resolves those concerns, citing specific state and federal laws, as well as this board's bylaws. Last meeting, there were also concerns that the resolution would address school sports, but not only are most school sports under the purview of the VHSL, not the school board, the updated resolution specifies that it would apply to educational programs and non-athletic activity. I see no real reason to vote against this resolution. All of your students deserve support and deserve an educational environment free from discrimination and harassment. All of your students deserve to know that the board will stand by their commitment to an equitable education. This resolution isn't a meaningless or empty gesture. It details in the final two paragraphs exactly what this resolution means practically. It's necessary. Life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Serving on this board gives you the unique opportunity to nurture and protect thousands of children and teens in our district. It gives you the opportunity to bridge the gap for students who are put at a disadvantage or are treated differently based on things outside of their control. So vote yes to Ms. Owens' resolution. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alana Spencer, Natalie Gonzalez, and then Charlie Levine. Welcome. I believe Alana Spencer is not here. Um, good evening. My name is Natalie Gonzalez, and I've been speaking at these board meetings for about seven months now. Several of my peers have been speaking for even longer than that, and all of us have been working diligently to consistently attend these meetings and make sure that our voices are heard. Finding the time to write 450 word speeches every two weeks in addition to being a full-time student and a part-time worker hasn't been easy, but there's nothing I can imagine myself doing that's more important than this. My mom often likes to tell my aunts or strangers in the grocery store about me speaking at these meetings, and I always get a little embarrassed, not because of what I'm talking about, but because so many people believe that civic engagement is pointless and that the amount of effort it would take to make any sort of impact is too great to be worth it. But I like to think that Ms. Owens' resolution disproves that. More than anything, we appreciate this board taking the time to listen to our speeches week after week, and it is absolutely delightful to see that our advocacy has not gone ignored. It is not easy to balance the wants and needs of all your constituents, especially when many of them have incredibly different views on the same topic, but this resolution does exactly that. As the resolution itself acknowledges, LGBTQ youth often face unique challenges both within and outside of the educational environment. We cannot pretend that these challenges do not exist and to ignore them would be to unfairly ignore the needs of our LGBTQ students. This resolution seeks to ensure that they are given a learning environment in which they are free from discrimination, something that all students ought to be given and it promises that this school board will not implement any policies that may unduly harm or discriminate against students, citing the Virginia Human Rights Act that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex, sexual orientation, or gender identity. It is simple, it is concurrent with pre-existing laws, and it is what we have been fighting for for so long. If there was no need for this resolution, we would not come in droves to attend these meetings for months on end. If there was no need for this resolution, we wouldn't be speaking here today. We need this resolution to assure our peers that discrimination is not something that will ever be allowed in our schools. We appreciate your receptiveness and we want to see more of it. Voting in favor of Ms. Owens's resolution will be a testament both to our efforts and to your attentiveness. 30 as seconds. Board. Thank you. Our next speaker is Natalie Gonzalez, Charlie Levine, and then Willow Boberitz. Welcome. Good evening, my name is Charlie Levine. I have come here tonight in support of Mrs. Owen's resolution. I know that many people are hesitant to support and pass the proposed resolution, but I would like to remind everyone that it will not change the way our school system works. 
This resolution does not seek to lie to parents. It does not seek to indoctrinate students. It does not seek to serve a political bias or agenda. This resolution will only preserve the way our schools currently treat transgender students and protect them from discriminatory policy making in the future. As a classmate and friend to transgender students, I know the impact our current school policy has on my friends. Our schools treat them equally and with respect, using the correct name and pronouns, which has significant positive effects for mental health. This has clear social and mental benefits, as a safe environment provides the opportunity to develop oneself and make meaningful connections to grow. Voting against Mrs. Owen's resolution, however, would see that the community and respect provided to transgender students is taken away. Voting against this resolution is to vote in favor of discriminatory policies that will treat transgender and non-binary students unequally. Often at these school board meetings, I've heard the argument of parental rights, or that it, is a, that it is unjust for a school to protect a transgender student's identity. I hear complaints that it is a sign that schools are against parents. While I understand the worry parents have for their children, I also understand the worry that every LGBTQ adolescent in America has. I know their worry of becoming another statistic of a homeless teenager or abused child. Their worry that the widespread bigotry that can sadly be found in our world all too often will affect them. The fact is that transgender people are over four times more likely than cisgender people to be the victims of violent offenses. I see and I feel that worry and fear. The reason why not every transgender teenager can be open about their identity at home. The reason that the closet exists for queer people. For many, the only safe environment they have is school. I have come tonight to support Ms. Owen's resolution in defense of the transgender students in BBCPS. I implore the school board to listen to the pleas of the worried transgender students, heed the warnings shown in statistics, and show us that you care and protect transgender students. For the safety of my classmates and the generations of students that come after us, 30 seconds. I ask that you pass Ms. Owen's resolution. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Willow Bobowitz. Hope Paninski and AJ Quatero. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Willow Bobberwitz. I'm a senior at Kellum High School, and I'm here to support Ms. Owen's resolution. It is astonishing to see the pushback this ultimately inoffensive resolution has received. And as a cisgender student, I do not at all feel though this resolution gives treatment, special treatment to LGBTQ students. My rights, my comfort, and my safety are not threatened by this resolution, and promising to support an already marginalized group does not take away from students like me. In fact, it asserts to everyone that the people we love and attend class with are our equals, even if they might be different from us. Though I am not a member of the LGBTQ community, many of my closest friends are, and this resolution is important to step is an important step toward providing them with the same comfort and security that I have when I walk into my school. I think it is important to say that we don't think you hate us just for disagreeing with us, and we will not accuse you of hating us if you fail to pass this resolution. No resolution is free from being discussed and critiqued, and this one is no exception to that rule. But the core intent of this resolution seems to seems like something everyone should be able to agree on. The resolution cites Title IX, Title VII, and the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. These documents that protect individuals from discrimination based on their sex and gender identity. By supporting this resolution, we are not asking for anything more than what should already be guaranteed by the law and what should already be expected of our schools. I know this resolution may seem redundant, but re-emphasizing what we already know to be right harms no one and helps everyone. In a time where transgender youth face discrimination unique to them that people like me will never experience, it is crucial to make a commitment to protecting them so they're given the same chance for success as I am. When the safety and rights of transgender students are so frequently called into question, it is crucial to make that commitment so there is no doubt that they are our equals. And there is no doubt that the school board will stand up for them in the face of potentially harmful policies. This resolution isn't asking for anything extreme, and it isn't asking for any immediate or ex actions from our schools. It asks that we only maintain a supportive learning environment for all of our students, including trans and LGBTQ students, which is something Virginia Beach City Public Schools have already strived to do. 
There is nothing to lose but everything to gain if you pass this resolution. Thank you. Our next speaker is Hope Paninsky, A.J. Quatero, and then Bethany Wilmoth. Welcome. Good evening, school board members. <clears throat> My name is Hope Paninsky, and I'm a freshman at First Colonial High School. Homophobia. According to Oxford language, it is the dislike of or prejudice against gay people. This can be translated through words like the F slur. Have you ever been on the receiving end of this word? If you have, I imagine it hurt a little, but imagine what it would feel like if this word actually applied to you. Getting called this word by straight cis people is something many LGBTQ members experience, including myself. I've experienced this hateful world from people that, at the time, I believe were my friends. One of which exp I expressed my concern to and his only answer was, quote, block me then. He couldn't even admit what he had done and apologize for it. It hurts so much to be called a term in such an insultive way over text and in person. However, even though I experienced this hate from them, I never felt comfortable going to administrators. This is because I don't know what they were gonna take it as. It was between they would actually deal with the issue or they would just have a talk with the kid and then the hate would continue. I never know how what I have experienced can be taken and that scares me. So I would like to thank Ms. Owens. Ms. Owens, thank you for creating this resolution with the aim to help us kids who experience hate. Thank you for trying to help us feel more comfortable in our surroundings. Finally, thank you for making me feel more comfortable in my school environment, knowing that someone is looking out for kids like me on this board. I don't think I could thank you enough for how much this has helped us in our school experience. So many things can be said to bring us down, so many words, so many phrases, so many stereotypes are used on a regular basis to insult us and bully many individuals in the community. We are just people. We are nothing less than you because we still have a brain, body, and voice. However, our rights continue to be political and are constantly being put on the chopping block. So many communities are encouraged to just be themselves. So please, help us just be people with our sexuality or gender just being a fun fact that doesn't define us. We aren't asking for special treatment. We are expecting the bare minimum. This is why I support and encourage all of you to support Ms. Owen's resolution to prevent bills from being passed that discriminate against LGBTQ youth. Thank you. Our next speaker is AJ Quartero, Bethany Wilmoth, and then Charlie Bodenstein. Welcome. Good evening, my name is AJ Corderero. My pronouns are they, them, and I am a non-binary sophomore at Kellum High School. We do not hate you. Those are the words I heard from a speaker at the last meeting in reference to my community and I before they presented an argument against Ms. Owens' resolution. I am sure that every speaker who comes in front of this board is not ill-intentioned regardless of what they stand for. However, it should be noted that one does not have to be malintentioned or hateful in order to do harm. The fact is that with the rise of anti-trans legislation across the US, our community is in dire need of support. We have seen certain policies proposed within even our own city that pose a danger to gender diverse youth and which have proven to us that we are considered by many to be unwelcome within our schools. We are not looking for anything radical or extreme, just a reaffirmation that we and our rights are protected within our school system. Rejecting Ms. Owens' resolution is not, in essence, a hateful act, but regardless of anyone's intentions, it must be acknowledged that rejecting this resolution also poses a danger to our community. This resolution ensures our protection, so naturally to reject it would be to neglect our safety. If you don't hate us, then why won't you protect us? If it is not hate that keeps you from keeping us safe, then what is it? Even if you agree with Ms. Owens' resolution, to not deem this resolution necessary proves a lack of understanding for the discrimination and inequality that LGBTQ plus students experience. If you do not agree with the resolution, you do not agree with equality for all students. This resolution does not put our community on a pedestal or favor us in any way. We did not single ourselves out in order to give ourselves more rights than we should be afforded. We were singled out by laws across the country that strive to repress and reduce us. The rights afforded by Ms. Owens' resolution are the exact same rights afforded to every other non-LGBTQ student in VBCPS. 
It is equality that we desire and have not quite attained, and it is equality that this resolution assures. We have attended meetings week after week, not because of agitated buzzwords thrown around on social media, but because we have been desperately searching for a solution to the rampant inequality felt by transgender and non-binary students in our schools. This is the solution we have been waiting for, a simple reassurance that we have the right to be safe and respected in our schools. That is all we are asking for, and that is all the resolution affords us. If you care about the well-being and equality of all students, you will pass Ms. Owens' resolution. You claim that you don't hate us, so show us that you care. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bethany Wilmoth, then Charlie Bonenstein, then Destiny Nicole. Welcome. Hello. My name is Bethany Wilmoth. I'm an LGBT freshman from Salem High School, and I'm here to speak in support of Owens' introduced resolution. I would like to start off this speech by congratulating everybody who has signed up to speak in the past couple of meetings. I would also like to thank all school board members, regardless of if you agree with us or not. Your care and concern for students and parents alike in our local area is remarkable, and one that I hope many others can follow in the future. I understand the fear and wariness within all of you when it comes to the resolution Owens has introduced. I really do. But you need to see this from the perspective of transgender students. I highly encourage all speakers who are here to speak against us to watch the past meetings and listen to what we have to say before attending the next meeting. There is no need for me to come up here to regard the petty rumors and misinformation that surround us or this resolution, because at the end of the day, it doesn't change what we fight for. Owens is not changing anything with this resolution. Her resolution would simply be assuring and keeping our current transgender policies in place. Here's a question for all of you. Can you name one example of a student or parent in the VBCPS area being harmed by a gender-affirming environment? Can you name one student or parent in our area who has been in danger or has been negatively impacted by schools refusing to dead name transgender children? If you cannot come up here and give me an example, then you should reconsider your reasons for voting against Ms. Owens' proposed resolution. We are fighting against the forcible outing of transgender students. We are fighting for a verbally gender-affirming environment. But before all of that, we're fighting for equal equity amongst all students, regardless of if that student is cisgender or transgender. Your fears are valid, but are seemingly rooted in misinformation. Schools will not be passing around hormone replacement therapy like it's candy. Schools will not legally change your child's name. Schools will have absolutely no role in a child transitioning process beyond referring to them with preferred names or pronouns. All they will be doing is making school feel a little bit safer and accepting to somebody who may not have the same treatment at home. Please vote in support of Owens' resolution. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charlie Bodenstein, then Destiny Nicole, then Fabrizio Solis. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Charlie Bodenstein and I'm a senior at First Colonial High School. I'm here to speak in agreement with the resolution proposed by Ms. Owens. It's been a long time coming, and we're thrilled that there's finally an end in sight. We've kept our heads up for what feels like forever and continued speaking here at these meetings despite everything. You're all looking at the people of the future. We all want different paths and occupations, but when it comes down to it, we could be sitting where you are right now. We're using our voices and presence at these meetings to show how much we care. We are the voices of the future. When we branch out into the world, we're going to use every skill we learn speaking at these meetings. However, how we will remember speaking at these meetings is entirely up to you. I hope that we can remember it fondly, that we can look back and feel proud that, of the fact that we helped protect transgender students in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. We can't do that without you. You are all on this board for a reason. You are entrusted with the noble job of protecting the students. You are meant to protect us and our rights. You'll prove that by passing this resolution. You'll prove that you've been hearing us and our pleas. Thank you. Our next speaker is Destiny Nicole, 
then Fabrizio Solis, then Ari Benjamin Serja. Destiny Nicole. Welcome. Hi, uh, Destiny's not here, so it's just me. Uh, my name is Fabrizio Solis, and I'm here today to support Ms. Owen's resolution. As a student of Virginia Beach City Public Schools, I feel like I have an obligation to speak here today. The safety of trans students in public schools is a matter that is very important to me and lots of other students. All students are entitled to a safe learning environment, regardless of background. The city of Virginia Beach should make an effort to protect trans youth from bullying, violence, and harassment from students or staff. It's important to recognize that policies that protect trans youth actually do have a meaningful, tangible effect on not just the students, but the learning environment as a whole. According to the National Library of Medicine, trans people have a significantly higher rate of suicide than the general population. In areas with policies enacted to protect these trans students, suicide rates significantly decline. When trans youth are protected, they are often more motivated to participate in academic and extracurricular activities. An environment where one always has to have their guard up is not a good learning environment for anyone. Some of the stress should be taken off of the student onto the system that is built to teach them. I've met lots of amazing trans individuals in my life, talented and hardworking, and their stories are inspirational. My peers have been through a lot for people so young, and there are a lot of different kinds of hate directed on trans youth, ranging from condescending pity to a brass rejection of their being. It's not fair for people who are just trying to be comfortable in their own skin, a feeling that a lot of us take for granted. The struggle of your own very being not being accepted by your parents or your peers is something that I can't relate to, but it's really hard to imagine for me. And yet children as young or younger than me have experienced all of this and then some more, some being kicked out of their own homes and left to fend for themselves. It is the responsibility of the school system to provide a safe learning environment for every student, and not just the majority. While the trans community is a very small minority, it does not mean that they should be unaccounted for. Trans students should be free to express who they are and feel safe in the school building, as any other student has the right to. Students should not have to feel like they are constantly on guard during school hours. Being trans is a very unique experience that not a lot of people know, with its own nuances and struggles. And a system that acknowledges the experience will go a long way in making it a lot easier. In time, a system can help build a community that is more accepting to anyone, or everyone. In a community where one feels not only accepted but welcomed, people are bound to thrive. It is easy to forget what support can do to a person, but even supportive words can make such a difference. To support someone is to accept them, but accept is not just a support. We should have an environment where trans youth not only feel accepted but welcomed, and it starts with an effort. Building a better learning environment will not be quick, nor will it be easy, but it was worth it for Three everyone seconds. involved. Supporting Ms. Owen's resolution would be a great first step to a very valuable journey. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Ari Benjamin Serja, Finn Sproul, and then Sam Turner. Welcome. Welcome, let me adjust, okay. Good afternoon, members of the school board. My name is Ari Sergent, and I'm a senior at the Legal Studies Academy in First Colonial High School. I'm here to speak against the Virginia Department of Education's model policies regarding transgender students. Never, never be afraid to do what is right, especially if a person's well-being is at stake. Society's punishments are small compared to the wounds we inflict on our soul when we look the other way. These powerful words from Martin Luther King Jr. resonate deeply with the issue at hand as we gather to here today. This esteemed board has already heard a multitude of arguments from students within the VBCPS district, voicing their concerns regarding the transphobic policies proposed by the Virginia Department of Education. These policies not only stand on shaky legal grounds, but more importantly, they betray the fundamental principles of ethics and equality. Virginia Beach has been my cherished home for the past decade, and I am proud to be a part of a community that places such a strong emphasis on inclusivity and diversity. It is these very values that have allowed our city and its communities to thrive, enabling past, present, and future generations to make a positive impact by choosing to spread peace instead of hate. The mentalities that prevail within, these city, within this city are the ones that make it truly great, caring for the immense strides made by our past leaders to ensure equality for all. Within the graduate profile of this school district, one of the pillars that stands tall is the call to be cross-culturally competent. This involves recognizing and respecting one's own culture and other cultures, allowing us to work effectively with others and to gain a deeper understanding of the impact of national and world events. Let us reflect on this quote and acknowledge that the issue at hand is not whether or not the students, parents, or even teachers 
teachers within the VBCPS district agree with different cultures. Rather, the true test lies in their ability to respect the autonomy and agency of our students, embracing their preferred names, pronouns, and sexualities. Today, I implore this school board to rise above the barriers of prejudice and discrimination and to fulfill its mission statements, vision statements, and even core values. The mission to put, student put students first necessitates that you prioritize the well-being and rights of every student under your care. Seeking growth means evolving as a district and adapting to changing needs of our diverse student population. We must be open to change and embrace progress, recognize our society and its understanding of gender and identity have evolved. We are called upon to do great work together and it is through unity and acceptance that we truly achieve greatness. This district's core values demand that we value differences and treat every student equally, fostering an environment that allows them to see, receive a quality education. By doing so, we not only adhere to the principles of justice and seconds. fairness, but you also fulfill your duty as educators and stewards of the next generation. I stand before you today for, to advocate for what is right, just and humane. Let us not falter in the face of adversity, for history will remember us not by our popularity of our decisions, but by by the impact we make on the lives of those we serve. I urge each member of the board to reflect upon the values that guide us, to examine the wounds we inflict on our collective soul when we turn a blind eye to injustice, and to take action that aligns with the principles we hold dear. The time for action is now, and the responsibility and lies time. within this school board. That is time. Our next speaker is Finn Sproul, Sam Turner, and Jacob Cruz. Welcome. Good evening, members of the school board. My name is Finn Sproul. I'm a transgender male and I attend Kempsville High School. I'm speaking today hoping to make nicknames and preferred names in Synergy available on printed out rosters. It has been a while since I've explained the entire process of a substitute and their roster, so I will refresh you. The day the sub is needed, they will go to the office and they will be handed their schedule and a printed out roster for each class block. The substitute will go to their class where they, where they should find sub plans, a roster from the teacher, and any notes the teacher leaves. If a student has a preferred name other than, any, other than their legal name, the teacher will write corrections on their roster. Once the attendance is done, the sheet is taken to the attendance office of the, of the school. However, this process leaves us with a problem. What if the substitute only reads the roster they walked in with or doesn't see the teacher's notes? Walking into a room and having students come up to you with corrections can be overwhelming, so there can be no chance to share before, share their, before they call out their legal names. For some students, having their legal name read off in front of their entire class can be catastrophic. We can eliminate all of these problems by going directly to the source, the rosters. If my preferred name is added in parentheses next to my legal name, there is no need for my teacher to leave a note and no need to rush to tell the teacher my name before a roll, before a roll call, for my name will be on all copies. I have spent hours of school speaking with Kempsville Attendance Associate, Ms. Hodges, Data Technician, Ms. Ama, and our Principal, Ms. George researching and learning the process of role. I'm so very thankful for them and I applaud their efforts and willingness to help me make changes to make school a safer place for LGBTQ students. I spoke with our data technician and I have found there is in fact a way to include nicknames in Synergy on roll digitally, but it is unavailable to be printed out. This seems to be an inputting issue tied directly to Synergy. Although this may not seem like a big deal to you, those who, who do not identify with their birth name understand the dread, fear, and frustration associated with having your name called out. Adding preferred names can eliminate dead naming in the classroom, and that is one less situation I will be put in that makes me uncomfortable and even unsafe. As stated in Ms. Owen's resolution, quote, all individuals have the right to a safe physical, emotional, and social environment, end quote. Every student has the right to feel valued and accepted in school. This is a small step that can mean a lot to students like me. Continue to aid schools in making every student feel respected and accepted. Seconds. I will advocate for those who can't and I will use my voice to make changes where changes are due. Be the change, act now. Vote yes to Ms. Owen's resolution for she is actively working towards making us feel heard. Listen to what I say and please research what you can do to fix this problem. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Sam Turner, Jacob Cruz, and Bradley Fish. Welcome. Hello, my name is Sam Turner and my pronouns are they, them. I am a freshman in the Visual and Performing Arts Academy at Salem High School. Before I start, I would like to mention that I have Tourette syndrome, which causes involuntary movements and noises. I am not being disrespectful, I cannot control it. 
Did you know that trans people have been around since 2000 BC Mesopotamia? There are even records of people stating God created these people. And around 400 BC, there were the Hijira people, also known as the third gender. They still exist today. Trans people have been around since the dawning of time, and we are here to stay. No matter how much we are discriminated against, we still exist. We are not trying to harm anyone. We just want equality. The only way to stop us from fighting for our basic rights is by, hmm, I don't know, giving us our basic rights. On another note, by denying Owen's resolution, you're going to lose so many teachers. Your teachers are already have horrible pay, are asked to do God's work, and now you're expecting them to police students over their gender identity? Seriously? Your teacher shortage is going to become so much worse. In addition, you're taking away safe spaces for students. Did you know that fewer than 40% of LGBTQ plus people found their home to be affirming? That number is horrifying and goes to show you're just forcing innocent students into possibly unsafe situations by outing them. However, did you know that transgender and non-binary people who reported that all the people they live with respect their pronouns also reported lower rates of suicide? It's wild what respecting people's identities can do. It's almost like that's what we've been saying for the past eight months. This fact relates to env the environment of school as well. Studies have proven over and over that supportive environments uplift and encourage students to be their best selves. Lastly, you speak of protecting the children, but have you ever actually asked your children how they feel about this? Did they answer honestly? And how many of you actually have children and ones that go to this school district? For most of you, that's none. You're fighting outside your jurisdiction. I know you're scared and that's okay, but Owen's resolution has no negative effect on you. It doesn't even regard you. I am the child who should be busy messing up, yet here I am pleading to grown adults for my rights because somehow respect missed your generation. It's simply unfair. Owen's resolution is beneficial and vital to the lives of all LGBTQ plus students. You might not agree with everything I said today and that is okay. However, it is important to listen to the message I am spreading. You don't have to like my ideology to respect the basic foundations behind it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jacob Cruz, Bradley Fish, and then Jay Cook. Good evening, board members. Nice to Welcome. see you again. Oh, nice to see you again. Um, last meeting, Ms. Owen's resolution weathered much more criticism than I could have even imagined. It was attacked from, from all sorts of angles, broken down word by word. Um, I even found some of these critiques to be reasonable, but thankfully, Ms. Owens has made revisions that have re resolved many of these concerns. But um, there was one line of attack that really baffled me. I just couldn't wrap my head around it. It was the idea that we don't need a resolution specifically for queer students or that it's pointless to reaffirm something that the board's already doing. See, I, I sat with this for a while and I have an answer for those critics. I have, I have two numbers for them, 549 and 111. Across state and federal legislatures, there have been 549 anti-trans bills introduced. If you want to know why we seek this resolution or why it is urgent to restate this board's stance on queer rights issues, that's why. Open up your phone and scroll on your preferred news app for 30 seconds and you're probably going to see an article about one of these 549 bills, these 549 threats to the safety and well-being of our peers. We aren't seeking an anti-discrimination resolution for all students because not all students have 549 bills aimed squarely at erasing them. Of course, we despise all forms of discrimination, we would speak out against them, but that doesn't mean that we have to be blind in the face of a crisis that is staring us down. The rights of trans students are under siege, and acting like Ms. Owen's resolution is purposeless is ignorant of that context. Now on to that second number, 111. 111 people signed up to speak at the last school board meeting, yet I was under the impression that this resolution doesn't do anything. I was under the impression that this was a resolution devoid of a purpose, a resolution that was equivalent to breathe, saying we're going to breathe air and drink water, as one, board member, or as one um, speaker said. 111 people don't take hours out of their days to come speak about a resolution that doesn't have a purpose. Ms. Owens weathered criticism from both the board and the public for writing a resolution that is primarily restating the board's current positions, but that is the exact purpose of a resolution, to reaffirm an existing sentiment when it becomes necessary. With the constant presence of students at this board and the 111 speakers last meeting, I think it's very clear that the public wants to know where the board stands on queer rights issues. And if nothing else, this resolution can be a litmus test for that. I don't understand why this resolution must weather an onslaught of meticulous criticism, criticism so granular we're dissecting the word choice of the phrase gender expression as opposed to gender identity. 
30 it seconds. Is, it's obvious what Ms. Owen's intent for writing this resolution was. It was to protect queer students. In next meeting, I'm asking that board members, whether they are supporters of this resolution, opponents, or somewhere in between, vote on the content and the purpose of this resolution and nothing else. All of the speakers, supporters, and opponents deserve that. Vote in favor of us or vote against us, but don't take the easy way out and say this was never about anything but queer rights. Everyone here deserves more than that. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bradley Fish, Jay Cook, and then Geneva Warren. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon. At the last meeting, we were congratulated for our professionalism and skill. This is perhaps a nice sentiment, but it cannot be helped by us to feel somewhat slighted. It may fit the standard of good sportsmanship, but we are not here for accolades. We are here to support Ms. Owen's resolution. We see this resolution as the best move forward to safeguard those within the LGBTQ plus community with spe specific attention towards transgender and non-binary students who are at the most risk from current transphobic and homophobic trends. We do not wish to see other groups put at a disadvantage simply because we are paying our attention to a smaller group. We are not here to take away but to ensure equitable rights. We are here to do right by ourselves and by our friends and anyone else who is endangered by the policies. By supporting the resolution, nobody within the school board loses. Either you are unaffected in large part or you are brought up to a more equitable standing with your peers. Trying to be equitable is a difficult task, but it is worth pursuing so that everyone is given a fair shot at life. Ms. Owens' resolution would help us um, would move us towards the right direction in a time where we need to push forward the most. After the first rounds of public comments came to an end, we were disheartened to see the resolution pushed back, originally into today's meeting, but then into June's in accordance to scheduling. We were disheartened, but we are not demoralized by any degree to stop. We weren't demoralized to see speakers in opposition either. We believe we are still making great strides forward. I urge the school board to pass Ms. Owen's resolution so that all individuals can be well respected as students within Virginia Beach Public Schools with extra attention paid to those within the LGBTQ plus community, specifically trans and non-binary individuals, which are at the most risk to a disproportionate degree. It is not because we only value trans lives, but because it is required of us to take battles where we see them. Those who align with their gender assigned at birth are not targeted like those among the LGBTQ plus minority group. This group in particular is at risk of higher than average rates of suicide, as we all must know by now. It is through affirming their identities that this risk can decrease. That is why we are fighting here. For now, this is our main focus. The resolution by Ms. Owens will provide protections for all students and safeguard them from negative policies, and there is no reason to not pass it. Please, pass the resolution for the sake of your students. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jay Cook, Geneva Warren, and then Icarus Landacker. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, board members. My name is Jay Cook, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm a current VBCPS student. Though I was unfortunately unable to attend the last meeting due to an illness, I did watch carefully, and I listened to both sides, not only my own. One thing I heard multiple times from the opposition, especially, was an inquiry into why this resolution was even needed at all. I would like to hopefully answer that for those of you who have not found reason in the words of my peers. Discrimination is a tricky thing. It's a rampant fire that does not die out naturally. It does not falter unless action is taken to suppress it. We need this resolution to draw a line, to suppress the fire, the discrimination, and the hate. We need this resolution for the same reason that the Little Rock Nine, the first group of African-American students to integrate Little Rock High School in 1957, needed to be escorted by federal troops to school. Because if they were not, they would have been badly burned by the flames of hate we so fear. We need this resolution for the same reason the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was needed to protect the 15th and 19th Amendments that allowed women and African Americans to vote. Because if given the opportunity, if permitted, people will find ways to strip those they hate of their given rights. We need this resolution for the same reason the Civil Rights Acts, both of 1964 and 1968, were needed to quell the rampant discrimination in workplaces and in housing. To protect the members of our society, from discrimination in their everyday lives, to protect the kids in our city schools, to prevent them from being burned. We need this resolution because if we do not have it, there is nothing that can draw the line. And without that, the fire spreads. 
We need this resolution because if we do not have it, there is nothing that outright says no to discrimination against LGBTQ youth in our schools. And to many, if they are not told no, they will proceed. We need this resolution because we are terrified of being burned, of going to school and being outed, marginalized, and mistreated. We need this resolution because though perhaps we will always be hated by someone, we will not continue to be hurt if the fire is contained. Thank you. Our next speaker is Geneva Warren, then Icarus Landacker, then Orion Davis. Welcome. Good evening, school board members. My name is Geneva Warren, and I am a sophomore at First Colonial High School. Over the past couple of months, we, the students of Virginia Beach Public Schools, have been asking you to keep the promise you made to us the moment we entered the VBCPS system. Sadly, that promise is being challenged. So instead, I'm asking the school board to make a new promise to the students. I ask that if Owen's resolution does not get passed, every safe space sign on VBCPS schools gets removed effective immediately. Why? Because if we are a people based on teaching the youth what is right and true, then those signs would need to be removed if schools aren't safe for everyone entering them. The facts state that the average person only spends 13.36% of their life in the shaping mold that is school, but that is a vital 13.36% of our lives that shapes us into the people that we are. If that shaping mold is lined with malice and hate, how can you call it a safe space? Not only would it be a complete moral injustice, it would be a complete contradiction to its purpose. The whole point of a safe space sign of a safe space sign is to protect those in dangerous situations. If a child at risk of being abused at home tells an adult or employee at an establishment with a safe place sign on it, then the employee is to tell no one but the police about that person's situation. And that's if someone willingly tells them about their situation. So the school board, I ask you, what sense would it make to force safe place workers to ignore the safety precautions put in place and still claim to stand for the protection of the children? We've said it before and we'll say it again. We are not asking for change. We are asking for our friends' rights to continue being upheld and that they can express themselves in their most authentic form, the form mm. that we have grown to love and support. Please, if you care about the students, if you truly fight and protect for the students, then affirm Ms. Owen's resolution. Our schools are our safe places. Please don't take that away from us. Thank you. Our next speaker is Icarus Landacker, Orion Davis, and then Alex Alstrad. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Icarus Landacre. I am a non-binary senior in the IB program at Princess Anne High School, and I support Ms. Owen's resolution. I am one of the consistent members of this student group that has been attending for the past seven months, but I missed last meeting due to exams. Nevertheless, I still took time out of studying to watch the meeting online, and what I saw disturbed me. A resolution meant to affirm and uphold the board on promises they have already made was met with a backlash of hate that I can only describe as equal to that received by the LGBTQ plus community daily. Many made remarks that the resolution only addressed one group of students out of the entire student body, yet this is not the case. The resolution states, quote, providing protections for all students regardless of sex, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, gender expression, or any other type of characteristic, end quote. While this initially is meant to protect LGTP, LGTQ plus students, gender expression and sexual orientation applies to everyone, including our cisgender and straight peers. Not to mention the resolution states, quote, all students, end quote. This is a non-discriminatory resolution where the definition of non-discriminatory means to not be unfair or prejudiced towards any specific groups. The very definition means that it applies to everyone. Why would non-discrimination be argued against? As some board members mentioned last meeting, a wave of emails, some more hateful than others, were received at the announcement of Owen's resolution. Furthermore, over 100 speakers signed up to speak at the last meeting. 
I would like to highlight the detail of the emails being hateful along with some of the speakers last meeting. I am not saying that disagreement is hate. In fact, I acknowledge some speakers adamantly said they do not hate us, merely disagree, and I believe them. That is their right. However, there were others who showed clear animosity that derives from the disagreement. It is this kind of hate displayed in the emails and at the last meeting that exemplifies the very reason we need this resolution. This resolution is about affirmation. It affirms safety for the students within the school walls. It affirms parents can trust school systems. 30 seconds. Can trust the school system when they may worry about their child's safety or rights being harmed by other people or discriminatory policies. Lastly, it affirms that students' identities, who they are, are neither wrong nor can that be taken from them. As Mel Ms. Melnick put it, non-discrimination is not controversial, so do not treat it to be such and vote yes to Ms. Owen's resolution. Our next speaker is Orion Davis and then Alex Elstrat. Welcome. Good evening, board members. My name is Orion Davis, my pronouns are he, him, and I am a junior from Salem High School. I'm speaking in support of Ms. Owen's resolution. Every other Tuesday, a significant group of students comes to speak. Every other Tuesday, students come here to speak in the name of defending themselves and their friends. We are living through this, we are affected by it, our loved ones are affected by it, and we know how devastating it will be if Ms. Owen's resolution is ignored. If ignored, we will feel the effects hardest of all. All we are asking for is for things to stay the same. Consistently, you see students that have taken time out of their lives to write, edit, and stand up and speak to you. That takes time, courage, and effort, and that should tell you something about the determination and desperation that is consistently being shown to you. On the contrary, one of the largest group of adults I've ever seen come to speak here was at the last meeting, when most of said adults were misinformed and enraged over sports that have nothing to do with the vote at hand. Schools cannot aid children in medical transition. A child cannot get a legal name change, a sex marker change, surgery, or HRT without the informed consent of themselves and, my parent, and the parents, which I know from recently starting HRT as a minor. The school remained completely uninvolved throughout that process. Teachers and staff members can, however, create a safe and trusting and effective environment for all of their students. Referring to a student as they choose has no impact on the education of another student. It benefits the individual's education, however, because they are in a comfortable and safe setting. It does not take away from the rights and care of other students. That trusting and safe environment can save lives. After all, before I was ready to come out to my parents, it saved mine. I came out to my art teacher and my close friends in middle school before I told my parents. Having a safe space where I could be referred to in the way that I knew was right for me saved me from committing suicide. I want to emphasize that without that small support system, I would be dead today. Would you really rather have dead children than a trans child that hasn't told their parents? If a child feels safe with their parents, they will eventually come out when they're ready. If your concern as a parent is that your child is trans and won't tell you, then maybe you should reflect on why they might not want to come out. Owen's resolution isn't hurting kids or destroying families. It is saving lives. Seconds. It is time to make the right decision. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alex Astrod. Welcome. Thank you. Last meeting, Ms. Owens' resolution caused quite a stir, as I'm sure many of all of you know from the 111 speakers that signed up to speak. Many people did not understand the meaning behind this resolution and attacked the very nature of it. Some critiqued its lack of specificity, which, honestly, I don't disagree with. However, luckily, that is fixed now, and this updated resolution is on the agenda for everyone to see. So now we can stop this bad faith argument over whether or not this bill has to do with sports. Because I would like to remind you, regardless of whether the re resolution states it perfectly or not, according to this board's own attorney, this board has no jurisdiction over sports, and it is solely an issue for VHSL to handle. These discussions over transgender athletes and sports are nothing more than a scapegoat to kill a resolution that, in our hearts, everyone knows should pass. Some people call this a preemptive strike on Glenn Youngkin. 
But quite frankly, the reality is, if you believe that, it tells us a lot more about you than us. That's because this is a preemptive strike on discriminatory and illegal policies, regardless of the person passing them. So quite frankly, this doesn't mean the model policies are fully safe, because if the model policies are discriminatory and illegal, we should not enforce them regardless of who proposed them. Some question this as a Pride Month resolution, ignoring the blocks of student speakers speaking here, afraid that they're afraid they or their peers will become victims to policies that will undermine their identities and a school board that falls complacent to such policies. So when people ask, what is the need for this resolution? My answer is the 20 plus students who spoke here tonight and have been sitting behind and speaking alongside of me for the better part of seven months, scared that VPCBS is going to endanger them and or their friends. It is also the countless transgender and non-binary students who have come to us in fear that policies are going to be enacted that will endanger their lives. They come to us wondering that what, their, what will our school board do if legislation proposed or passed will leave their identities in purgatory. Well, with this resolution, they would have to wonder no more. Every single member of the school board can be put on the record over which side of history they would like to stand. This resolution plainly asks whether or not you believe this school board should break laws in order to undermine the identities of our peers. It will put you on the record about whether or not you support upholding the inclusive learning environment that Virginia Beach offers its students, or instead will sacrifice this environment for the fear of few mean tweets thrown your way. Do you support inclusivity? Do you support the right of students of all identities to be respected? If you do, then there is no reason as to why you should vote against Ms. Owens' resolution next meeting. Show us, your students, as Ms. Riggs stated earlier in this meeting, the people you were meant to protect, that you were in fact willing to protect us. Thank you. That was our last student speaker. Our next set of speakers are Amy Riley, Allison Barrero, and Lisa Bertini. Welcome. Good evening, Chairwoman Riggs, Vice Chair Weems, School Board members, and Dr. Spence. My name is Amy Riley, and I'm a 25-year librarian and educator. I'm a parent of a seventh and ninth grader in Virginia Beach. In fact, right now, I should be attending my son's last band concert of the year, but instead, I am here once again speaking in defense of school libraries. Although disappointed, my son understands the importance of protecting the books he loves. I'm here to request that you vote no on school policy 665 on library materials. First, I'm, in trouble, I'm troubled that some of our school board members are still making decisions about our schools and libraries without ever stepping foot in them, and that needs to change. We have always welcomed you in and seek an open dialogue with you. Secondly, concerning book selection, librarians have always made decisions about books, keeping in mind in loco parentis. In my 15 years, I have always followed the division procedure of noting in students' accounts if a parent does not want their child to read certain books. For the record, I've only had less than five of these requests in 15 years in a building of 500 plus students, and no parent has ever had to take it any further than that. However, a restriction for one child does not mean that all the other kids in the building should not have access to certain books simply because one parent objects. This is true parent choice. This is very similar to when a parent has a problem with their child's teacher, but instead of contacting the teacher, they go straight to the principal. If there is a problem with a book, the first line of defense should be to contact the librarian, not write a school board policy. A majority of these issues should be solved simply by having a conversation and a relationship with your child's librarian. Also, the argument that parents are not aware of the opt-out form does not hold water. Every school has sent out paper copies and links to this form multiple times. In fact, FC has sent out a link to this form 32 times this year in parent communications. If a parent was really concerned about what their child was reading, all they would have to do is once again contact the school to get a form or contact the librarian. Logistically, this would be a massive disruption to the daily activities of the library. The policy states that our elementary collections have to be evaluated by the beginning of next school year. Last day of school is in four weeks. When will this happen? Librarians are 10-month employees. For the rest of the school year, myself and other librarians are proctoring SOLs, providing SOL review, teaching lessons while still hunting down overdue books, making phone calls, sending out notices, assessing fines, and completing inventory. I'm also concerned with the definition of sexually explicit content. Lewd is defined as predominantly crude and offensive in a sexual way. How much is predominantly? What percentage of the book? 30 seconds. Who gets to define what crude is? Does this include a cartoon naked butt in a child's storybook? Where is the line going to be drawn? Finally, the original state bill applies only to instruction materials, and this policy is attempting to apply library materials to the state bill. This policy is not needed. 
I implore all board members to visit their schools, invite librarians to policy committee meetings, and request that you vote no on policy 665. Thank you. Our next speaker is Allison Barrero, Lisa Bertini, and then Becky Feld. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. I have the pleasure of serving at a Title I elementary school as a library media specialist. In September, I look forward to greeting the students back into school. At the beginning of the year, we read books together in the library that talk about empathy, cooperation, teamwork, and friendship. These topics help kick off the school year and get students excited for learning and reading. Unfortunately, many of my students come into school after a summer of inst instability, many not knowing if they'll have three solid meals a day and oftentimes are home alone due to their parents working and not affording childcare. They come back with the excitement of stability and support in school. Passing the proposed amendments to policy 665 would require the library to shut down. As 10-month employees, my library assistant and I do not work summers. It's unreasonable to believe that with the remaining 17 days of school, we can read through every book in our collection cover to cover and remove any that meet the definitions in the proposed policy. In order for us to truly ensure that we are complying with the proposed policy, reading the books cover to cover is exactly what we would have to do. How will our students feel if they come back to school next year, ready ret to return to their safe place, the school and the library, to check out books, only to find that our doors have to remain closed to them because of this proposed policy? Working at a Title I school, the majority of my students are already at a disadvantage due to their socioeconomic status. Many of them don't have the financial means to purchase books to create a home library. Further, some don't have transportation to visit a public library. The school is the only means that many of our students have to acquire books. Passing the proposed amendments to policy 665 would take books out of the hands of our kids for an undetermined length of time. This would affect the already marginalized students who are already beginning steps behind the starting line. The National Center for Education Statistics states that students who have books in their homes perform better academically. Specifically, while less than 15% of students with between zero and 10 books scored proficient, 50% of students with more than 100 books did. Since many of my students do not have books at home, they need access to the wonderful books in our school library in order to support their academic growth and their love of reading and learning. Please vote no to proposed policy 665. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Lisa Bertini. Becky Feld, Charlene Olson. Welcome. Welcome, thank you very much. Good evening, um, this is regarding voting no to policy 665. I truly believe that any list that segregates some books from others in the library of a public school cannot end well. Just two and a half hours from here in Spotsylvania County, this past March, 14 books were banned from the, public, the, the school public library Two were Pulitzer Prize winning ones. They were excluded after the committee of librarians and teachers and parents had said they were appropriate because the one parent who lost at the first trial round won on appeal. Let me tell you why that one parent is not a hero. Parents have always had the right and continue to have the right to refuse to let their children read books that they believe is inappropriate. To now impose that right on other people's children deprives the great majority of parents of the choice to have these books taught in their children's classroom. That interference is real and it's damaging. And I object to that with everything I believe to be sacrosanct. Not my religion, but the intrinsic divinity of literature, history, storytelling, and discovery that is the true gift of books. Due to some parents' seriously unhealthy preoccupation with dissecting great works of art, looking for mention of sexual parts, students today are denied the ability to experience any literary merit, social relevance, or historical redemption that exists in these books. Why? Because the books may have contained the word penis, or vagina, or described gay love, which is in fact love. Let's reject this policy tonight. Anne Frank's description of her vagina in her diary is not scary, it's not offensive, 
It's not lewd. It is age-appropriate sexual awareness of a girl hidden for two years during adolescence in an attic during a war. What is both scary and offensive, however, is taking the diary of this young girl, this seminal piece of literature, one of the only existing exquisite and rare records of a teenage Jewish girl murdered by Nazis. 30 seconds. And figuratively marking it with a yellow star as something less than, something not fit for educating our children. That, ladies and gentlemen, that is profanity. Thank you. Our next speaker is Becky Feld, Charlene Olson, and then Katie Lors. Welcome. Good evening, my name is Becky Feld. I'm a proud Virginia Beach Public School librarian and mother of three VBCPS students. Virginia Beach City Public Schools has worked so hard over the years to make our district one of the best in the state, preparing our students to be future-ready learners for the 21st century. One of those accomplishments is ensuring that every school has a library staffed with a highly trained, licensed school librarian. Why did VBCPS do this? Well, it's simple because librarians are certified information professionals that ensure our students are equipped with information literary skills, a proper understanding of digital citizenship, surrounded by a community-wide culture of reading and a partnership with teachers for collaboration across all content areas to strengthen the instructional delivery. According to the American Library Association, across the United States, studies have demonstrated that students in schools with effective school library programs and diverse collections learn more, get better grades, and score higher on standardized tests than their peers in schools without comparable resources. Not only do reading scores improve, but math scores are higher in schools with high quality libraries and certified librarians. And in addition, graduation rates are significantly higher even after controlling for school size and poverty. We have amazing libraries in VBCPS. There are so many dynamic things happening in and around the school. Student work is displayed in the libraries, cross-curricular lessons and expos take place, students explore makerspace, they check out books on topics they want to research and of personal interest. They come for lessons, book tastings, book fairs, they come to read, to find the next best adventure. Sometimes they come to just escape, a safe haven for them in the middle of the hustle and bustle of an intense jam-packed day of learning. Librarians are trained in collection development as part of their professional learning and are tasked in their schools to monitor their collections for usage. It is our job to ensure our collections are appropriate for the audiences they serve. And the audiences that they serve are diverse, so the collections need to be diverse, appropriately representing their population of students. Those certified, highly trained librarians you have placed in each of our libraries make sure that the materials are appropriate. Librarians are mandated to follow the guidance of their school board as part of their collection development. For example, this might need to be a providing a variety of resources and information on a topic, supplemental learning resources for students, and to consider aspects like timeliness, accuracy, and attention to professional critiques and reviews in that selection. Adherence to these school board regulations is something that school librarians review regularly in their professional work with their colleagues in the school system and with the guidance of their library supervisors. We've spoken out many times explaining how we already partner with parents and have multiple policies and procedures in place that give parents all the control they want when it comes to what their child needs and checks out. This policy equates to censorship that will silence and fail to represent marginalized students. I implore you to vote against this policy. And that is time. Our next speaker is Charlene Olson, then Katie Lures, then Mary Arrington. Welcome. Good evening, Chairwoman Riggs, Vice Chair Weems, Dr. Spence, and school board members. My name is Charlene Olson, and I'm a school librarian. Thank you for allowing me to speak towards the proposed changes to the library policy. I'm against the changes to the library policy because they are unnecessary, vague, confusing, and subjective. There are already two opt-out forms regarding library materials, and they are linked on the library page of every school's website. But if the board believes that they are hard to find, then they could probably be added to parent view with all of the other back to school forms that parents get at the beginning of the year. This year, only 12 students out of over 65,000 had forms returned to the schools, which equates to 0.002% of our students. So the parents of 99.008% do not have an issue with the materials in their school uh, children's library. 
Parents can also contact their student's librarian. Several years ago, I had a parent who didn't like graphic novels, and she told me she didn't want her student checking them out. So I made a note in his Destiny account, and he wasn't able to check out any graphic novels that year. It was that easy. Last year, I had a student who came to the library. She looked at the books. She wrote down the titles for her parents to preview, and then came back the next day to check out the books that her parents said she could. Parents, or anyone for that matter, have access to view the library catalog. It is linked on every school's library page. Lastly, parents should also talk to their children, see what they're checking out, and if there's an issue, contact the school librarian. I do believe that as a parent, you have the right to determine what your child's read, and as a parent, it is my right to determine what my child reads. One of the additions to the policy was for the development of a method for parents and adult students to challenge books. This is unnecessary because there is already a procedure in place to challenge library materials, and the first step is guess what? Contact the school's librarian. I believe there have been 15 challenges division-wide. Finally, I would like you to reject the, the board to reject the policy changes because it would be difficult to follow a policy when it isn't clear and the language in the policy is very vague. A definition of lewd would have added with lewd being defined as being predominantly crude and offensive in a sexual way. Even though it's a legal definition, it is still subjective. Is it offensive to hug, kiss, I don't know. What is offensive to one person may not be offensive to someone else. Librarians are all certified teachers who either seconds. have an additional endorsement, which for me was eight graduate classes, or a master's degree in library science, so we're not afraid of hard work. I am also a national board certified teacher, so I am not afraid of hard work. My opposition to this policy isn't about the work. It's about the freedom to read and the Herculean task that this will place on school librarians. As a professional, I will abide by the decision of the school board to the best of my ability. And I see, as I see it, in order to do that, I will have to read every book from cover and to cover. And that is time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Katie Lors, Mary Arrington, and then Amber Turner. Welcome. Hello, I am the Library Media Specialist at SeaTac Elementary, and I'm here to speak about Proposed Policy 6-65. Requiring Library Media Specialists to read the entire collection of books in order to remove books with a lewd exhibition of nudity is insulting to our professionalism and is a disservice to our time. Before adding any books to the library collection, the current regulation 6-65.1 requires library media specialists to identify two favorable professional library reviews or to personally evaluate materials when reviews are not available. Personally reviewing materials involves reading the publisher's page with the suggested age range and book summary, as well as skimming the table of contents and flipping through the pictures to ensure that the content is developmentally appropriate for the students served. It does not entail reading the book cover to cover, which we would have to do to ensure there is no sexually explicit content according to the proposed definition. We already have policies in place for parents who wish to restrict the titles their child accesses. Parents may request a limited access of library materials for their child, but they may not impose their preferences on the entire school or school district population. As an example, while browsing books, one third grade student told me that he could not read books with magic because it goes against his religious beliefs. So I directed him to the other fiction genres in our nonfiction books. In this instance, I met the parent's request without needing to remove all the magical fantasy books from the collection. Toward the end of each school year, library media specialists conduct the annual collection review process, which entails scanning each book for inventory purposes and running reports for outdated and rarely circulated materials. These procedures ensure that our collection remains up to date and relevant to our students. However, these procedures do not include reading each of our thousands of books cover to cover to satisfy a policy containing vague and subjective language. Library media specialists work a 10 month teacher's contract and do not work over the summer. So it would be impossible for library media specialists to meet the proposed policy expectations by this September. In the proposed policy, the added definition of lewd as, quote, predominantly crude and offense in a sexual way, end quote, is extremely subjective and would be impossible to consistently apply. I guarantee that if I gave each school board member the same set of 10 books and asked each to identify the books containing a lewd exhibition of nudity, each school board member would have different results. For those reasons, mainly the fact that the library media specialists already have effective policies in place to ensure that our books are developmentally appropriate, 
I implore you to vote no on proposed policy 6-65. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mary Arrington, Amber Turner, and then Becky Hay. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Mary Arrington. I am a parent of VBCPS graduates, and I am a library media specialist in the district. I have been trying to figure out how I would perform my job duties in the light of the ambiguities in the proposed policy 6-65. Section B definitions has me flummoxed. What exactly is lewd? What one person finds crude and offensive in a sexual way may not be perceived that way by another. Whose perception do we rely on to determine if an item is lewd? We do not make policies based on vague generalities or emotions, but that is exactly what you are doing by trying to enact policy 6-65. Where does the boundary on library materials begin and end? Will you expect library media specialists to evaluate the public library collection as well as the one in their buildings? Since VBCBS students have access to the public library through their login, I believe the people who are supporting this policy think they are giving parents a tool to protect their children. What upsets me? is that those who support this policy did not take the time to reach out to a library media specialist about their concerns about their child's access to materials, nor did they realize that by supporting this policy, they are censoring what other parents' children have access to. Isn't deciding what someone else's child is allowed to read a violation of their parental rights? In 1975, in Levittown, New York, members of the Island Tree School Board took a list of books they felt were questionable into the library and removed them from the shelves. In 1976, the Island Tree School Board ordered more books to be removed from shelves in the district based upon a list. Your proposed policy says there will be a sexually explicit materials list created which will be posted on the school's website. This sounds so similar to what happened in Island Trees District, it is scary. Island Trees versus Pico went before the Supreme Court, where the decision went against the school district. Seconds. Why are you trying to enact a flawed policy that will be overturned by case law? Creating a list of naughty books is actually a great way to get children to read. I only wish that I had thought to do that myself instead of spending hours curating collections that meet the needs of all the students in my building, not just the ones that fit the censor's agenda. Thank you. Let me add, please remember decorum. Silently laugh to yourself, please. Our next speaker is Amber Turner, Becky Hay, and then Lindsay Bohan. Welcome. Hi, thank you. My name is Amber Turner. I am a parent of a VBCPS uh, high school student, and I'm a parent of a recent graduate who's now uh, an engineering major at Virginia Tech. Um, whether or not a child has provided support at home, it is still the school's responsibility to try to fill in those gaps to ensure that a child does not fall through the cracks. We have learned that throughout history, and as a former teacher, I have personally experienced that. All minority populations should be protected so that children do not have to deal with what mine did as an openly non-binary child in middle school. These kids should not have to listen to a teacher tell all the 14-year-olds in the class as each and every one leaves because they have to go to the bathroom in front of the entire class, remember, you need to use the girls' bathroom. Remember, you need to use the boys' bathroom, thus making my child feel like something is wrong for being the way they are. My child should also not have to listen to that teacher refer to her, sorry, their minority as you little transgenders. Put any other minority population title in place of transgenders and it would be abhorrent and not tolerated in our district. My child should not have to sit in the lunchroom and hear kids tell them that they are going to hell. Imagine the effect this can have on those kids who are still in the closet. 
What message is that sending to them? My child has had amazing teachers and staff members along the way who have supported them to the fullest, and their support helps counter the few who roll their eyes and make comments to try to make them feel inferior. To those who supported my child, I would like to take a moment to give a heartfelt thank you. You know who you are, and you have made a huge difference in the life of my child. And I can only imagine the difference you are making in the lives of the kids who are still in the closet when they witness you treating my openly non-binary child with respect and dignity. As a parent to two special needs kids, I have learned that there is truly no one who gets it unless they are going through what I am. Some of my best friends are these parents because they get it. The parents and community members speaking against this resolution tonight have not walked in our shoes, so they are truly incapable of understanding why we need these assurances for our children. They do not know it yet, but I guarantee you that more than one of them will have a child, a grandchild, a niece, oh, okay, or nephew who is hiding that they are LGBTQ+. These kids are the reason why I ask you to please pass Jessica Owens' resolution Thank you. Our next speaker is Becky Hay, then Lindsay Bowen. Welcome. There's a common concerning theme in three agenda items before the board tonight. The proposed LGBTQ resolution, the proposed library policy regarding explicit materials, and the possible bylaw change to allow student board representatives. In each case, you are taking responsibility and authority away from parents and placing them upon minor children. First, this authority is not yours to take and distribute as you wish. Schools operate in local parentis based on permissions granted to you by parents, not the other way around. Secondly, these items impose mature content and decisions on children who are stu still developing mentally and emotionally. Most studies conclude that the average age of mental maturity is about 25 years old, and emotional maturity is even older. Yet this board would allow children to choose explicit mature book content or gender identities and names contrary to their biological or given ones without the guidance or knowledge of their parents. Throughout the country, we have parents currently being charged for negligent parent parenting leading to gun violence, which is appropriate, and yet this board would significantly limit or take away parental responsibility to monitor and guide what a child can read, see, or even call themselves. The proposed library policy encourages district transparency and parental engagement. It allows for parent choice while not removing parental authority. One example of what we're talking about is Living Dead Girl by Elizabeth Scott in five Virginia Beach high schools, a book about a 10-year-old girl abducted by a pedophile and repeatedly threatened and raped for, for years. From pages 26 and 27, I know, silly girl, he says and stands up, unbeckling his belt. He opens his pants. Come here, give me a kiss, hello. I get up and walk over to him. He frowns and I hunch over so I can barely come to his shoulder. Alice, my baby, he says, kissing my cheek. Then he shoves me to my knees. When he's finished, he throws the rest of my yogurt away. He drinks a beer and orders a pizza and puts me on his lap. Ray likes how smooth I am, how raw my skin is. It burns by the time he's done touching it. At bedtime, he rumples the sheets. We have a two-bedroom apartment because we're father and daughter, and he wants to take care of me, wants me to have my own room like other little girls. Then he crawls into my tiny bed with me. I'm so hungry and my head hurts, making me slow, and he pinches my thighs hard. Love you too, I say, but it's too late, and he holds me down, breathing hard and fast. Show me, he says, show me, so I do. Children should not process this material without gu adult guidance, if at all. Parents must be effectively notified this material is available so they can seconds. decide if appropriate and so they can discuss it with their children and, and choose to allow to access to it. Whoever votes against this policy is agreeing to the unfettered access of vulgarity, obscenity, and pornographic themes and imagery by minor, minor children. Rationalize it any way you want, but it's a fact. The hyperbolic exaggeration needs to stop. There's no rational comparison of this policy to Nazi Germany, as there is still access to these books in multiple venues. And that is time. Our next speaker is Lindsay Bohan. Welcome. Good evening. Lots to touch on tonight, but I sent an email this afternoon in case anyone wants to submit a FOIA request. First, I oppose the student representative bylaw proposal. It's completely unnecessary. You were elected to do this job. 
Second, please vote no on Ms. Jo uh, Ms. Owens' resolution. I appreciate the speaker earlier who acknowledged that the opposing side um, doesn't hate anyone. That was a bridge building moment. Another speaker said there's light, uh, or sorry, there is an end in sight, I'm sorry, because of this resolution. Unfortunately, that is not necessarily the case. This resolution was crafted as an effort to undermine the forthcoming transgender model policy. That's why many of the 111 speakers came last week. One of my biggest concerns right now is that there are no plans to address the many concerns that the students have been bringing up week after week for months. I pose more questions in my email, but maybe school board members should try reframing the conversation to come up with a plan to address their concerns within the bounds of the new policy, which VBCPS will have to abide by. Three, when the time comes, please vote in favor of the library materials policy changes. Take note of these factual statements that dispel some of the false statements being spread. The policy does not ban books. Any current library books that are challenged or new books that contain explicit content are put on a list, uh, easily accessible to parents so that they can choose whether or not to opt their child out. The policy promotes transparency, not censorship. Librarians will not have to read every book in their libraries. Only books found in elementary schools are challenged um, in the middle and high school levels will go through the review process for removal or, or be added to that list. Uh, all new library books will be reviewed for explicit content. Ms. Linetti has mentioned um, that there is legal precedent available uh, to define explicit content. In fact, the PRC counseled with Ms. Linetti in drafting the proposed changes. Uh, per Senate Bill 656, parents have the option to opt their children out of objectionable, objectionable material, but this process is only for instructional materials. And no, no one is advocating to remove history or health books. The proposed library policy is reasonable, allows for diversity of opinion, seconds. allows for parents who are comfortable with their children ac accessing explicit content, like we just heard, to continue to do so while allowing um, easy and transparent ways for parents who do not want their kids to read or see such things to opt out. This policy should be something the entire board should fully support. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rob Bohan. Okay, then that is going to be the end of the, until it's 7.59, we will resume, uh, return back to the uh, public comments right after our number 12 information. We're going to start with policy review committee, the PRC recommendations, one bylaw, 1-7, student representatives to the school board, Ms. Linetti. Good evening, Madam Chair, school board members, and Dr. Spence. I'm Cam Linetti, the school board attorney. Tonight we have eight policy and bylaws to bring for you that came out of the policy review committee's May 11, 2023. Meeting, the first is bylaw 1-7. This is student representative to the school board. This would be a proposal for a new bylaw. We've reviewed this one time before briefly and brought it to your attention for the first time. Actually, tonight, I think, will be the first time you're discussing it. This would be a brand new bylaw that we have not had. At this time, we, the recommendation would be that there be a student representative to the school board, which is allowed by the Virginia Code. This, the school board, rather than having one representative, the proposal would then be that there be three, each comprehensive high school will have a junior and a senior representative. The Renaissance Academy, Greenmont Collegiate Charter School, and the Achievable Dreams Academy High School Program would each then have one representative. Their term of service for a representative would be from July 1st to June 30th of each year, noting that the first year this year, if it were to be implemented, may not start on July 1st. There are several eligibility requirements that are set forth in section B3. There would be a selection process that the superintendent would oversee and handle with the application period. Um, one of the restrictions would be that there be some diversity for student opinion and concerns and the strong encouragement by the school board that the selection students who may not otherwise serve in student leadership positions be considered. 
There's also some restrictions on the junior representative or replacement of the senior representative. There, there will be a lottery system for that, and that that will then go to the school board. So although the superintendent would propose the selection process, the application process, once the pool of candidates for each one of those positions comes forward, there would be a lottery pr program that would come out of that that would pick the representative from those persons qualified for each school or position. This was a new addition that was brought back after policy review committee, so th the school board members who saw the proposed bylaw last time, this would be a new procedure we've added. Section D sets forth duties and responsibilities. Again, the student representative's purpose would be to provide input to the school board regarding student opinions on agenda matters. And they only have those duties and responsibilities that have been provided to them or signed to them by the school board. They will not have voting rights on any matter before the school board or the school division. At each regular school, regular school board meeting or school board retreats, there would be one student representative who would attend that and provide input to the board. So we, though each school may have two representatives or one if you're one of our specialty programs, at any particular time, you will only see one student representative here at the school board meetings. At its discretion, the school board can invite one, one or more student representatives to come to its meetings. While attending the meetings, a student representative, if the student cannot find, attend the meeting as a sign, the student has to find the alternative student representative to come to that meeting. The expectation is that the student representative will have read and reviewed all agenda materials for that meeting and be prepared to participate in discussions regarding agenda materials. They would also seek advice or guidance from school board members as superintendent's designee regarding how to present those matters. So one more page. And some of the procedures that we'd also consider would be attend the meetings, convey the concerns for them at the student council. So I believe the expectation is that there would then be a student council or a similar name for that group of these student representatives who would come together after the agenda materials are out. And the students would then work together, review the agenda materials, and come up with a consensus opinion as to what the student representative assigned for that meeting will present to the school board on there. And let's see, one more thing. Oh, the one the exception would be if at some point a student representative expected to participate in a school board activity during school hours or when they were had an assigned extracurricular activity, which is unlikely based on the time of your meetings, but should that happen, that student representative could go to their principal and determine whether they could get a waiver from that event. And the suggested this time under Section E is that a school board member mentoring would be done by the school board vice chair or designee who will serve as a contact person for that. The superintendent or designee would then provide the training and supervision for student representatives and develop an annual schedule for the student representatives when they serve as student representatives at a school board meeting. So that is a general overview of the proposed bylaw. I do believe that Mrs. Owens is online. She and Ms. Franklin worked on putting together this um, proposed bylaw with the superintendent and staff. She may be able to answer further questions. PRC has looked at this twice now and provided some corrections as of the last meeting. So at this time, if there are any questions we can answer for you, please go ahead. Okay. All right, hearing no questions on that, we will move on to policy 346, which is audits. One of the things we did earlier this year was take a look at our Department of um, Internal Audit Services on there. This is a long-term department. We've had the internal auditor functions on a co-equal basis with the superintendent and the school board attorney. She ran an office for many years for us. While reviewing the new position and hiring a new school board internal auditor, we decided we needed to make some changes to the names of that particular department on there. So. One of the things we did was change it from the name of the Office of Internal Audit to the Department of Internal Audit. We saw that earlier this year when we changed my department to the Department of Legal Services. So you will see some changes in that. In the first paragraph, under audits, we are referring to changes in the um, annual audit for um, the external auditors, used to be called the CAFR. We're now referring that to, let's see, let's pull up the thing, the external auditor's opinion on there. Um, let me see, I think that is, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. That is the only change, I'm sorry, under pol um, policy 346 under audits. So uh, this policy came up while we were reviewing the internal audit. We'll see another policy coming for that. So the only change is in the first paragraph, I'm sorry, it would read, the firm shall timely provide the external auditor's opinion on the annual comprehensive financial report, the ACFR, we used to call it the CAFR on there, and a minor change after that. 
That would be the only recommendation on policy 346. I apologize for the confusion on that. Are there any questions on policy 346? Hearing no questions on policy 346, I will move on to policy 387, free and reduced price meals as recommendation coming out of probably the school services. We needed to add a required language into the second um, paragraph, which is paragraph three. The suggested language would read, additionally, the school board will ensure that at any back to school night event in the school division to which adult students or parents, legal guardians have enrolled, minor students are invited, any such adult student or parent, legal guardian in attendance receives prominent notification of and access in paper or electronic form or both to information about application eligibility for free and reduced price meals for students and a fillable free and reduced price meals application that may be completed and submitted on site. That is required language from the federal government to maintain our ability to access the funding for these meals and that is a recommendation at this time to change that policy. Are there any questions on 387? I just have a comment, if I may. Um, Ms. Linetti, I believe you mentioned that this is uh, required under a uh, federal law. Do we need to reference that under the legal references, or is it already there? I think it's already in the Hungry F Healthy Hungry Free Kids Act of 2010. It's just been changed or updated? It's also, and if you'll take a look at the U.S. Department of Agriculture Rules and Regulations for National School Lunch, it's be there, and the Healthy Hungry Free Kids Act, those are the federal laws that apply to this area. Okay, thank you. Are there any further questions? Hearing no further questions on policy three, 87. We'll move on to policy 396. This was actually the policy I should have been referring to earlier. This is the department, well not read, the Department of Internal Audit and the Audit Committee. Again, the vast majority of the changes you see here will be removing the title office to now read Department of Internal Audit. A couple changes in the name. The auditor was before called the Internal Auditor. We're now referring to it as the School Board Internal Auditor. And a few other changes, um, Scrivener changes down in, in section B. You'll see later in the uh, information agenda, I'm going to talk to you about the internal audit charter. We're pulling out the notes for the inter editor's notes on there and just put the related links. Looks like a lot of changes, but it's really just Scrivener changes to the name of the department, consistent with what we did earlier this year when changing that department's name. Are there any questions on policy 396? Hearing no questions on policy 396. That will move us on to policy 665, library, media, professional libraries. This has been up before. We took it back to policy review committee at the May 11th meeting. There were some minor changes that we have made in there that we believe may assist in clarifying some of the issues. Under section B, which is definitions, the first definition, actually I'm looking at the numbering on that. I actually think there's a numbering problem. I think the one got pulled out. However, under paragraph one, sexually explicit content. There was some concern about whether the term, how the term lewd exhibition of nudity was defined. After working with some of the language, both with Mrs. Manning and with PRC, the definition has now been added that a lewd exhibition of nudity, parentheses, lewd is defined as predominantly crude and offensive in a sexual manner, in a sexual way has been added to this definition. Also, if you look down at section C, which is selection of library materials, under A, which applies to elementary schools. After the first sentence, it would be library media specialists shall conduct a thorough review on the school division's prescribed process for reviewing new materials to determine content. Additionally, we were looking at subsection two, which is existing library material standards, also under the elementary school area. We were concerned about the word found, which you're not seeing at the moment out of there, but it read any existing library materials that contain sexually explicit content found through the school division's prescribed process. That's how it read last time you saw it. They have put the word, suggested the word now be changed to discover, so it would be that contains sexually explicit content discovered through the school division's prescribed process for reviewing existing materials as referenced in Regulation 665.1 as amended in elementary schools must be removed by the beginning of the 23-24 school year. Further clarification was added to Section D, which is identification of library materials with sexually explicit materials. We did some formatting changes. Section 1 would be the superintendent or designee will develop a regulation and or process for identifying library materials with sexually explicit content referenced in section A, B, and C of this policy. The school board attorney will approve such regulation or, and or process for legal sufficiency. The superintendent is two. The superintendent or designee in consultation with the school board attorney will develop a process for parents or adult students to challenge library materials. And three, 
we added a sentence that reads, nothing in this policy is intended to be used to bring criminal charges against school division employees. And I don't believe we have any further changes on that. Those are the changes coming back from the policy review committee after the May 11th meeting. Are there any questions we can answer at this time? Ms. Anderson. So I want to make it clear that I voted against moving this policy forward. I have several reasons. Number one, we really should listen to our librarians. This, this policy will directly affect their work. It will directly affect what, they, what their job is. Um, and we have not taken the time to ask any librarians to attend our meeting and give um, the policy committee their opinion on several of these issues that really will affect their, their job. Um, also, this policy states that nothing is intended to be used to bring criminal charges against employees, but the word intended does not mean that library media specialists cannot be charged for a crime or have a civil case brought against them. There's no legal protections in this policy for the, for the employees. The terminology in the policy is vague. Um, for example, the word crude is subjective. Who decides what is predominantly crude? Who decides that? A librarian or a, a committee? Or will there be a list of questions that are asked for the books? This policy is not ready at this time for us to vote on. If we, if we really feel that we need to work on adding more policy on books that might be offensive to some people, and I do have a whole group of books, copies of the front of the book and, and pages on the inside of books that are in elementary schools that are predominantly okay for now because nobody has actually challenged them. But, you know, um, I have, for example, the Powhatan Indians. There's a picture of an Indian in there in the pages. It's historically correct. No one has challenged it at this time. But he happens to be standing there pretty much nude from the angle that you're looking at. Adventures of Super Diaper Baby has another picture of a baby that's nude. What Riley wore, another example of a child that's nude. It may not show their private parts, but you know it leaves a lot to the imagination. The Emperor's New Clothes. Those are books that could be challenged later on with this vague policy of what is predominantly crude. In one particular book, uh, we received an email this week from a librarian who said there was a book where a child was running away down the street. I can't remember the name of the book right now, but anyway, the child was nude. You can see him from the behind. And a parent actually returned the book but had drawn a pair of pants on the kid because the parent felt like that was not appropriate to show a child from behind. So what's, what's predominantly crude to one parent is not predominantly crude to another. And so this, this, the way this policy is written, and as vague as this policy, these, these definitions are especially predominantly crude, um, determines lewd. Or, you know, that, that's somebody's definition. And it might not be today. You know, we may not have a parent that challenges those books. But you know, next week, we might. So this just opens us up for people's opinions about what is predominantly crude and what's not. Um, and so I just feel that this policy, first of all, it's not necessary. It's been pointed out several times this evening by some librarians who took the time to come this evening and speak to us that we actually have a method for parents to challenge books or to make sure that their child doesn't, doesn't check out certain books. And if a child does bring a book home, that a parent does uh, disapproves of, you know, it's their job as a parent to sit down with that child and explain why they don't want them reading that book. Parents have the right to do that. 
but they don't have the right to tell the neighbor's child next door that they can't read a book. They only have the right to you know, decide what their own child reads. So I just feel like this policy is unnecessary. We have the guidelines in place. We have policy in place that allows parents to challenge, book, challenge books or contact their librarian and let the librarian know what their children can and can't read. And so this policy is not necessary. And I urge my colleagues to vote against this policy for those reasons and for some of the other eloquent reasons that have been, been sent to us through email from, from all the librarians across the city. It's a shame that we haven't bothered to ask librarians to come to our PRC meeting and give their opinions on what, how this policy affects them. That's an absolute shame on our part as the PRC committee. It's a shame that the administration hasn't asked them to come. If nothing else, we need to send this back to PRC and then we need to ask a group of librarians to come and give their, their reasons to the PRC why this policy is not workable. Thank you. Ms. Melnick. As I listen to Mrs. Anderson, she shared a lot of arguments. Um, and the truth is, this, this should not go back to the policy committee because this policy will never be ready, ever. It will never be ready. So. The policy committee already went to a lot of trouble to clarify definitions that are still subjective and ambiguous. Um, we, again, for the 100th time, we have policies in place, we have procedures in place for parental controls. And we've been listening to parents for years about parental rights. Parents have always had the right, they still have the right to decide what their children can read or not read. Perfect. I'm not going to repeat anything anybody, ever, anybody else said, but I will ask our attorney, um, and we've talked about this, I mean, we've been talking about the wording of all of this, you know, and checking the box for legal sufficiency, but nobody on this board has asked our attorney, will we end up in court? Can we be sued? Of course you can be sued. Okay, okay. thank you. I'll right take now. that. I, I mean, yes, the answer is yes, and many people have brought that up. And I know this board has sat in a room, and we have had our attorney guide us on on and give us her opinion on, on other topics. And I have heard some of these same board members say the same thing I just said. Thank you. We can't go forward with this. Our attorney's just given us advice, and we will end up in court. Please remove this if it's up for, if it's up for revision. Put our procedures in policy, what we do for families, the way we have always done. Martin. Thank you. Um, so I'm looking at this through three different lenses, and forgive me for my lack of brevity here. Um, uh, one of those lenses is process. So does a single word or phrase um, put a book on this list? I think what we're going to have to do, and we've talked through this with teaching and learning, we need to then come up with a process of how those individuals, which are most likely our library media specialists, will go through the analysis as set forth here in policy 665. So they're gonna to have to look at sexually explicit, they're going to have to go down through each one of these definitions and make a determination as to whether the material in the library materials meets this criteria. So what I would say, some of these are phrases, some of these are words. So whether you meet the definition of sadomasochist and their uh, sadomasochistic abuse, that's a phrase on their corporophilia word. So again, I'm going to go explain when we do this, you're going to have to go through these each definitions that set forth in this policy and they're going to have to make a determination whether that material meets one of these phrases. Okay, my next question would be, 
um, in terms of elementary school review of our existing collections. Um, I read this to say that every single book with the word gay is gonna have to be reviewed for whether that means homosexuality or happiness because under 18.2-390, sexual conduct includes the word homosexuality, homosexuality by itself and not in any other context. That I am gonna to have to disagree with you on. In 18.2390, sexual conduct means actual or explicitly simulated acts of masturbation, homosexuality. So I think you have to put the words um, uh, acts or actual or explicit acts and then the following different types of acts in there. So it, it does have to be an act. I don't think the status of being a homosexual itself is what they're talking about here. It's the actual act description, depiction of an act of one of these categories. So a storybook about Christmas with my two dads, my two dads are holding hands in this illustrated storybook, does that put it on the list? That is where we're gonna to have to go some the training. Does that qualify as an actual or explicit simulation of an act of homosexuality, intercourse, physical contact, and an apparent sexual stimulation? That is an analysis that we're gonna to have to go through. But I do think when you're talking sexual conduct, it is an act that they have to do, not the status of your gender choice or sexual orientation. Okay. Um, if I go through some additional thoughts along that line, um, do you believe that Greek tragedies such as Agamemnon, um, uh, Oedipus, the entire trilogy founded on an ancestral relationship between mother and son would put it on the list? It would be the act, if the de a depiction of the act, so a graphic novel would be a picture or a description of that act might qualify, it might. In which case then, Agamemnon would definitely be on the list. Okay, then my next question is, um, one that, that Ms. Melnick answered and got, got, uh, got answered was our risk of litigation. So I've seen in the last 72 hours or so, multiple lawsuits filed in Florida and Georgia. Um, First Amendment, 14th Amendment, Title IX, and Title VI. Um, with the Office of Civil Rights in the Department of Justice getting involved in some of these cases and levying very hefty fines. So I look at this through a fiscal lens. We just asked the taxpayers of Virginia Beach to support one of the largest budgets to make sure that our school district stays on top and among the most stellar districts in the country. And now we are risking hundreds of thousands of dollars in litigation. Um, and so I'm gravely concerned about the fiscal impact and not just on litigation, but on staff costs to do a full review of 10,000 book collections in our elementary schools. Um, especially now that I've learned these are not 12 month employees as well, we would have to bring in a significant amount of trained temporary staff to do this in time for the start of the school year, August 28th. Um, so that concerns me. And then my next question um, is through a literary and academic lens, which is one of my background areas. Does this policy mean we have to cut off our students' access to, say, um, peer-reviewed academic databases like Google Scholar, EBSCOhost, Academic Search Complete, ERIC? Um, so for instance, if I have a student who's reading Lord of the Flies, they have to do an essay, they have to reference peer-reviewed research, they're going to search that up in Google Scholar. They're going to find journal articles, literary criticism, about Lord of the Flies that talks about homosexuality in British boarding schools um, during World War II. Um, and so will we cut off access to academic peer-reviewed research available electronically with this policy? I will defer to teaching and learning as to all the materials available to you. I will say that if it is not an instructional material, it falls under the definition of V3 library materials. So if it's available to a student, you are going to have to look at the procedures in here. So for elementary school, we did, this policy does say you're going to remove sexually explicit material. High school, it's going to depend on whether it's existing material or whether it's um, newly purchased material as to whether you're going to put it on a sexually explicit list. Okay, so most, most of the time, those electronic database contracts or subscriptions are purchased annually. So we would possibly be turning those off when that new contract is renewed? 
I'm not sure how, uh, I don't look at the materials when they come in, I only review the contracts. I don't know if there's a way that they tell you what is new material and what's not on there. So I would assume if it's new material that we have not seen in this database or looked at another time period, then that might be something they'll have to look at. Okay, all right. And then, um, you know, I do think the easiest way to tackle this policy and support parental rights is simply encouraging parents to download lists, already existing lists from organizations like Family Research Council. Um, like Common Sense Media, and letting them know you can submit that list to your child's librarian. And that way, the list you select is one based on your family's values. So for instance, a particular religious community might have a set of books they recommend that you exempt your children from. Um, another religious community may have a different set of books. So I, would, I think our existing policy, where you can submit your own list, it is adequate, and I think what's interesting in here is in 2B, it actually circles back to our existing policy and parental book challenges. So this creates sort of some circular logic here. Um, the other thing that I find interesting about this policy is it says that we don't trust the librarians to make selections and purchases, but we are trusting them to decide which books are gonna go on the list. It's kind of a, you know interesting logic there. And then my last comment will be that it's not lost on me that this is part of a national movement to relitigate Miller v. California on the 50th anniversary of Miller v. California and try to get these cases in front of what is perceived to be a more favorable Supreme Court to try and change overall laws related to sexually explicit material. Um, so I think our existing policy works and I think that you know, parents should be encouraged to download lists that match up to their values. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Manning. Thank you. Um, so regarding being sued, anyone can sue for any reason. Um, a parent could sue because their child was allowed to check out a book that was sexually explicit and the parent didn't know about it. So that is one reason a parent could sue also. Um, on this policy, one thing that we added w was for the superintendent to consult with, the, with our legal counsel to make sure that these legal definitions are being applied appropriately. Um, we're using the same definitions that we have in our um, instructional materials, sexually explicit instructional materials policy that was passed by this board unanimously. And none of these questions came up then. Um, so we're already using um, these definitions, we've already adopted the sexually explicit materials policy, and um, this is going to be done in consult with our legal counsel. Um, we currently, uh, um, so in the elementary schools, this is not going to permit sexually explicit materials in the libraries, which I've been told is pretty much already current practice, that we don't allow um, books that fit under these definitions in our elementary schools. So. That shouldn't be really a, a big change there. Um, at the middle and high school levels, there will be no books removed in this policy, nor books prohibited. Um, new explicit books that are coming into the libraries will simply be identified as such, and um, as well as any book that is challenged by a parent and deemed to fit that legal definition would also then be identified as such to provide transparency for parents who, um, parents like me, who, you know, I, I hear, oh, well, parents, parents just need to opt out. Well, I was a parent and a school board member that had no idea that books that are extremely sexually explicit were available to my child in, um, in the libraries. And I'm gonna read a few of these books that are of concern to me and to many, many parents um, in our division. Um, that are currently in Virginia Beach School Libraries that would fit the definition of sexually explicit. But first, I wanna let parents that are either here with minor children or listening online, um, that these are explicit, um, potentially harmful to children. So if you wanna leave the audience now or mute the sound on the recording, um, please do so at this time. So one of the books that, um, that was troubling to me is found in both middle and high schools in Virginia Beach. This book describes young girls who are sold into sex slavery and details the acts that are done to them. 
I'm only going to read one short excerpt from this book, but it has many like it in, throughout the book. Then he is on top of me, and something hot and insistent is between my legs. He grunts and struggles, trying to fit himself inside me. With a sudden thrust, I'm torn in two. Oh, yes, he says, panting. Habib is good in bed. I hear coming from a distance a steady thud, 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 and register that this is the sound of a headboard hitting a wall. Each morning and evening, Mumtaz comes, beats me with the leather strap, and locks the door behind her. In between men come. They crush my bones with their weight. They split me open. Then they disappear. I am hurt. I am torn and bleeding where men have been. Here's another one. The perks of being a wallflower found in middle and high schools. Do you know what masturbation is? I think you probably do because you're older than me, but just in case, I will tell you, masturbation is when you rub your genitals until you have an orgasm. He took off her bra and started to kiss her breasts, and then he put his hand down her pants and she started moaning. I think they were both very drunk. He reached to take, her pa take off her pants, but she started crying really hard. So he reached for his own. He pulled his pants and underwear down to his knees. After a few minutes, the boy pushed the girl's head down and she started to kiss his penis. She was still crying. Finally, she stopped crying because he put his penis in her mouth, and I don't think you can cry in that position. They start to make out. The stereo is playing, and they're just about to do it when Parker realizes he forgot the condoms. They're both naked and putting on his putting green. They both want each other. There's no condom. So what do you think happened? I don't know. They did it doggy style with one of the sandwich bags. The last meeting I brought um, gave an example of the Handmaid's Tale graphic novel that's in some of our high schools. This shows a picture of a man raping a woman. It shows a man with a, a, a leash on a naked woman, forcing her to eat out of a dog bowl. Another picture has a gun in the woman's mouth. Another picture is her laying naked on the ground. Another picture is her bound and gagged. These are the books that are sexually explicit. Imagine a 10-year-old reading these books without parental permission or knowledge. We do have 10-year-olds in the sixth grade. My son was 10 years old when he was in sixth grade. That's why I believe it's imperative that we have a policy that notifies parents of what materials are present in school libraries for their children to access, because I'm sure parents have no idea that their children can walk into a library and check this out without their permission. If I had time, I could read you about 100 more with similar content. That's what I have found as a school board member and parent spending thousands of hours researching this. I guarantee you most parents don't have 1,000 hours to be able to understand all of the books that are in our libraries, and I'm simply asking for proper parental notification that these books exist in our libraries. Thank you. Mrs. Brown. Thank you. Mrs. Brown. Okay, so I'm gonna try to formulate my thoughts as concisely as I can. Um, so first off, um, I just got on the board in January in the middle of budget season. And um, I feel that it's important to note that I have been to nine libraries so far this year. So I have stepped foot in the libraries, and I have talked to our library media specialists. Um, I have heard that we have a roughly 10,500 library books um, in our elementary school libraries, um, and that can vary from one library to the next. Um, when it comes to the materials we select for our libraries, we're just specifically saying we don't want sexually explicit content such as what she just read, in our elementary school libraries. And I think that is a reasonable position to take. Um, also, I feel like this is important because it was brought up. Um, on April 27th, I had a meeting with Dr. Spence. Um, and in that meeting, we discussed policy 665. And I inquired if we needed LMS input at our next PRC regarding this policy. I was told that it was not necessary. Um, generally, in the policy review committee meetings that I have been in, um, if administration believes bringing somebody in is necessary, um, that is something that is done so that we can um, ask questions. I 
think it may be appropriate um, for the person that trains the librarians to have been to provide input. Um, however, that's, you know, our administration didn't see it as necessary. So um, while I recognize people are welcome to attend our meetings, um, I also think that when it comes to providing input on policy and procedures, that having unbiased um, input is absolutely critical to ensure that we're moving in the direction that's the will of the board. Um, I've heard a couple comments that the policy is vague. Our current policy is very, very vague. It says we're gonna have a library media center. It says we're gonna have print and digital resources. It says they're going to be staffed. It says we're gonna have materials and equipment to support the library. And it says that they're going to be maintained um, professional materials for use by school employees shall be maintained in the media center or in central admin office. That is the very, very, very definition of vague. I do not believe that this is vague. Um, Ms. Linetti and administration has indicated on more than one occasion, Captain Underpants would not be included. Um, the book another board member mentioned um, would not be included. Uh, no, David, would not be included. None of those are sexually explicit. The definition is very clear. There's nudity, and then there's sexually explicit nudity. The definition on that is pretty crystal clear. Um, I'm hearing a lot of arguments surrounding policy 665 that don't actually address 665. Um, so Senate Bill 656, which was the instruction material, one that we put into a policy, created a list. But I would hope that all of our middle schools and likely most of our high schools already have books such as the Diary of Anne Frank, um, To Kill a Mockingbird, in them. And so those would not be new materials that would meet this criteria um, unless somebody decided to challenge it and it met that criteria. Um, and then it would be put on a list so parents can make their own decision. Um, and then another argument I've heard that's a common one is a list tells kids which books they should go read the naughty books. Well, if we're really concerned about the books on the list and the kids reading the books on the list, then maybe those aren't books we should be choosing. Um, I do have a question for Ms. Linetti. Um, so Ms. Linetti, do we have a risk of litigation as a division regardless of this policy's adoption? Relevant to library books or are we talking instructional material? Let's go back, because the reason I'm not saying that is Virginia Code 22.1, 16.8 is the instructional material one. That was, you were required last year to implement. That is the state required you to do, the General Assembly required you to do that. If you didn't have that, we would risk litigation for the instructional material. There is no law requirement that you have what you're putting here in 665. So by opening the door, you potentially open up Either way, if people agree with books being on a list for sex explicit, those that don't agree with them being on a list, we risk that possibility because if you don't have 665, they don't have a reason to sue to say you should have 665 because that is not required by any law. But again, the question, I think sometimes, and I tell you this all the time, the question is not can somebody sue us because they can always sue us at this point. The question is can we defend this, uh, and again, there's a lot in this particular policy we have to look at. It will require regulations, it will require training, and then we rest also that potential that if it's not implemented properly, we haven't provided the necessary training to assist our library media specialists in meeting these terms, we risk litigation. But yeah, the question, can somebody sue us? Of course they can sue us, they can sue us for anything. The other, the question is, can we defend this? I will tell you, as written with this policy, we have work to do in a regulation and training. 
uh, people point out where some vagueness in here. We are going to have to go back with our staff and try to help them come through a process for this and develop this. I have met with teaching and learning. We've talked about the types of things we're going to need to see in a regulation and training, and that's all work we have to do. So like most policies, the implementation, also a lot of it falls to a regulation or a separate procedure. And we've got work to do in that area. So even if we do not adopt 665 as proposed, can we still be sued regarding our libraries? Okay, back to yes, you can always be sued. The question is what would they sue you for actually? If they're saying you exposed my child to material that I did not want my child exposed to. What I hear a lot when we're pointing to 18.2390, which is in the um, morality section of the criminal code in Virginia on the, the obscenity section is how we usually refer to this. There is actually a code 18.2393 that states that you cannot use the obscenity of the, those criminal codes for libraries or schools. So my, I don't think you're going to get sued as criminally for that. However, is somebody going to potentially bring some type of civil lawsuit against you saying you've exposed my child or I ask that my child not have this book and you let my child get that book in there? That is a possibility, yes. Okay. Um, and on a final note, um, administration had sent an email um, asking about the implementation date and after um, talking to Ms. Linetti, today and with administration. Um, I am going to, when we do vote on this, follow their advice and change C, or recommend that we say change C to A from by uh, the beginning of 23-24 school year to by January 1st, 2024. Um, and so that, I believe, covers everything I wanted to say. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Culpepper. Okay. Um, most of it's been said. I just got a couple questions um, uh, for you, Ms. Linetti. Do, do the computers that uh, Virginia Beach Public Schools provide in the library uh, limit access to uh, sexually explicit material? I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer that question, but I will state sexually explicit material is defined here in this statute, and I'm not sure that we've evaluated library materials. We are evaluating that. I believe they do have access to this, but I'm going to have to turn that one over to teaching and learning. Would you mind, could you clarify that again? Are you asking if the computers in the library allow access to sexually explicit. Is that what you asked? That's correct. So the students that would go to the computer, that would use the computers in the library, it would just be destiny that would give them access to the list of the books. It wouldn't give them. I'm sorry, that's not what I intended. Like okay. the uh, so, work computer that they could access the internet with. So when you're logged into a Virginia Beach City Public School computer, we have lots of filters in place. We use securely so students can get to or access certain materials that haven't been deemed appropriate. So a student could not go on and say, um, they couldn't look for, even in a program like Canva or PowerPoint, if they said bikini, we have limited what those bikini pictures look like. Because you find bikinis to be sexually explicit? No, I don't, but if you saw some of the pictures, they could become sexually explicit. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, similarly, do uh, students' Chromebooks limit their access to, uh, I'll say it the same way, sexually explicit material? Well, certainly more the student Chromebooks than the adult Chromebooks because the students have stronger filters on them. Okay, this is issued by you. Does this limit access to sexually explicit material? If you're logged into Virginia Beach City Public Schools, then it does limit access. We have filters on Virginia Beach City Public. If you go home, Mr. Culpepper, and you log in at your house, there's a different filter that's applied because it's based on your Wi-Fi. Okay. You are. When I'm in my house, does this does this iPad limit my access? I would I can tell you that it does. So you know the answer to the question. Yeah, but I want you to say it. Yes, it does. Okay. So in essence, 
You can get off the hot seat if you want, but because uh, you That's answered okay. my question, I appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. So now the question is to you, Ms. Linetti. Uh, we obviously, my, the point of my question is to point out that we already provide limitations on access to, I'll use the same word, sexually explicit, although it apparently, apparently the standard is actually quite a bit lower than what we've defined sexually explicit as in this uh, policy for what students can access via Virginia Beach Public School issued electronic devices. And I think that is already, it's safe to say that's that, that uh, has satisfied the First Amendment test. Would you agree with that? I think we're mixing apples and oranges right now, which right, is a enough. hard concept to do. You're talking about um, obscenity issues, which is normally what we're looking at a First Amendment on here. We're talking about sexually explicit. Now, I remind you, um, the sexually explicit requirements, the first time we've seen them in Virginia applied was the 22.1, 16.8. That came in 2022, which you applied to your instructional materials. So we, to my knowledge, we have no reason to go through our library materials that we're not using for instructional purposes and see whether these definitions apply. So I can't tell you that everything's in there, but as Mrs. Uh, Martin's indicated, Lord of the Flies could be determined to be sexually explicit. That is a book that is available to our, our students depending on which program you're on. So that could be in there. But again, I remind you, we have not gone through our library materials with this filter before, so I can't tell you. Now, it very well, well may very well be that programs and filters that we have are catching some of this stuff, but you have other things, as you mentioned, like the classics, which may qualify, which may, we may be allowing. So this would be our first round going through library materials, specifically looking to see if they meet these qualifications. So I do think some of the more graphic stuff is going to be pulled out by the filters we have, but classic materials that you see in Shakespeare, some of those areas, they may not be pulled out by those particular programs. Okay. The only real point I'm trying to make is that it is not unreasonable to apply limits, and there are places where we have already chosen as an organization to apply limits. And I don't think it's unreasonable in this case, and in fact, we've set the bar rather high, I think, on what those limits should be as re with respect to what the taxpayer provides to minors uh, in Virginia Beach Public School Libraries. I'll ask you one more thing, because uh, somebody answered for you a moment ago. Uh, we were talking a, a, little bit, a little bit about whether there's a risk to be sued. Even for the sake of this question, we can call that risk high. Based on that, is it your legal recommendation that we don't pass this policy? What I'm sorry, going to tell you, when I, I know it's hard to, it's a hard question. I was asked, this policy was not something that I recommended brought to you or the school administration brought to you. It was brought to you by a school board member who wanted to see it. So I looked at it for legal okay. sufficiency. That is not the same thing as saying, is this a good idea? It's just, is there a way to implement this that we might pass it? Yes. Okay. Do, I, do I see risk of litigation? Yes. I, I can't say I don't. And I can't tell you it's one side that it could be both sides coming after us for this. Fair enough. So, but you're not making a, a legal recommendation one way or another on whether we should pass it. You're only discussing and pointing out that there is, there is risk of litigation. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Melnick. So I had a list of other things to say, but based on that, I'm asking for, I'm asking to have, I'm asking for you to strike this policy, to go back, to keep this in mind. Um, there are laws that protect library books. Um, we, we talk at great length about the recruitment and retention of teachers. Um, I worry about that. I wouldn't want to work for this division, just saying. If this is where we're going, no way. I worry about the recruitment of businesses. And, and quite frankly, there are, I'm not the only one that feels this way. I know that there are some members of our counterparts on the city side who are quite frankly afraid of the reputation of this city. I, I want no part of this. I, I, do, I want no part of this. Um, and this needs to be sent back. There needs to be uh, the policy needs to be parental controls. We're giving the power to the parents. 
Let them decide. And instead of sitting on this dais and reading the bad pages out of a book, like I did, wifey, back in, nine, in the 80s, um, use your voice, use your social media platform to share your opinion with your constituents and put the list of books out there that you think are inappropriate. And I, I've told the board this, and I'm going to tell the public this, and I hope my neighbor's listening. I walk my neighborhood and ride my bike every day, and every time I pass my neighbor's house, she yells out to me, don't you dare touch those books in the library. Because every book that person's telling my kid not to read is the book I want my kid to read. And I take that very seriously. Mr. Callan. I'm sorry, Ms. Martin, she took your name off first. You're first. I'm sorry, I, just a quick question maybe for administration here. Um, because we already have parents that are able to opt their child out of a book. Do we have any discipline regulations for when a child who is allowed access to a book shares it with a student who isn't allowed access to that book? No, we don't have any discipline regulations around that right now. Would we need to set something like that up? Uh, with I'm confident that, it's, as with any policy, there are always consequences we can't predict, and we would have to address those as they arise. Okay, thank you. Mr. Callan. Okay, I'm going to approach this not so much from a legal perspective as we've been discussing but maybe more from a sociological perspective. I'm almost 70, and I share that only to say I've been around. And I won't tell you this is an opinion that you need to have, but I will tell you that it is an opinion that I have and a perspective. The perspective that I have is that we are coarsening as a society. There are so many possible sources of why that's happening. The list is endless. But I believe part of what happens is the fact that we lower our guard. We lower our standards. We lower our perspective. We lower our examples of what's acceptable and what's not. I think, and this is going to sound antiquated and quaint, but I think what we're trying to do, especially for the kids in elementary school, is to lengthen the time that innocence is still a characteristic. That seems to be lessening, and I think, in my opinion, it's one of the reasons why, culturally, we're coarsening. I understand the challenges that surround legal issues in this effort. But when you hear read an example of what's available, it causes you to say, shouldn't we try to do something? Shouldn't we try to hold on to something in order to help lessen the degree to which we coarsen as a culture. That's the spirit behind the effort. It's not trying to strain out a sexually explicit gnat as much as it is just trying to preserve something that's important. What we do is preceded by how we think. 
And how we think is influenced by the things we listen to or read. An ancient writer gave us an example of a direction that you could point in relative to how to think well. He gave some examples. Whatsoever is true, it's right, it's pure, it's lovely, it's admirable, it's, exemplif it's exemplified, or it's excellent, and it's praiseworthy. Think about those things, and that'll help point you in the right direction. So I hope that we make an effort to try and find a way to arrive at a place where we capture what we're trying to capture here, while at the same time not creating a legal knot that ends up enslaving us. Just my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, please add Ms. Owens to the queue. Ms. Owens. Thank you. Um, I don't want to reiterate things that have already been said, um, but I, I do want to, I guess, point out that we passed new policy with, uh, I guess, similar definitions, as Ms. Manning uh, pointed out, uh, for instructional materials because the state required that we do so. Um, when the state made those decisions, they considered library materials. And there's a reason that they didn't put that requirement down on library materials as well. There's a reason that everything that could meet some kind of legal sufficiency doesn't make it a good idea. And I, I would be concerned that this policy puts our division in a position uh, where we're having to defend certain books over others when we're saying, well, the classics can stay. And so maybe somebody thinks that Oedipus is part of the coarsening and lowering our standards, but somebody else doesn't feel that way. And now we're in a position as a division where we have to defend the sexual themes in that book and say, well, it's okay because it was a, a, you know, a classic. We have policies in place that meet the needs for concerns. We have ways that parents can put limits for what their children read without impacting other parents' rights to have access to, to library books. Um, I agree with Ms. Melnick on this one. I don't think it needs to go back to policy review. I think we need to keep the policies that we have, make sure that parents are aware of the uh, steps that they can take. I know that my child's school sends the opt-out form. It's like a part of their monthly newsletter. That stuff is there and available. I've been invited to libraries. Parents are invited. I don't see a need for this. And so I will leave it there. Thank you. OK, thank you. Well, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm just wondering if are we going to strike this, or are we going to make the public wait another two weeks? And I look at our teachers who are out past their bedtime on a school night. So, I mean, I don't understand prolonging this for our community. This is, and we've already heard from our attorney. I just need some direction. Are you making a motion or Ms. Linetti, what do we need to do if she wants well, to make a motion? Well, your bylaws involving, I don't have my computer in front of me right now, but your bylaws involving amending policies or adopting policy, and this is gonna be an adoption of a policy, 
um, that you're going to have to follow those procedures on there, and that's a bylaw as opposed to um, looking at that. So how you present it, norm, your normal procedure is that you bring it to information, and then you move it to action. That is generally how you handle these issues. Um, it's, not, it's not clear that it doesn't, it, sorry, the action and consent, it doesn't automatically go to the next meeting, but usually you present it one time and then you come back at a subsequent meeting. So I think if you wanted to put it on for today, I think you're going to have to look at your bylaw, which I think is 132, uh, dealing with adoption of a, a policy and that you're going to have to probably have a supermajority to do that tonight. Otherwise, it would go to a subsequent meeting for some type of vote. This isn't policy. Madam Chair? No, it's, it's your bylaw on how you adopt, or it's not, it's not that this is a bylaw. This is when you adopt a, a policy procedure. We have to look at the bylaw. It talks about your procedure for adopting or amending or suspending bylaws. This is just up for information. This is a new, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a rewrite of an existing policy that's only up for information. That's why it's on information. We, what, but if you're asking to vote tonight, that's what I, is that the question, can you vote on it tonight or strike it? Or, or yeah, I guess your question is, what are you doing with it? Is it not coming forward? If you're asking to vote on it tonight, if you're asking that it go back to PRC or it not come forward, I think that you're going to have to make an right action on that. Strike it. Madam Chair? Yes, yeah. Uh, can I suggest that we just move, move on with our normal procedures, go on to our next um, topic and vote on this at the next meeting like we normally do? I have two different views here. Was there a motion? I don't, I don't Point of order, was not there a motion? Not a motion, but a second on the floor, so I'm not sure what you're doing. I never heard a motion. Your normal procedure would be, unless you say something else, it will go on to the next stage. If it's a bylaw, it goes to consent. If it's, um, I'm sorry, bylaw, it goes to action. If it is a, um, it's a policy, you're going to be looking at action or consent for the next meeting. So if you don't want it to go there, I think you do have to say something now. Okay. Wait. This is not a policy. There's already an existing policy. This, this is just something that a board member created that just came out of the policy committee and came to us for information. We send stuff back to the policy committee all the time. This is not an existing policy. It's a recommendation to amend policy 665, and so that, that is a recommendation on the floor that you have information. Normally what I would ask at this point, are we going, on, am I sending it to the ne another meeting, which could be a consent action item, or do we send it back to PRC? If you don't want it to go somewhere, then I guess we need to figure out what, what you want to have happen with that. Well, then may I suggest that it goes back to PRC and then they can strike it there? Because I just think this is just, you've spoken, you. You've spoken legal to all of us, and to do this to the public for another two weeks is, is really very unfair. Question it really what, is. What do you want to do with this policy amendment recommendation from PRC? You presented it on information. If you don't take an action now, we would just follow our normal procedure. Last time we saw this, you sent it back to PRC. You voted to send it back to PRC. Are we putting this forward, or are you sending it back to PRC? If you want to vote to kill it tonight, then I think you have to move it to action, and you're going to have to get a vote to move it to action. Otherwise, you just let it fall the normal course, which means it shows back up at another meeting. If you wanted to go back to for PRC for further consideration, I think you need to make a motion to go back to PRC. So we need, if we want, if we want to make a vote tonight, we make a motion? You have to make a motion. It has to be seconded. Okay. Point. And it has to, wait a minute. Point of order. Hold on. I, I just have a question. And it has to be a two, Point does it have to be a two-third bait? Two-thirds? It does not. No. It would take two-thirds. No, it's not. To, to change it tonight, to vote on it tonight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Point of inquiry. Um, Ms. Linetti. Yes, ma'am. Um, sorry. And I, I don't think it's two thirds, but how many votes would it require to move it? Wouldn't that be a suspension of our bylaws at this point? Yes, yeah, so I think you're going to be looking at your the seven on there. Um, well, seven of the people. Seven. Well, well, the problem is we got to pull the policy. It's the amount of people that are present at the meeting right now that determines. Normally, we would say seven, but it will be the amount of people that are plus, half plus one of the people present at right. the meeting. Right. And I'm not quite sure who's online at the moment. 
majority plus one. Is that, is that what you're saying? Again, I'm going to have to go look at the policy, but normally if you suspend the policy, which is on amend me, amending a if you spend the bylaw, which is amending a policy, or thank you. <laughs> That's what I, I vote for adoption, amendment, or repeal. Sorry, this is 132. A, do, a vote for adoption, amendment, or repeal shall take place at a subsequent meeting of the school board. A majority vote of the school board members' present meeting will be needed to adopt, amend a policy. And then uh, may adopt, amend, or repeal a policy at the same meeting when first presented if there is an affirmative vote of seven school board members. If there are 11 school board members present, at the meeting or affirmative vote of majority plus one. So you got it. What if there's not 11? Then I think that is if there are 11 members present or an affirmative vote of a majority plus one. But it, all right, let me read this again because I'm concerned about your notice provision. The school board may adopt, amend, or repeal a policy at the same meeting when first presented. So that's uh, if there is an affirmative vote of seven of the school board members, if there are 11 present at the meeting, or an affirmative vote of majority plus one. So you need majority plus one. We'd have to determine right now who, who's, how many people are here at the meeting because you have to count your online speaker or your online school board members plus one. Now, if you wanted to suspend it, which gets a little more tricky, policies may be suspended in whole or part by the school board. Um, sorry, we're not sorry, that's not gonna apply. This is not a policy under the circumstances. This is your bylaw 132, and this is what I'm trying to get clear. 132 is adoption, amendment, or repeal. And so I think you're in a situation, if you're going to take, what you're going to be suspending would be a vote for adoption, amendment or repeal shall take place at a subsequent meeting of the school board. So you presented once on there. A majority of the school board members present the meeting will be needed for adoption, amendment, or repeal. So you presenting it now, you need to come to another meeting to be able to vote on it. So I think if you want to suspend that procedure, then you've got to go to the C3, which is school board may adopt amendment or repeal at the same meeting when first presented. So we do that if an affirmative vote of seven members, if there are 11 here, so that wouldn't apply, or an affirmative vote of majority plus one. You've had 10 earlier in the meeting, so that would be six on there, but I don't know how many are online right now. Uh, right now we do have Carolyn Weems and Jessica Owens online, so there are two school board members online. Do you want to? I'll, I'll do whatever I need to do. Just we just we've heard from our attorney tonight, so I guess based on that, I move that we that we strike this policy, that we don't let it go forward any anymore. We just strike this policy. And do I need it a second? Second. Are you, no, okay. I don't think so. The strike meaning you don't do anything further with the, with it, as opposed to voting yes or no to approve the policy today. So okay, so I, I mean, just by strike, I'm just, that, is it by strike, because that's not a procedure we have written into our bylaws. Strike, do you mean stop consideration, don't do anything more with it, as opposed to let's just go ahead and vote on it tonight. Strike just means you vote, we don't do anything else with this policy right now. Right but now, our the procedure to, good. To, to, we'd have to move it to action, which it, suspends our bylaws, and we have to go through multiple votes. I'm just asking to, my motion is just to, just, just to get rid of this policy period based on your legal opinion. I'll be, a, and honestly, I think the way I'm reading the bylaw is that your choice, again, strike is not a procedure we have written into our bylaws. Um, I think it is you want to adopt, amend, or repeal at the same meeting. So I think your act, the bylaw would say you need to vote on this tonight. Uh, you either want to adopt, or in this case, amend uh, this policy tonight. So I actually think the motion should be to move it to them. Otherwise, you're creating a, you're suspending the bylaw and you're just creating a new motion that we haven't had before. Even though it's not an existing policy, it's just, it's just in the cloud right now. 665 is a policy, you're amending it. Yes, but the, those words are not the policy. There's already an existing policy. Correct. I, I don't know what to say. If you, let's say this was on action or consent next week. If you, let's say you probably would put this one on action because you would want it separate from the consent. If you put it on consent and said, we looked at all these changes, we don't want this. It would return to the black lettering that you see in the policy. That would how it would remain. 
that we would just wouldn't adopt it, so we'd go back to the language before we made this proposal. So that's what would happen if you did it that way. It would just remain the way it is currently. With the, with the knowledge that we have procedures in place for parents, correct? correct? You have multiple other procedures that can address the same thing, but if you were not to approve this, you're gonna go back to the lettering that you see in A, up here in the language, and a little bit more comes further down in the policy, but basically A is what's going to remain in the policy. It'll just stay the way it is currently. Right, so that's what you want to do. Madam Chair? Yes. Um, can I make a suggestion? I, I think we have two options here. Someone needs to make a motion to move this to action, vote on it tonight, or we just need to move forward and have it on action at next week. That's what I'm trying to tell her to do. Do you want to make a motion to put it on action tonight? Wait, we do have a motion do, on yeah. the floor. We have it on the second. Motion to strike, and I'll be quite honest. I that was really to strike it. Means. And okay. I don't really Is she understand. withdrawing that? I'll withdraw that. Okay, I agree. So do we have a motion for anything? You withdrew it. Do you have a motion for anything else? Do you want to move it to action and vote on it tonight? While we're waiting for that, may I ask one more question about this? Yes. And I think this is for administration. Oh, why? Um, as noted in here, Ms. Brown suggested that we might change, I believe it was um, 2A to, instead of saying, yeah. have it ready by, uh, go into effect instead of beginning in the fall that that she suggested that we change that to january of 2024 no yeah is that right yeah that's correct um would we will be can we guarantee that we'll be ready by then with all the things that have to happen with um i mean there's a lot of training that has to happen for our librarians there's a lot of um checklists that have to be developed by administration so that, um, you know, all, basically, can we be ready by January or do you feel that January is not, we're not sure? So when I rec recognized after agenda planning that the item was gonna move from in, uh, action, which is where I thought it was gonna go, because normally you go information to action, that it was gonna go back to information, I recognized that would mean it would go to action June the 12th. Our library media specialist last day is June the 16th, so there'd be no possible way that they could implement any of the necessary changes that will occur in regulations based upon changes in policies in four days. And so I made a suggestion to the PRC committee, a consideration um, that we push the date back. Um, I used references that the state has used before with implementation dates. They normally will implement things at the beginning of July or at the 1st of January. So I recommended the 1st of January. It also made it a, a kind of a natural break with a holiday. To your question, um, I do know that uh, uh, Dr. Rogers and Ms. Linetti have talked about some of the required changes that will be, that are gonna be required as a result of anything that changes out of this policy. Um, so I think it remains to be seen if we could do that, you would you would think that with three months, we'd have a good shot at it. But uh, you know, there's a lot of training that has to take place. There are a lot of a lot of uh, questions that have to be developed on making sure that uh, uh, if a book is found uh, eligible for whatever at one school, that it's the same criteria is used in the second uh, across the system across the division. Um, there is just a lot. 
as I said before, this policy is not ready. And if we're going to vote on it next week, you know, we vote on it next, or not next week, on June 12th. Okay, so we're going to vote on it one way or the other. Uh, but my personal opinion is we're, we're not ready. And the timelines involved in here are absolutely not attainable. So. Okay, so I'm going to stop this conversation. We are going to bring this back Correct. to action at the next meeting. Fine. Do okay? you want us to add, and I know you're not considering, but do you want us to go ahead and add that date? And I think that's an agreement. At least move it to January to consider, because obviously there's no way. No, I'm sorry. Ms. Melnick is saying no. Just bring it back the way it is. Bring it back the way, please bring it back the way it is. I, I, I Wait a minute. I, I haven't asked we, anybody to speak. You want to get in the in the thing? Miss Manning, are you good? Okay. Miss Brown or Miss Melnick first, and then Miss Brown. Miss Brown. I am happy to. Um, make a substitute motion at our next meeting to change that date. Thank you. Okay. We're good? So All right. It we're will moving return it. looking like this next time, and then you can make the appropriate actions then. Yep. Yes, you can make the appropriate action then at the next meeting. All right. Let us move on then to policy 736. There we go. 736 is under our community relations section. Again, as I've mentioned before, we've been going through our remaining policies to make sure we, and regulations see what needed to be updated. This is one of the ones we have not looked at since 2014. This is listing funds or sales. After reviewing this, the policy review committee has no recommended changes. We just did our necessary five-year review for this. Are there any questions on 736? Hearing no questions on 736, we are bringing back 745 rec recognition of students by staff by the school board. This came back, uh, PRC has looked at this before, but Mrs. Brown has asked us to bring it back. And her, she'd like to suggest, and the policy review committee did bring this forward, under section A, which is recognition criteria. And again, this policy is recognition of students and staff by the school board. A6 would read, upon the request of three or more school board members, the school board may recognize extraordinary BBCPS student achievements in athletics not sponsored by the school division. And that would be the recommended change to this policy. Are there any questions or discussions? Okay, I have uh, Dr. Spence wants to speak to this first. So I apologize, um, Ms. Brown, for the late ask on this, but um, I was kind of looking this over again over the weekend, and it occurred to me the way it's ordered is going to create a little bit of a, a little bit of confusion for us, and so um, a request. Can we take that out of six under recognition criteria and just move it up after the second paragraph where it says, honors for consideration should be school division or educational base or directly related to their role as a student or staff member within the school division upon the request of three or more school board members the school board may recognize extraordinary student achievements not sponsored by the school division. It just clarifies it there versus under the criteria because otherwise they're separated. Um, I'm fine with that. I just had gone with Ms. Lenani's um, draft language. Yeah, so the draft language is fine. I'm just talking about where it's ordered. I also would at least ask in the spirit of it that it, it includes not just athletics but also other activities. If, it, if you're going to do it, you know, because this is about activities and athletics, the, the entire policy itself. And I'd also ask that you consider um, adding staff to that bit of the policy as well, because there have been a number of occasions in my superintendent's report tonight, we, it was an example of one where a staff member um, did something that's not necessarily would fall under the normal category. And so we didn't move it into recognition. It was the gentleman who's working on the flags down at the oceanfront. But there may be a case to be made that he would be a good person to bring in for a recognition, and but that would not wouldn't generally fall under these criteria. But if you added it to that language there, I think we could provide. So I personally that. have um, no problem with that, except for um, in conversation with legal, um, she had recommended that I keep it to athletics, um, so that there would not be any. Um, 
potential issues in the future, um, and maybe she can speak yes, to that. Yes, and, and my concern in this area, athletics seem to me a narrower area. My concern would be activities, do we have some criteria? In the example I gave it at PRC, if somebody said, I'm the national naked skydiving champion, is that gonna be a concern for us on there? You can think of more radical examples on there where it might be a topic that might be fairly controversial. Do we have enough issues in place? Now, part of what we talked about was that you've got the three or more school board members would have to come forward and make that determination. But if the three or school board members appreciate that controversial issue and they're willing to bring it forward as an activity that may, you know, you're going to have to just deal with the consequences. I don't know that we have a lot of criteria that would prevent it. And the problem's going to be, we let one group in that has their award, do we let another group in? Um, I th when I talked to Ms. Brown, that was my concern. I thought with athletics would be easier to define whether athletics, whereas activity could be just about anything. So I had a little bit of concern about whether we had enough parameters in place. So when Ms. Brown suggested could we limit it to just athletics, I felt a bit more comfortable with that. I am a little concerned with activities that we may not have sufficient parameters around it. The catch all for that would be three come forward, they get to put it on the agenda, the rest of you are going to have to say, hmm, that's not, that may be a problem for us. And then if you let one in, you need to know that another group has something also controversial. What is your criteria for keeping them out? I'm just not sure you have enough here, but if you're willing to accept that risk, you just know that that was a concern. I felt there was less risk with athletics, I thought it was a more defined area. Well, I'm okay, I'm good with that. I'd still like to, as far as my, my concerns, I'm, I'm good with that, although I, I don't think that athletics is as narrowly confined as you're saying, because there's a lot of people who participate in a lot of things. I mean, paintball, how, how do you hold that out as non-athletic? So I, I guess it's... My concern you know, would be I got this national, uh, perhaps a religious award on there. Not that there's anything wrong with the religious award, but now we're recognizing religious awards on there. You know, are we going to have a limit on the religious awards? We are conduct that made That was my concern. I agree. That part's challenging. But anyway, could we could we at least move it up in the order so it's connected to the second paragraph? I don't think that significant. Doesn't change anything. In yeah, I I don't mind that, and um, I also don't mind sub, um, making a motion to substitute to add staff for those same athletic accomplishments. Miss Anderson. So does this open us up for um, we would have to um, allow the state soccer? Champions of um, Rush, for example, uh, U8, U7s, um, U14s, U15s, uh, the state baseball champions for Little League, the state basketball champions for uh, clubs, the state wrestling champion for, we have several wrestling clubs around the city, um, basketball clubs, karate winners, um, Anything that's athletic really related that's this this opens us up and so this means we have to accept all of them who if we get three school board members who decide okay well we did the baseball let's do the soccer and you know how many soccer teams there are in Virginia Beach that are not part of our school division I, I would venture to say there's probably at least more than 50 um, I, Little League just because they go to um, Pennsylvania, uh, the twelve-year-olds who get to go to Pennsylvania to this the uh, the little league special place, and I'm not sure what that's called. Miss Melnick might remember, but you know this opens us up for a lot of recognitions. We we could possibly have an hour's worth of recognitions before our meeting can begin, before our speakers can speak. <laughs> so um, I just. I'm not in favor of this because of the fact that, um, I, and I understand. I understand that you know there are pe there are kids who work really really hard and deserve to be recognized for their achievements, but that's what trophies are for. That's what you know. That's what the newspaper is for. And city council actually recognizes uh, Eagle Scouts for Boy Scouts, for example. Um, so I, I'm just, I just feel like this is opening us up for um, a lot of recognitions that we honestly, they're not affiliated with our school system. So I, 
we already recognize all the things that we do before our meetings, and I don't think this is, this is a good idea to start this, opening up this can of worms for uh, activities or athletics that are not part of our school division. Ms. Manning. Yes, so I don't look at this as opening a can of worms. I look at it as an opportunity to recognize extraordinary achievement. And um, we have the ability here to control it because it requires three school board members. Um, I, I truly don't believe that it will be abused if three school board members have to um, sign on to it. So um, I support this policy. Ms. Brown. Okay, so I just wanted um, to speak a little bit about how this came about. Um, I had emailed our chief communications officer with um, a handful of VBCPS students deserving of recognition for passing senior level figure skating tests. That is the highest level of a nationally recognized Olympic governing body that makes that determination for passing. Um, otherwise, they would have met the recognition criteria, but they chose to go a different path for their athletic venture than one through the division. Um, Ms. Allen said she would get on the agenda. However, Dr. Spence felt it didn't meet the criteria and said that we would need to change policy in order to recognize them. I did reach out to a few members of city council and ask them how they do their recognitions. They do their recognitions by recommendation of one city council member. Um, so I'm not so sure I believe that there'll be a can of worms and um, you know, none, no policies are really permanent. You know, if you find that something had unintended consequences, it would be reasonable to address those unintended consequences. So, um, you know, I would most certainly be willing to deal with those if those came about um, every meeting, we recognize a number of students for various accomplishments. I believe those accomplishments embody the type of dedication, responsibility, commitment, perseverance, accountability, and teamwork skills. Our division should absolutely be encouraging, recognizing in our students. Um, our students that go a different path deserve that opportunity. Um, and on a Interesting note, the policy is titled Recognitions of Students and Staff by the School Board. Um, I find it interesting that the school board cannot recommend students for recognition with a policy titled Recognition by the School Board. Um, so, you know, a lot of people have dedicated eight to ten years of their childhood for some of these accomplishments. And I think that it would be fair that if we're going to recognize 100 students in one meeting that we can choose carefully as board members who we're going to sponsor for recognition. And so um, I came up with three with Ms. Linetti because I thought that that gave us the opportunity to make sure that it was a worthy cause. Thank you. Ms. Melnick. So I'm all about recognition. I am. But, I, I, and I wouldn't call it a can of worms. I would call it where does it end? So, I mean, I can go through the list of my kids' accomplishments right here and tell you everything that they were not recognized for, and they were VBCPS students, each of them, for 12 years. My daughter went to the governor's school. My son was on, both of my boys were on baseball teams that won state championships. It just, it's never going to end. And we got an email tonight from a parent who said, well, my son um, has done karate for X number of years. There are thousands of kids in the city of Virginia Beach that do karate that go to our schools, that, become, that earn, earn black belts. Um, it, it's just one of those things that will never have an end. And so to put it in policy and then be willing to change that policy if we get into a, into a bit of a trouble, 
that sends a worse message to parents like, oh, hey, we were willing to listen, but, you know, now, gosh, you know, we're recognizing 16 other things on top of the things that we were already recognizing. And like was mentioned, we could be here an hour, and I'm all for recognizing. I really am, but it has to happen. We, we, can, we don't have the capacity to recognize every student for everything that they do. And I understand my boys have played baseball since they were four. And one just finished, you know, at the collegiate level at 23 with no recognition. I'm just saying it, it's never going to end. And then I ask you just to remember what Mrs. Linetti said, which is it, it only takes three board members, but we could be having to recognize things that might make some of you uncomfortable and just remember that and then it's going to be in policy and then you have to go back and try to fix it so um having three people is nothing i have two other friends on here that i can just say hey i need you guys to support me on this one just throwing it out there okay i'm next in the uh, and i just want to mention um i think this is this has been going on for we we've, we've had awards and recognitions for many 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 years and there had to be some kind of um, stipulations and parameters put around this because they have experienced in the past the many recognitions. Think about tonight. Look at the many students that lined up just for the music. If we start recognizing, and who's to say, oh, okay, so we recognize this group, but these three members aren't going to say, let's recognize the next. You think you're getting emails now? Mm -hmm. You wait. Because someone's going to say, really? You recognized the, the skydiving people last week, but you're not going to recognize these children that played in this soccer tournament that were so good? And think about how many are in on these, these um, teams. I'm, I'm not looking at an hour of awards a night. I'm looking at many. There'll be a lot more than an hour. So I think it's something, I mean, there is definitely recognition for things these kids have done. And many of them have put their, their, their whole elementary, middle school, and high school lives toward some kind of skill. And they will be recognized, but I don't think it's, the place to be recognized through the school system unless it's affiliated with the actual school system, an event with the school system. And that's my thoughts. There's a reason for parameters and why we've had this policy. Ms. Martin. You know, perhaps a, a compromise or solution to this is that these um, requests come in for athletics and academics not sponsored by the school division and rather than being read out and taking up time from public comment we just put them on a website so they can grab a link for their scholarship application or their college essay um, so parents could submit you know these recognitions three board members approve and it goes on this list and they have a hyperlink that they can use in their college applications I mean just an idea it saves time still recognize some of these students achievements you're going to need a procedure for that to act on it, and three of you together, you're going to have to create a committee or some way to act on it to do that. So we'd have to think through that procedure. It would be a committee or sign it to one of your existing committees that they would approve these. So that's the only way you're going to be able to officially act on that. You're going to have to the school board designate to. Not impossible, just a couple of procedures we've got to go through. Okay, well then with that in mind, I mean, our time is already tight. Um, we have a lot of business to do. We are often late at night in closed session. Um, so barring any procedural commitment, I'm not sure this is a good idea, just in the interest of time. So, say that again one more time. You're not what? I mean, i just not interested in approving this policy in the interest of time. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. We're going to move on to the next Policy. Almost done. One more policy again, section seven, committee relations, relations with non governmental organizations, parochial and private schools. We have reviewed this again, looking at our five year review, we do not recommend any changes at this time, but it does need to be reviewed by the school board, so we're recommending no changes. 
That would be the end of the policy review committee recommendations unless there's discussions on this policy. All right, hearing no discussions on this policy, you are not quite done with me. We do have the internal audit charter. As I mentioned earlier, we were looking at the policy having to do with the auditor's change. For those not familiar with it, after um, in the late 90s, 1996, you created a internal audit position. What created that was your internal audit charter. So this defines how the school board and the internal auditor will conduct their business. Currently, Mrs. Melnick is the chair of this committee, so this is what guides her in running the business with, uh, of the audit committee. We have to make some changes because we changed the policy. Again, the changes in here are not significant, and I apologize, we did not catch until today that the red line version was not online. We did pop that up there at your seat. You will see them. The changes, as I mentioned earlier, are primarily in the name from the Office of Internal Audit to the Department of Internal Audit. The school board, internal auditors, the name on there, and there are one or two corrected um, changes on there and Scrivener's changes, but there are no significant other changes in this other than to correct this document. Also referring to my office, which of course is the outside attorney's office and the, de and the um, Department of Legal Services, but most of the changes here are the change from the Department of Internal Audit. We're just moving to correct this to make sure it is consistent in there. There is a section under personnel. We updated what the current requirements are under master's and bachelor's degree. That comes on page nine of 10. Other than that, there are no significant changes. This did go through the um, audit committee at its last meeting as recommendation. It is consistent with the policy that we just discussed earlier, the 396. And the recommendation is to approve these policies. Again, because this is your charter, it has to come before the school board to make these changes. With hearing no questions on that, that would be the last thing I have to talk to you about right now. Okay, we're going to move to C, Textbook Adoption, Math and Science Academy, Chemistry. Welcome. Hi, good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Briggs, Vice Chair Weems, members of the school board, and Dr. Spence. I am here this evening to provide you with information regarding the Textbook Adoption Committee selection for a secondary science course at the Math and Science Academy. The textbook recommended for consideration is scheduled for implementation in the fall of 2023. Before presenting our recommendation, I would like to thank Mike King, Math and Science Academy coordinator and committee members for dedicating their time and efforts in choosing the best textbook for our students. Before we discuss the recommendation, I would like to briefly review the textbook adoption process, which is modeled after the Virginia Department of Education's textbook procurement process. The first step in the process is to research open education resources, otherwise known as OERs, to see if there are any out there for use, and if so, if they are aligned to the standards, comprehensive enough to serve as a primary resource and of high quality. We also research what other school divisions across the state are using as part of this initial step. If a suitable OER is found and the committee agrees that this is the best resource for the course, the text is put out for public and teacher review and then brought before the school board for approval. If a suitable OER is not found, the committee proceeds with the RFP or request for proposal or bid for textbook from traditional textbook companies if the cost is over 50,000. The top two choices are put out for public and teacher review and then brought before the school board for approval. As I said, the first step in textbook adoption process is always to do a thorough search of the OERs. In this case, there were not any OERs found which provide extensive high quality content that aligns with the Math and Science Academy chemistry curriculum. In addition, the online digital resources provided by the recommended text added benefits such as enrichment and extension activities that are offered as part of the textbook package by the publishers and other interactive components that enhance learning for students based on the committee review, the following textbook recommended for MSA chemistry. The committee has selected Cengage General Chemistry by Ebbing and Gammon with OWL, which is online web learning, access for each student, the instructor's site, and Cengage Testing Bank. 
The book was selected for the following reasons. Provide support for active learning with collaborative work in every unit, connects chemistry to world world, world world, provides the rigor for the upper level MSA classes. It is a book that will prepare the students with a solid foundation for the AP chemistry, provides online resources for students with eBooks and OWL at no additional cost. According to one reviewer, the book seems to have a more rigorous tone and addresses the chemistry and makes it relevant to real world. Another reviewer commented that the book is a seamless transition to AP level coursework. The total cost of this textbook for 130 students enrolled in MSA chemistry is $27,406.78 for six years. The total cost for this adoption of MSA chemistry will be $27,406.78 for the first year and no cost for the next five years. Thank you for your consideration of the committee's recommendation. We will join you again on June 12th when this book will be on the consent agenda. I have with me this evening Mike King, the Math and Science Academy coordinator, and we welcome any questions that you may have. Any questions? I was just doing the math. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Uh, well, do you want to say that? Uh, she was just doing the math. It was thirty-five dollars student for the next six years. Is that what you're saying? So we have one hundred and thirty students a year, times six. Divided by, you know, the yes, 27,406.78 divided by 780. Yes, ma'am. Yes. That's, it's, that's a deal. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. So our next uh, item on the agenda is um, the resolution affirmation of commitment to non-discrimination and anti-harassment of LGBTQ plus youth and adults in the VBCPS educational environment. Our presenter tonight will be Jessica Owens, our school board member. Ms. Owens. Thank you. Um, so you all have received the edited version that was initially presented last meeting. Uh, I can take a, a moment and read through it for those at home who maybe aren't following along. Um, so, whereas the school board and Virginia Beach City Public Schools, here and after VBCPS, believe that every student is entitled to an education that is responsive to the student's unique needs to work toward reaching their full potential, and that all individuals have the right to a safe physical, emotional, and social environment where responsibility and respect are demonstrated daily and where students are engaged in learning as active participants in the educational environment because they feel accepted and valued. And whereas LGBTQ plus youth and adults are valued members of the VBCPS community, and whereas VBCPS acknowledges that LGBTQ plus youth and adults encounter many challenges both in and out of the educational environment and that those challenges can often interfere with their access to educational services and programs. And whereas VBCPS further acknowledges that federal and state law regulation and guidance regarding non-discrimination and anti-harassment based on sex sexual orientation and gender identity are rapidly changing and at times inconsistent. And whereas in 2016, the school board amended school board policies 4-4 and 5-7 to prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. And whereas in 2020, the Virginia General Assembly amended the Virginia Human Rights Act at 2.2-3900 to prohibit discrimination based on sex, sexual orientation, and gender identity. And whereas the school board amended its policies and regulations regarding sexual harassment and discrimination in violation 
uh, of Title IX of the Education Act and adopted enhanced uh, Title IX procedures as required by federal law and regulation. And whereas existing state and federal statutory uh, and case law affirms the rights of both parents and guardians and students on issues of privacy and the right to freedom from discrimination uh, under Title IX and Title XII and the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. And now therefore be it resolved that the school board values, supports, and affirms the dignity of each of our students and staff and will continue to further our efforts to create a welcoming, safe, and inclusive learning environment, providing protections for all students and staff, regardless of sex, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, or any other characteristic protected by state or federal law. And be it further resolved, VBCPS is committed to eliminating all forms of unlawful discrimination and harassment in the educational environment Accordingly, no student shall be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to unlawful discrimination under any VBCPS education program or non-athletic activity based on sex, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, or any other characteristic protected by state or federal law regarding non-discrimination and anti-harassment, and be it further resolved that the school board will not adopt, amend, suspend, or repeal its bylaws or policies, and the school administration will not adopt, amend, suspend, or repeal its regulations to violate the Virginia Human Rights Act 2.2-3900 as amended, uh, Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 and or Title XII of the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964 with regard to discrimination and harassment based on sex, sexual orientation, or gender identity, and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board. And then it has the uh, adoption date. I was hoping to obviously be able to present uh, the resolution in person, but I had a, a family situation with my uh, husband medically, so uh, unfortunately I'm presenting virtually, but since this is something that was already introduced uh, and had a lot of feedback, and so I considered that feedback in making the resolution more specific um, and bringing it back to the board for consideration and for action uh, at the next meeting. And so there were considerable changes and so it, it does seem appropriate for it to be back on information uh, today with those changes. Thank you, Ms. Owens. Thank you. Do we have any questions that anybody wants to ask? Okay. Okay, Ms. Anderson. Just, uh, just a minor correction. I believe it, it's, it's not Title 12, it's Title 7 of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that's re, that it's referred to in here. So, um, that uh, be uh, yeah. Title 7. Thank you. Thank you. On the left, where it says Title 7. Let me pull it up. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, yeah it's, it's written correctly, but she just read it. Yeah, no, I read it wrong. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. So this will be brought on for infamy, I mean, excuse me, action at the next meeting. Okay? Correct. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, we're going to move on to, uh, we're going to return to the public comments and Miss. um, Tony Otto, our clerk, will continue with our next speakers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Our next speakers will be Amy Solares, Diana Howard, and Katherine Taylor.
Welcome. Hi. Ms. Owens' use of scare tactics and lies about the library media by, uh, bylaw is reckless and irresponsible. The bylaw merely gives parents the rights back to their own children when it comes to exposing them to mater uh, material deemed explicit by the parents. There's no censoring, there's no removing books, there's no librarians reading everything. I find it necessary to remind Ms. Owens, Ms. Anderson, and everyone else up there that you do not co-parent our children with us. We make these decisions and this will only help us. I also find it interesting that, as Mr. Culpepper discovered, the Chromebooks have filters on them, yet the libraries, everybody's fighting against that. Support the library, uh, excuse me, the library media bylaw as it is. Ms. Owens' transgender resolution is nothing more than feel-good action. What this board should be concerned about is enforcing the existing rules or changing regulations to be sure that students and faculty are held accountable for their actions. Unintended consequences. There are always going to be anti-Semitic and anti-Christian people out there, yet I don't see you putting any resolutions out for Jewish students or for students who are religious. There will always be teasing students because they wear glasses or have dyslexia or are overweight, yet there are no resolutions being put out for these students. This resolution not only takes away the rights of so many other students, even opening the door to assaults as we are seeing across the nation, but puts one group of students over the others. Oppose this redundant resolution, Virginia Beach City Public Schools already has a commitment to all the students. I also oppose a student on the school board. Regardless of whether or not the student has voting rights, this is a sloppy move, which will have unintended consequences again. Where's the parent rep? Where's the teacher rep? Where's the custodial rep? How about a librarian considering all this stuff going on? Children can't drive, they can't vote, they can't enter into contracts, they can't get tattoos. They are not in charge of their lives because they are minors. They are immature without any life experience. They are still growing and learning. Everybody has an opportunity, including students, to speak in front of you as I'm doing right now. 30 seconds. This is an elected body. No appointment should interfere with this. It is time to get this board's focus back to academics, retaining teachers, as Ms. Melnick mentioned earlier, and recruiting good teachers. Time to get back to work for the students. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diana Howard, Katherine Taylor, and then Kat Evans. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. I'm Diana Howard, and I don't support um, a student representative on school board, right? They weren't elected, you were, okay? So, like she said, why aren't you paying attention to parents and not children? They are children. They're still navigating their way through life. They haven't even decided what they're gonna wanna be. Boy, girl, none of the above. They should be learning and educating and making themselves um, productive members of society in the future. And let's see, on the other thing with the, a baby's butt is not sexual, a blowjob is. You should know the difference, okay? So I approve of the, the library thing. And we had, if there's no reason to change it because you already have the policy for parents to opt out, right? Then there's no reason to do the resolution either because you already have a non-discrimination policy. So, and parents do not know what to opt out of if they don't know what's in the library. You should run all those books through the Chrome thing. Our next speaker is Katherine Taylor, Kat Evans, and then Thomas Connett. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Katherine Taylor and I'm a librarian with the Virginia Beach City Public Schools. I love my job, love speaking with students every day about what they're reading and making recommendations about what they might read next. Before I order books, I read award lists, check reviews from multiple sources, and examine recommended grade levels. 
I look for books that I think will appeal to broad groups of students. It is important to me to create a well-balanced collection that will meet the needs of all and not just reflect a single point of view. My fear with the proposed library policy changes is that creating book lists will be the first step in censoring books and eliminating items from our school libraries. I worry that books that feature black characters, LGBT characters, or controversial events in history will be added to the list next and eventually removed. Well, what about parents' rights? Well, I do support every parent monitoring what their child is reading and talking to them about it. Through our Destiny catalog, every parent right now has the capability of looking up what books we have and what book their child has checked out of the library. Tell them to stop reading it if that, if that is the right choice for your child. However, a small group of parents or politicians should not have the right to speak for everyone in our community because they do not like a book or oppose a topic. By reading books such as The Diary of Anne Frank or To Kill a Mockingbird, books that would be affected by the proposed library policy change, children learn to think critically, to reflect, and to problem solve. They become caring, thoughtful people. They learn to imagine life from the point of view of somebody else. No book can be defined by a single sentence or a paragraph. If individuals take a short excerpt from a novel such as The Grapes of Wrath, take it out of context, and decide it should be flagged, students may miss the bigger lessons of loyalty and commitment to one another and the true meaning of family that are learned through that novel. If Hate You Give is listed, students may miss the bigger lessons of community, taking care of each other, and creating support systems. To maintain a literate society, learning through literature must continue. However, I already see the opposite happening. This topic and the proposed library policy changes have sparked fear in many teachers. As a result, independent reading time is disappearing. Students are missing out on opportunities to learn, even though we know in order to develop a reading habit in students, they must be given regular access to a wide range of high interest materials. So tonight I ask the school board, please do not adopt the proposed policy changes. Continue to give seconds. parents the rights to see what their child is reading and continue to give parents the right to restrict restrict their own child's access if they choose to do so. However, the school board must vote to protect the rights of the majority, knowing that keeping a wide variety of books available to for young readers will lead to a better, brighter future. School libraries must ever remain the home of free and inquiring minds. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kat Evans, then Thomas Conant, and then Vincent Smith. Welcome. And good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Dr. Spence, and the members of the board. Hi. My pronouns are she and he, and she, so she and her, and I'm a parent of a Virginia Beach City Public School student. I'm also a teacher. Many of the, my daughter's friends are also Virginia Beach City Public School students. Um, many of them are trans and non-binary. I myself identify as being LGBTQIA+, and students need to know that when they come to school, it's a safe place for them to be. Aren't we supposed to cherish and protect them? So if teachers are taught over and over again that building relationships and building a safe, caring, learning community is fundamental, how can students feel safe and cared for or even part of the class community when they cannot be accepted, cared for, or respected for who they are? They push for trauma-informed education, but why is there, that means our LGBTQIA plus students, trauma ignored? Please consider Ms. Owen's resolution. My child and her friends should feel safe, cared for, included, and most of all, respected in our schools. Thank you. Our next speaker is Thomas Conant, Vincent Smith, then William Mackowitz. Welcome. Good evening. I'm here to oppose bylaw 1-7 and to question the policy which gives student speakers priority in school board meetings. The proposed bylaw states, the school board believes the opinions and concerns of its students are important and should be incorporated into the board's consideration of matters affecting the school division. That's well and good. But what about the opinions and concerns of parents and grandparents of students, of taxpayers who don't have children yet subsidize the school's budgets, of teachers entrusted with classroom leadership? Are their concerns any less important why should students have more access to the board than any of these? And it looks like students' opinions are given priority over those of parents, teachers, and taxpayers who have greater life experience, broader education, and a financial stake in the success of the schools. This board has acted to prioritize students' opinions and concerns in very subtle but obvious ways. 
Giving student speakers priority at board meetings appears to say that the board values the thoughts of those who are less mature, more easily swayed than those who have the experience and education to better inform their input. Since September, a small sampling of students has had first place during public comments, all with largely the same content. At the last meeting, after 27 students got to speak, I was number 68 on the non-student list. If the board wants students to have real-world training experience, let them sign up to speak as everyone else does. First come, first serve. That's what life will be like when they graduate. Why give them head-of-the-line privilege? In addition, it's patently obvious that the student speakers are parroting the ideologies found in DEI, CRT, and the transsexual activism that have polluted the curricula of our system. So 27 speakers saying much the same thing get to speak before one individual gets to offer a differing opinion. It looks like a setup. I suggest that the board reevaluate putting student speakers first and let them sign up with everyone else. I also urge that you vote against bylaw 1-7 unless a parent, grandparent, teacher, and taxpayer rep is added to the list. The book of Proverbs was written to the naive and young to impart practical wisdom about complex issues of life from a parent's perspective. Our schools exist for much the same reason. Children need what adults know and can impart. If children are too immature to buy a firearm, drink alcohol, vote, sign a contract, or rent a car, how are they mature enough to advise the school board? Most children would rather eat ice cream and candy than healthy food. The same immaturity will affect their advice to the school board. Please do what you're elected to do and be the adults in the room. Thank you. Our next speaker is Vincent Smith, William Makowitz, and then Matthew Cody Connor. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. So uh, I'm gonna talk about three different things tonight. Um, your student representative proposal for the school board. Um, I oppose this on the face of it, but I can see the writing on the wall. So I'm gonna mention to you that any student can come in here and speak with preference. You put them to the front of the line. Um, I also propose that the student rep is not needed you're going to do this anyway, so I'm going to tell you you need to put three changes in here, and I'm going to give you one reason why this becomes legally insufficient. Uh, first, a uh, under B3E, uh, student who's removed from student representative is going to be restored at the end of disciplinary issues and their their punishment, so to speak. Um, so, a student who assaulted a teacher or sold drugs in a school, you want to allow them back into that position. I don't agree with that. Under D1, um, I think you need to impose some time constraints to how long the student representative is allowed to speak during these meetings. We don't need somebody droning on for a half an hour. Um, and I think you need to add a restriction that student representative shall not attend or be provided any information from closed executive or disciplinary sessions, which is allowed by Code of Virginia 22.186.1. I'm going to propose that this is legally insufficient because under C3, you're going to choose these student representatives through a lottery system. That is not allowed under Code of Virginia 22.186.1A, which says shall be appointed. Appointed is selection of a public officer by one authorized to do so, and I'm going to propose that nobody on this DIOS and nobody in school administration is authorized by the, by the citizens of Virginia Beach to operate a lottery. So moving on here to your uh, library policy issues, uh, I do propose these changes to 6.65. Um, as a parent, you know, you're talking about removing, what, 30, 40 books out of a, a selection of 10,000. You're not even going to notice it. It's a drop in the bucket. And as a parent, if I felt one of those books was absolutely imperative to my child's development, I'm going to go on Amazon and buy it. You're not talking about re removing books that cost more than five or 10 bucks. So, you know, if a parent thinks the kid needs it, go buy it, all right? Ms. Anderson, it's too much work. You were put up there to do this work. You were put up there to select staff who can complete this work. And if you think this is too much work, I propose you go down to Pongo and pick out some seconds. farmers. Farmers know how to get stuff done. Um, and, you know, a little common sense goes a long way. A very hungry caterpillar doesn't take a lot of time to, to review. Um, the uh, resolution that Mrs. Owens has proposed, I'm going to propose to you the myth of inclusion. Anytime you include with specificity, you're excluding another group. 
And I don't think that's what you're trying to do here, but I have experience with that because I've supervised a lot of people in my career. Um, I also say that this is an inefficient use of this body's time because that it's is redundant time. on many cases. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is William Makowitz, Matthew Cody Connor, and then Brenda Pence. Welcome. Thank you. Members of the board, uh, Ms. Owens' LGBTQ resolution is not needed. There's already school board policies in place to protect all students from discrimination. This resolution is simply an attempt to undermine the Virginia Board of Education 2022 model policies once they're finalized. My more immediate concern is the threat made in front of this board on May 9th by the Virginia Beach Democratic Committee's Vice Chair of Operations. She made clear her intent was to use a FOIA request to obtain the personal information of any parents against the LGBTQ resolution and to work to have them fired. Her exact quote was, if you're against this resolution, you're anti-diversity and pro-discrimination. This is a violation of Virginia law. Code of Virginia 18.2-186.4 provides penalties for any person who publishes another person's name along with identifying information with the intent to coerce intimidate or harass. Contacting someone's employer to try to get them fired is clearly intimidation and harassment. Last week, the attorney for this board, Ms. Linetti, released emails including personal information of Virginia Beach parents to this vice chair of the Virginia Beach Democrats. Despite requests to have the personal information redacted and knowing the malicious intent, this FOIA was, uh, the malicious intent of this FOIA was to threaten and intimidate families in Virginia Beach. I moved to Virginia Beach from the DC area in 1998. I never thought saying boys shouldn't be in girls sports or boys and girls locker rooms, showers and bathrooms with no questions asked isn't safe. Could get someone fired here. I know you can't control what a lone wolf far left activist says, but this threat to Virginia Beach parents' livelihoods was made by a committee member of the Democratic Party of Virginia Beach, and about half of you were endorsed by them. What I would like to see is the full board denounce these type of threats and intimidation against Virginia Beach families and work to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Thank you for your time and consideration. Our next speaker is Matthew Cody Connor, Brenda Pence, then Ginger Sherrick. Welcome. Thank you. There's no porn in our school libraries. Just books you might not want your kids to read. So do your job as a parent and don't let your kids read them. Let everybody else parent their own kids. You've heard us say that this uh, book policy is a solution looking for a problem. I want you to know what that means. This policy doesn't address concerns. It encourages and validates ignorance. And a vote in favor of it really only reveals your own. As for our other topic, the message of Ms. Owens' resolution is very easily understood. Virginia Beach schools will not discriminate against any student. The message you would send in voting against it would also be very easily understood. The headlines, and there will be headlines, will read, Virginia Beach school board members vote in favor of discrimination. Know that when you vote, you show us who you are. And as our future voters have pointed out, it will be remembered. I'm a father of kids in Virginia Beach schools. I'm a father of a trans child in Virginia Beach schools. And while so many people who do not even know her seem to be obsessed with her genitals, she's just a kid. And she's much more concerned with trying to make friends, playing video games, and how much she dislikes English class. Every day I send her out into a world where many do not understand her and where some, as you have seen in this very room, have absolutely no regard for her life. And I send her to Virginia Beach schools. What I need to know, what your students need to know, is are you going to make decisions to keep them safe? And not just the ones you understand, not just the ones that share your same beliefs, but all of them. And will they be safe to be themselves? 
or where you stir up fear and outrage against them, will they wander your halls hidden, isolated, and afraid? When I give you that most sacred trust of putting my child in your care, despite our differences, despite the politics and the rhetoric, can you look me in the eyes, one human being to another, and tell me that you will keep my child safe for me? 30 seconds. And if you cannot, you don't belong up there on that dais. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brenda Pence, then Ginger Sherrick, then Jill Blake. Welcome. Hi, I'm Jill Blake. I'm guessing the two people in front of me are left. Um, I'm, I'm skipping the prepared speech because I think most of it's been covered, and I suspect that most of you have already made up your mind about where you fall on the revised library policies. So I'd like to actually directly address a couple of the things that you said as you talked about it. Um, Mr. Callan, in reference to your coarsening comments, I understand what you're saying, but what you see as coarsening, some people see as evolution and progress. There was a time when rock and roll was gonna be the death of the American culture, and we've evolved on since then. And there are still rock and roll lyrics that I'm sure you could pick apart and pull out lines that would horrify you if you took them out of context. Which is what happens when you read a few sentences out of a book that are horrifying when you take them out of context. There's a reason that the state code on what's harmful to children says you have to consider the entire work and not just one or two passages. Those one or two passages are the reason librarians are so concerned about this policy. I understand that at no point am I expected to go through my entire existing collection and see what's already there. I get that. But it does say I'm expected to do that with new books. Well, how am I supposed to know if one or two passages exist in the middle of a 450-page book unless I go through all 450 pages? No matter what regulations you come up, what tests, what questions have to be answered, those are only going to be answered if I look at every word in the book. I guess if there's a sexually explicit passage on page 427, I can stop. But I'm going to have to go through the entire book to make that happen, no matter what procedures you come up with. Mr. Culpepper, your filtering analogy, I get what you were going for, right? That we already filter some content on the internet. Hi, I'm your filter for library books. I spent a year in graduate school doing it, and I've been doing it for 30 years. I'm your first filter. Does that mean I get everything that you would disapprove of? Probably not. Just like every filter fails, sometimes things get through. Sometimes good things don't and bad things do. We have policies to address it when that happens. I cannot tell you how deeply disappointed I was to hear Ms. Brown say that Dr. Spence said librarians didn't need to be a part of the discussion. I'm hoping that was a misunderstanding. 30 seconds. This is our profession. This is not just what we do. For some of us, this is who we are. So before you make decisions about that, please come talk to us. Please come see our process. Come watch how we filter that first round. Come see the selection tools we use. Come look at a collection analysis so you'll see what that tells us. Come learn our job before you make time. decisions about how to do it. Our next speaker is Jeannie Baker, then Kimberly Benzi, then David Cutchins. Hello, I'm Jeannie Baker, Policy 665, School Libraries. I hope that you vote for that. I prefer the material not be there at all. And if so, I prefer an opt-in as opposed to an opt-out. But I guess it's the best that we're gonna get. So I'm asking for yes. 
And Miss Melnick, when you said when you rode your bike and your neighbor waved and said, don't remove the books, I hope that you will vote how your constituents in your district want. 64% of the people voted for candidates that would not want this material in the schools. So please look at your whole district that you're representing. We still have a Virginia law <laughs> for parents' rights. We still have rights. The parents still have the rights. And let's see, there was a, I think a librarian from First Colonial. Um, here's a book in First Colonial High School. Very pretty cover. Um, the author is Hoover. There's five Hoover books that are questionable in First Colonial and several others. And let's see. This hand, he says, is the steadiest hand in all of Boston. He pushes on the back of my neck, bending me further over the counter. His hand meets the inside of my knee, and he glides it upward, slowly, Jesus. He pushes my legs apart, and then his fingers are inside me. I moaned and tried to find something to hold on to. That's not taking something out of context. Uh, let's see. When he was wiping cow shit on me, it was quite possibly the most turned on I've ever been. As I sit up here with one foot on either side of the ledge, 12 stories up, I can't help think about suicide. Okay, that's that one. I can't believe this one is still out there. Flamer, middle school, Brandon Middle School, five high schools, and I'm still kind of upset about this well, you can't just take a little bit and have it out of context. That's not... 30 seconds. My Lord. Okay, let's go to the... Have fun sucking each other's dicks, ladies. We're each busting a load into this bottle. If, if you don't come, you have to drink it. Homophobia still exists in many Boy Scout troops today because homophobia is nationally and internationally a systemic issue. Cartoon of a boy kneeling in front of another boy who's naked in the shower. So I would think that is pretty common. And that is time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kimberly Bensey, David Cutchins, and then Carol Kinsey. Kimberly Bensey. David Cutchins. Welcome. My name is David Cutchins. It was an important decision for my parents to give me that name when I was born almost 66 years ago. I've honored them by using it in every walk of my life, and like Mr. Callan, I've been around the block a few times. This has served me well throughout my lifetime. I'm here again to speak truth to you regarding the effort to keep in place the divisive and harmful gender, gender identity policies from the Northam administration. Let us be clear, we all care about the children. They do need our help, the benefit of adult wisdom that comes from experience. As the adults, we can and should work together to guide them. What we disagree on is how to help them find the grace and healing that they are so desperately in search of. Those who have seen the light of the world want everyone to find the same peace and joy and comfort that we have experienced in that light, the perfect assurance of knowing who made us and why we are here. In contrast, the darkness that covers these children causes them to see nothing but, quote, hate and fear, end quote, all around them, when in fact the opposite is true. We desire them to know the purposeful love of their creator. Encouraging them to pursue the darkness and requiring all of us to bow to the false ideology that we can choose our gender is wrong. God's word makes it clear that we all have two distinct choices as to what path to walk in our earthly lives. One choice brings the blessings of peace and fulfillment, the other choice results in despair and failure. Obedience and faithfulness to his instructions brings the blessings of abundant peace and joy with the knowledge that we are, we are loved by him. There's no greater knowledge and assurance than that. Disobedience to and refusal of his instructions brings failure and despair. Please do not continue to make leadership decisions that encourage these young people to make the wrong choice for their lives. 
do not continue to hide the light of the world from them. Let's lead them down the path that brings them light and peace, not push them further down into darkness and despair and alienation, hidden from their parents and their families. Allow the light back into the classroom and share living water with them rather than drown them in a well filled with toxic silt. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carol Kinsey, Homer Stinson Jr., and then Heidi Dragneth. Welcome. Good evening. <clears throat> I've spoken before you eight times in three years and as a stakeholder for, in the system for many varied reasons. This presentation has been the most difficult to craft, probably due to the multitude of topics on our plates and also not wanting to appear the slightest bit snarky, my word, nor condescending. So as, many, so as any seasoned special ed teacher, thankful for the system's training of simplifying and breaking it down, I start with point one. Please continue to recognize our students' and teachers' accomplishments, academic or athletic, system-wide and community-related. Councilwoman Sabrina Wooten, for example, recognized a Salem High School female entrepreneur at a recent city council meeting. She owns her own business, and she's a junior at Salem High. Point two. Please be mindful of the curriculum and books you are allowing in our system, embedding political and or perverse literature, as in the high school English textbooks some of you adopted. It's not healthy, it's not productive. I may be a great, great grandma, but I can identify pornography. Point three. Please allow our articulate students to respectfully express their opinions via email and at our meetings. Their opinions, as all opinions, should be heard and discussed, knowing that we don't hate each other, even though our views may not align. My suggestion is also that the student and the adult speakers be interspersed because both need to attend school and work an early, at in an early morning job each day. Finally, our mission, as was mine for 41 years in the system, was to give the students the optimal education. As a teacher, I would not even consider keeping secrets from my students' parents. We were all on the same team. Parents are entrusted with their children allow them to parent. Parents entrust their children to the teachers. Allow them to Three teach. seconds. Allow the teachers to teach them academics. Thank you. Our next speaker is Homer Stinson Jr., then Heidi Dragnev, then Lauren Siegel. Good evening. Welcome. I would strongly urge the members to support policy 6-65. I know it needs some work, but uh, I will say that despite all of the concerns about censorship and quote unquote too much work, that uh, the one question that was not answered or addressed was why should taxpayers pay for porn? Now what Ms. Manning wrote earlier, what she read to us, was not Oedipus, it was not baby butts, it was porn, and again, why are we paying for this? Now, I understand that there's people who are gonna be upset that this information isn't available in the school libraries. To them, I would suggest Barnes & Noble. Maybe shop online at Amazon or Goodreads. Those books are there. Those parents can certainly provide that to their children. Because one thing that this policy will not do, whether it's amended or not, is it will not prevent the sharing of pornographic materials between students, those whose parents permit, and those whose parents do not. Now, switching gears, uh, I'd like to go ahead and just briefly discuss that transition uh, or transgender resolution. Uh, I do appreciate the work that Ms. Owens did on that. I appreciate her rewording of that. But I still have some concerns. One of those is the quotation of the 2020 Virginia Human Rights Act, which quote, protect or prohibits discrimination based on sex, sexual orientation, and gender identity, unquote. However, if you'll take a look at this transgender symbol, one that you will often see at transgender events, you will notice that there are three symbols. 
attached to the circle. One is a male, one is a female, and one is, well, I don't know what the word would be, so I'll just use the word non-binary. Now, the question I would ask is why do we allow biological males in this non-binary non thing to go ahead and participate in female activities? And yet the biological males in this category are not permitted to participate. Why is that? They're both biological males. The only answer I can see is, well, gender identity. And supposedly this was going to go ahead and address that issue. Now, there are several references to Title IX. And uh, just briefly, in 79, it was put out there, the idea was to go ahead and offer equal opportunity, quote unquote, in male and female sports. Later on in 98, or 88 rather, Civil Rights Restoration Act said, hey, we'll expand that to include all activities. With that said, instead of pushing this resolution, maybe we should look at dividing into a third category. Let's have transgender activities. Let's have transgender rest and changing facilities. And that way, everybody can feel safe. Transgender, biological females, biological males. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Heidi Dragneff, Lauren Siegel, and then Laura Hughes. Welcome. Hello again. My name is Heidi Dragneff. My pronouns are she, her. I am a cisgendered straight woman. And that doesn't bother me. I don't know why it bothers anybody, but here we go. Um, first, I want to say that this is not a church. There should not be Bible verses being referenced in accordance to our school's policies or how we parent our own children. I grew up in the church. I know all about it. I have Bibles in my home. However, my children and I don't go to church any longer because of the hatred that we have seen over the last several years come out of people not being able to accept anybody different from them, living a life different from them. My 10-year-old came home from school a couple weeks ago and said she was afraid to die. And when I asked her why, she said because she thought she was gonna go to hell. She's never stepped foot in a church. She learned that from another child at school. My 13-year-old, who's in middle school, which that book belonged to that the, the lady read a few people ago. She is in advanced classes. She can read that and understand it and know whether or not it's appropriate for herself because she is mature enough. And I, as her parent, am the one that gets to decide that. We don't have money and manpower to go through all of these dang books. And if people want to know what their children are reading, then they need to be talking to their children letting them know what they feel is appropriate and isn't appropriate according to their ideals, not coming here and saying Bible verses and preaching at the rest of us because we don't all belong to the same religion and some of us know religion at all. All this is doing is creating more hate and vitriol towards teachers and teachers are quitting in droves because of it. And it's on purpose, we know why. It's so that we can funnel money to private schools with vouchers so that the for-profit private schools are banking off of government money coming from the people of small government. Sure are using their government positions to instill their church ideals. This money that is gonna be taken from public schools that they wanna put into private schools is gonna go to the kids that already go to those schools. Our kids aren't gonna get in. 30 seconds. These schools get to decide who they admit and who they don't. They don't abide by the same laws that public schools do. Public schools are more fair, not the best, but it's better than private schools where they can just pick and choose who they want to go. What happens to the rest of the kids? The kids with IEPs and 504s, the gay kids, the non-binary kids, the people don't follow norms or their church ideals and whatnot. And that is time. Our next speaker is Lauren Siegel, Lori Hughes, and then Gary Richards. Welcome. Good evening, Madam Chairwoman, members of the uh, board. I came a month ago for the first time and uh, I met you, so I will try 
to tell you what I've learned in the last month. I came with the understanding that it was a pretty complex issue, 665, the library policy, uh, innocuous on its face, and I thought it would be difficult to counter the various opinions. But I come tonight with a, uh, with a different agenda. I have both the age and the luxury of having been through a lot. I chair a very large not-for-profit based in Virginia Beach with hundreds of employees. I'm chairman of the board of a variety of private equity corporations. And my job really is to listen. It's your job. It's to gather the facts. It's to analyze the issues and to listen to the experts. And what I found in the approximate seven or eight hours that I've been sitting in your audience in the two meetings is every librarian, they're the media experts, not me, and probably not you, every single one of them has exactly the same thing to say. They think this is a bad idea. Now, they may have different reasons why they think it's a bad idea, but I listen to the experts, I gather my facts, I analyze, and then I come up with my own decision. Interestingly, right after the meeting, I pick up what I guess was maybe the Sunday Virginian pilot, and the lead editorial talks about this issue in Virginia Beach. Good literature challenges readers. It seeks to inform, enlighten. Sometimes it angers them. It comes up with real and imagined characters. But that's the heart of the problem. Singling out books for censure and removal is simply a bad idea. Efforts have been made over the years, this is all right out of the editorial, to ban certain controversial books from schools, never before have so few tried to take away so much from so many. This isn't about a broad spectrum of voices representing the larger community, but a small and incredibly vocal minority of people who want to impress their personal beliefs on other people's kids. Not my opinion, the opinion of a fairly well-respected and very old local newspaper that I grew up with and is still here. 30 seconds. Look, the state statue, which happened to have been sponsored by a Virginia Beach, Del a Virginia Beach senator, does not include libraries. Intentional. Education is the foundation of democracy. You need to protect and preserve it at all costs. Virginia Beach has a stellar reputation. Don't harm it. Do everything in your power to maintain an open educational system that benefits everybody. And that is time. Our next speaker is Laura Hughes, Gary Richards, and Beth Labar. Welcome. Thank you. Well, tonight has been surreal. <laughs> um, as to this library um, policy that we're looking at, we have people who feel there shouldn't be any sexual material in the libraries. I happen to be one of those people. There are people who feel like everything should be in there and people pick and choose. And we have people in between. Six or seven months ago, you had a resolution in front of you that said parents would just be able to look into a parent portal and if they didn't like what their children checked out, they could pull it out of their backpack and take it back to the school. Ten board members did not feel that that was worth conversation and didn't even want to discuss it. Seven of them still sit on this board. That actually would have covered a lot of this. Personally, I think they should all be out of the library. I was willing to settle for just give the parents a way to see what they checked out that day, and if you don't like it, take it back to the school. We wouldn't be having this conversation at all here right now. I would take issue with... Uh, claiming that libraries would need to shut down. And we had a librarian stand up here and, and say that she knows that that's not true. I've never walked into a library in primary school, college, grad school, or a public library where I wasn't able to get help from a librarian. They are, of course, professionals, and they know what's in their libraries. If there's something that shouldn't be in there, they don't have to read everything in there. They know it's there. Now, new things coming in, they may or may not be familiar with, and they may have to read that cover to cover, as she said, but they know what's in their libraries now. This is not censoring, this is not book burning. You can still go to bookstores, you can still go to a public library, you can go anywhere else, but just because things exist elsewhere doesn't mean they're necessarily appropriate in schools. 
We don't serve alcohol in schools either. We don't allow smoking in schools. There are many things we don't allow in schools. You can do them on your own time. You can do them elsewhere, but they're not age appropriate in school. One thing that I would, um, well, a couple of things I would take issue with here is Ms. Linetti did not say that you will be sued. She said you can be sued. You can be sued now. You can be sued with it. You can be sued without it. Anyone can bring suit against someone at any time. Doesn't mean it'll stand. Doesn't mean it'll go forward. There is nothing that makes you unsuable. That just doesn't happen. 30 seconds. And as Ms. Melnick pointed out, we have procedures in place. But if those procedures were specific enough, we wouldn't have this highly sexual material available to very young children. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gary Richards, Beth Labar, and then Don Labar. Welcome. Good evening. Time has come, the walrus said. Speak of many things. And one of the many things we're talking about tonight are books. Which books we include, which books we exclude. Because the truth of the matter is, based on community standards, we do exclude books. And if we uh, still have McGuppy's readers available to us, y'all would all recognize a tar baby when you saw one. And this is one. Big tar baby. Stay away from it. A few years ago, Mark Twain ran into trouble based on one word in a book, Huckleberry Finn. I bet you can't find that book in the library today. Now, he was one of the greatest American progressive thinkers. He was against the war in the Philippines and the annexation of Hawaii. He was against American capitalism long before any of us were born. A very progressive thinker. But he is not studied today. He's not recognized because of one word that he used to point out the color problem America had. We need to rethink all this stuff. The community standards are, for whether we like them or not, are kind of schizophrenic. Uh, the kinds of things I heard tonight, I would see in a penthouse forum magazine which I cannot buy at 7-Eleven any longer. So, I think the question shouldn't be, do we have the resources to get the materials out of the library? I think the question should have been, why are they in our libraries to begin with? Thank you. Our next speaker is Beth Labar, Don Labar, and then Erica Scoff. Beth Labar. Don Labar. Erica Scarf. Rich Pickens. Good evening. Uh, after you read about the book, welcome. Oh, yeah, after you read the, from the book, Victoria Manning, the suggestion was, why don't people talk to the librarians? So during the break, I actually walked out in the hallway to the librarians, and I said, I would love to have a conversation. I'm great at having conversations. They froze up, and they would not talk, and they said, no comment. And I was as nice as I could be. I do believe there needs to be more conversation. I would love to know. I asked the question, based on what you read in that book, would you consider that pornography? No comment. Uh, allowing students to speak ahead of other people is wrong. Uh, we need to uh, teach them about equal rights, not special rights. I agree with the other speakers. I hate being here this late. Maybe I'll need to sign up sooner next time. I remain grieved by the growing pornographic uh, materials in the schools. I showed the materials to my chief police officer, and I was told that I could be arrested if I showed the same materials to children. 
that the schools have a special exemption. The media won't show it on television because they said they're afraid of the legal challenges, but the schools have a special exemption. A Richmond politician wanted to discuss it with other political leaders. He went to printers in the area to ask them to print the materials. They refused. They said they could not print that kind of material. He had to put it on copy machines in that office. I've heard that directly and talked with them. And the reason is because it is illegal for everybody except the school has a special exemption. There's something wrong with that. I don't want an opt-out program. It's impossible for librarians. Think how impossible it is for parents. We can't figure out what's in those schools. We're, we're restricted. We can't even talk to the librarians. I want to remove pornographic materials from schools and such blatant things that you've read and that I've seen, there's just not even any doubt about it. If you can't see that, then you have no business being a leader in any capacity. Uh, parents and con citizens consider uh, the, their conversations with the school board private, and we do not appreciate our uh, information being given out with our names attached. I will give my Gmail to anybody, and what I write, I'm not afraid or ashamed of it, but I don't appreciate it. I think that was wrong. And finally, I think the resolution uh, should be uh, done away with. Uh, you're giving special rights, again, to a certain group of people with issues that really don't exist. And to me, one of the gentlemen spoke and said, my heart doesn't tell me, uh, it tells me, your heart should tell you the resolution should pass, but my heart does not tell me that. My heart tells me that you should pass on the resolution. And so uh, I don't appreciate the fact that certain people are made to wait all this time to get to speak. I'm so glad you didn't vote on the resolution because I thought, I'm not going to be able to share my opinion. And you guys are going to vote on it. And I'm glad it didn't go anyplace because I want to share what I think. I think you're off track. You need to get back to education, get off these sidebar issues, and get moving on things, raising the reading scores of children. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christy Gilroy Reynolds, Andy Bond, and then Russell Sherrick. Welcome. Hello. Uh, so I'm here to speak in favor of uh, Ms. Owens' resolution. And um, I think it's pretty obvious in a lot of ways that uh, our students need protection um, from things like the model policy, regardless of who comes up with these policies and these ideas in Richmond or, or Washington. We already have different laws and <laughs> different policies that are supposed to protect our students. Um, but things like that model policy undermine those. Uh, I am a teacher in public schools. Um, I teach in Norfolk. My husband teaches in uh, uh, Virginia Beach, and my son is a student in Virginia Beach. Um, at my school, I am the sponsor of the Pride Alliance Club, which is the uh, Gay Straight Alliance, um, or the Gender and Sexuality Alliance. Um, it's a club for LGBTQ students, their friends, and allies. Uh, this week, we are having Pride Week, which uh, may or may not be the first time it's happened in my school. It's, uh, it's great. Tomorrow's Wednesday, so we'll be wearing pink. It's a Wednesday, we wear pink. And uh, yesterday and today, I witnessed something that was so cool. Um, my club, they had a table set up in the cafe, uh, and they were giving out pride buttons. Students were coming up, and they were selecting, you know, their flag or their pronouns or whatever, you know, they, whatever button they wanted to represent themselves. And they were so excited. And I just saw kids that I never saw before. Like, I never met them before. They never came to meetings before. Meetings aren't for everyone, you know? But these kids were just happy. They were just happy to be seen, right? They were just happy to be seen because as much as we say they're not allowed to be discriminated against, they hear it all the time. Unfortunately, every generation, and we all know it, every generation has that one group where maybe you're not supposed to discriminate against them, but guess what? People still consider it somehow an acceptable bias. Some people, not everyone. But these kids know, they hear, they hear certain people mocking them. They hear the snarkiness sometimes when people don't want to call them by the pronouns they ask for, things like that. The reason why I care about this so much, when I was 16, my best friend was outed by our school. It was a private school. Um, so, you know, private schools exist for those of you that like that kind of thing. Um, she was outed. To her parents, uh, they made her homeless. They threw all of her stuff out of a window. And, uh, the cruelty was actually the point. And I do believe um, that sometimes these model, model policies, the cruelty is the point. 
and our kids need protection from that kind of attitude. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andy Bond, then Rosa Sherrick, then Melissa Lukson. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to talk on a couple things, but I want to first talk about how you almost voted without us having input. It was information, and I think we would have gone just missed the opportunity to talk. And if that's what you want, I suggest revisiting that. If it's information, then you're going to hear from the public, and you should also tell people that when it's action, you might not. And that's OK. Just people should know Note that there would, should be some expectation that um, that we could talk about something. Regarding um, the library policy, or the, yeah. Um, my kids tell me that they could just go into the library. And at some point, sometimes there's library time, and sometimes between classes, or there's a chance to go into the library, which means checking out is not the check. Regarding um, Member Owen's resolution, first, I want to say thank you very much. Uh, I can't see you, but I'm looking right at where you sit normally. Um, the Trevor Project is no longer mentioned. The methodology is horrific, and so I'm grateful that, and I'm sorry that they're not, the kids aren't here, but they shouldn't use it as a reference, and I'm glad you didn't either. Um, because it's out of love that for those students that I appear. Um, I question, though, what is welcoming, safe, and inclusive? If we ask the kids, I imagine that the answer is, is going to be, don't tell my parents. But I emailed you all a couple articles today. And one of them included this graph that shows that about to 2010, before all of the uh, cross-sex treatment became available, states that didn't, in, that didn't require parental involvement and states that did require parental involvement uh, with medical care, suicide was about the same. But they went, this guy went back and looked and found seconds. this big spike. And that big spike is in states that allow minors access to health care without parental consent. So I ask you to ensure that welcoming, safe, and inclusive doesn't mean don't tell the parents that the parents are going to be involved. Because I don't think we want the extra And that suicides. is time. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Russell Sherrick, Melissa Lukeson, and then Daphne Stagg. Russell Sherrick. Melissa Lukeson. Welcome. Hello. My name is Melissa Lukeson, and my pronouns are she, her. Wow, what a wild two weeks, huh? I am here to correct the record publicly. Some folks find my, com my public comments offensive. Well, I am offended at the audacity of people who think they can write policy that affects 65,000 children and their families when they pronounce, mispronounce, excuse me, the word cello. Turnabout is fair play. You can tell jokes and make degrading comments about my physical appearance, but what you're not going to do is tell lies about me. Immediately following my last speech, the administration and school board attorney was asked to review my remarks for alleged threats. I understand they did so independently and came to the same conclusion. No threats were made. So some folks kept digging and through FOIA requested the security camera footage around and outside the auditorium, which was initially puzzling. Then the narrative started to come to life all around me, literally everywhere. On social media, people were doxing my business, calling me names, issue, issuing veiled and actual threats to me and my business. Senate candidate attorney Tim Anderson declared open season on me using my name, image, and twisting my words to incite fear. When the camera 
footage didn't produce the proof of me being the menace they were accusing me of. Mr. Pickens, a pastor of New Day Church, emailed Ms. Manning expressing fear of two women while he was challenging some LGBTQ plus students outside the meeting. But he didn't report it to security that night or the next day. He chose to wait nine days. Thankfully, video evidence proved the contrary. When all of that effort didn't yield the crop of lies they were farming, they released a statement condemning me. Rage farmers doing what they do best, leverage the media and manipulate the public to sell their lies. I will reiterate, just because you don't like the words coming out of my mouth does not mean I am threatening. You can say I am mean, but you cannot lie about me. Besides discovering how repulsive humans can be, the emails showed me something else. Every accusation is a confession. When the Manning Five accused me of being a political operative and pushing a political agenda, I must ask, Ms. Manning, oh, who's not here, why did you forward constituents emails you received to Brian Kerwin, a paid political player? And Ms. Brown, why do you only seconds. respond to emails from constituents that favor your political agenda and then send them the link to sign up to speak? You didn't send one response to people who think differently than you. Was that an attempt to stack the deck in your favor? The internet allows people to dehumanize others. Well, I'm a human, I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a friend, I'm an employer. I'm intelligent and well-spoken and remain committed to the public's right to know. And while I pose no risk of physical harm to anyone, I can see how some of you sitting on a throne of lies view me as a threat. And that is time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Daphne Stagg, Karen Gilbert, and then Jean Fitzhaw. Daphne Stagg. Welcome. Hello. Um, I am just amazed. Um, I see again that we have uh, a bunch of special interest groups and minors here to speak on behalf of explicit material, pornography, um, like the ALA, whose president, Emily Drabinsky, after being elected president of the American Library Association, tweeted, I'm a Marxist lesbian and I won. And then she tweeted, I just cannot believe that a Marxist lesbian who believes that collective power, communism, is possible, is the president-elect of the ALA library. That's, that's a big shoot it, Phil, isn't it? Wow, Marxism is communism. Did you know that? Um, but I must commend the children on their well-spoken speeches. Um, unfortunately, they don't understand they are being sexually groomed and exploited by their drama teachers and debate club mentors and coerced by the Marxist ALA group. <clears throat> And you are giving them the pathway. Sexually explicit material is harmful to children's minds. And you know this. And why do you lie about it? Parents are not calling to ban books. They are calling for notification of explicit material, pornography, that Miss Anderson calls it, available in the schools, library, and the classrooms as the students have been uh, reporting. Uh, pornography, not classic literature, like you lie about. And hey, librarians, remember when the joy of gay sex was banned from Virginia schools in 2013? Do any of you remember that? You allow the minors to speak and send letters and discount the voices of the actual parents and the adults. You don't work for the children. You don't work for special interest groups. You work for the parents and the taxpayers. The parents don't give you permission to provide pornography to the children. Two seconds. No matter how many times you lie about it. And this is not about some sexual theory. This is about sexually explicit material, pornography. 
and like To Kill a Mockingbird and Mark Twain, maybe the ALA needs to teach librarians the definition of pornography. Explicit material is the definition of pornography. And that is time. Our next speaker is Karen Gilbert, Jean Fitzhaw, and then Teresa Lango. Welcome. Thank you, and good evening. And thank you for being here, and thank you for listening to all of us. Um, Karen Gilbert, this is not my first time speaking. I am speaking on 6.65. Put students first. Seek growth. Be open to change. Do great work together. Value differences. These are your words, and they're great words. But how will those words reconcile with the efforts of several current board members to create words and phrases that result in pulling books from school libraries? How does the process of creating phrases that would allow someone to limit books in our libraries and classrooms be a committee of three that decide what words our students get to read or use to define themselves? I believe parents have a right to know what is available through the school system. I believe it's their responsibility to speak to their children at home, to look in their school bags to see what is being brought home. Keep the responsibility of instilling their family values at their home. Maybe spending thousands of hours would be better, better spent addressing and exploring how to provide teachers and staff with more dollars to take home rather than to fulfill a personal crusade. I also think the number of 10-year-old middle school students who may stumble upon what Ms. Manning chose to read out loud are about the same number as parents who filled out the form currently available, which I understand is around 12. What parents would not rejoice their child reading a thousand hours. Maybe the kind of parent that defaces a book. No banning, no list, never again. It began with lists and banning books. Never again. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jean Fitzhaw and then Teresa Langle. Welcome. Hey, thanks, guys. Boy, it's late. 1-7, uh, uh, no. 6-65, yeah. The Owens resolution, no. Uh, and I think Solaris was your best bet on that one, if you could follow the bouncing ball of her logic. Self-government is a grave responsibility, and this school board is a function of self-government. We must collectively ensure that what goes into those buildings in Virginia Beach with school children achieves very specific outcomes, and they are virtue, excellence, and freedom. Each of you is empowered to make wise decisions based on proven precedents, never whimsy, never malfeasance, and never an appeal to the lower nature. You must tread very lightly on the grounds of any decision before you make it a policy. You must tread very lightly on the grounds of making a policy out of trends or movements that have nothing to do with academic achievement. You must tread very lightly on the grounds of insinuating that preferences are rules, that opinions are facts, or that the few hold hostage the many to their demands. We will not tolerate malfeasance. We will not tolerate the propagation of lies. The school board is, uh, is responsible for the promotion of truth and duty requires that you defeat the lie. There are lies abroad and they must be defeated. Lie number one, the wicked are compassionate. They are not. They are mean-spirited, base, and corrupt. Lie number two, all opinions are equal. They are not. Many opinions are dangerous, partial, or simply unproven. They corrupt good manners and isolate and poison the minds of those who espouse them. And they are to be opposed, not embraced. An open mind to lies is not a virtue, it's a horrible handicap which cripples the unwary. We will not allow it to happen in buildings where school children are present. 
Lie number three, the individual is the arbiter of truth, false. The collective wisdom of the ages goes before us. We have the genius of history to light our way. Common sense is simply the lesson that history teaches. We don't believe every word that comes out of anyone's mouth. We push back on stupidity, ignorance, ignorance, and foolishness. No one person speaks out of their experience and then makes it a rule for all to follow. Truth is the light of the world, and you, and you must follow it. You must cherish the virtues of decency, respect, self-discipline, modesty, honor, hard work, diligence, self-responsible behavior, the willingness to learn, and the milk of human kindness. Be very careful that you follow the injunction of the only voice qualified to make this declaration. It would be better for him and her to have a millstone around his or her neck and be cast into the sea than to offend, i.e. corrupt, deceive, mislead, or harm one of and these that is little time. ones. Our next speaker is Teresa Langle. Appreciate it. Welcome. Wow, I had a speech prepared. This always happens to me when I speak. I seem to come last. And I've heard a lot of dissension from the parents or, or the um, citizens here that have waited all night and will continue to wait all night each time that we come. Um, I wanted to say about, I, I think that there should be a list of books for uh, the new books coming in apparently, from what I understand, that parents can look at and see which ones they want. Not, not, not out, out of them. If my neighbor decides, because I haven't looked at a book, that they're gonna go ahead and share it because I haven't ran over and found out what they have, and they say, well, you didn't out out of it. No, I wanna opt in on it. So I think opting in on books might be a little bit better. That might be something to review. Um, as far as the student representation, I think that's daunting. There are 64,000 students. That is, um, with people with so many varied beliefs and opinions out of students, I see that as a fiasco happening. They have voices at school through their guidance counselors and everything. They need to be worrying about what's going on at school. Um, also, the position on the school boards are elected positions, and even that ratio isn't as daunting, uh, member to civilians. And lastly, that's why we elect a school board, and that is to serve all aspects of running our schools for each district. Otherwise, a person from every spectrum of the school community, including all employees, will need a seat. You're there, you're there to represent everybody, and that includes students. On, the, on Jessica's resolution, I think that we already have discriminatory. I didn't hear anything mentioned about people of different faith or uh, maybe people that are discriminated against for any reason. Discrimination is a broad term. I think that we really get into trouble when we start minimizing or picking certain groups to say. You know, I've had things happen when I was in the school um, where I've had to take kids in for calling people names and things like that, and it's usually handled. Um, so there are already rules for that. 30 seconds. Um, uh, let's see. I think that was pretty much it. I just wanted to say to reiterate, one, I'm in favor of making sure that parents have a list. I do not agree with student representation on the board, and um, I don't agree with the resolution. I think it's, it's, it's basically just pacifying, in my opinion. And that is time. Thank you. Madam Chair, that was our last in-person speaker. We are going to move on to our online speakers. Uh, the first online speaker is not online, so we're going to the second one. Chris Barlett, please unmute. Welcome. Chris Barlett, please unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Words matter. 
Gautama Buddha once said, whatever words we utter should be chosen with care for people will hear them and be influenced by them for good or ill. I'm the parent of a Virginia Beach student and the husband of a Virginia Beach library media specialist. So you can imagine when this board proposed a change to the wording of school board policy 665, it was a topic of discussion in our house. You've heard numerous speakers before me mention the newly added definition of lewd as predominantly crude and offensive in a sexual way. Why did this new language need to be added? I mean, it's certainly not for clarity. The new definition is about as clear as an IKEA instruction manual. So that begs a more important question. Whose moral standard decides which book should be removed? I mean, let's face it. What's crude to you may not offend me. And to be honest, listening to some recent meetings, it kind of concerns me that some of you sitting on the board might want to apply your Christian values to the curation of our public library collections. I mean, that really is my concern. I'm speaking to our public school board that gets its funding from our public tax dollars. Let me repeat that, our public school system, meaning for everyone. It's not meant to protect one group and their belief system. It's meant to represent everyone. That's stated in your mission. Empower every student in partnership with the entire community. By your own established standard, you must welcome different cultures, lifestyles, and worldviews. If you want to shelter your children from opposing beliefs, I'm all for you seeking out a private education. But promoting your beliefs at the cost of someone else's in our public schools, that's wrong. What message would it send to those students? Are they worthless? Do their lives matter less? Despite what you might feel, they don't. They matter a great deal. We're all worthy of love and kindness. Children who read find a window to the world and learn humanity through the lens of other people's lives. They develop emotional intelligence and empathy that enables them to connect with other people's experiences. I think we can all agree that protecting Virginia Beach's children is paramount, but I'd argue we're already doing that. Your librarians have spent years learning best practices for positively impacting our students and seconds. helping them achieve their best. I wouldn't dream of telling you how to say sell a house or run a church, but just stop politicizing the library and let the librarians do their jobs. So please vote no on 665. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paula Chang. Please unmute. Welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? This is yes. On? Yes, we can. Oh, I'm not so much, Mr. Briggs. I'm sorry. It's time for the board to address the preferential scheduling of student speakers. Also on Owen's resolution, no. Children on the school board, no. At the last school board meeting, Mrs. Riggs attempted to remove citizens in, from the audience after they politely, briefly, and quietly clapped following the remarks of the first adult speaker, a clear violation of their rights. And this is very significant because the clapping lasted two seconds and did not disrupt the meeting, decorum, or the next speaker, who I know, by the way, because it was me. My ability to speak was only disrupted by your attempt, Mrs. Riggs, to remove a tax-paying citizen who broke no bylaw, as bylaw 148 section C states there will be no, quote, excessive cheering, booing, clapping, or similar activity that disrupts a meeting. Those who quietly clapped for two seconds did not violate that bylaw. Bylaw 148 does not give you the right to violate First Amendment rights of expression because clapping is allowed. The board last amended Bylaw 148 on December 2022 when non-disruptive clapping was left in. And you at that time, Mrs. Riggs, were chair of the PRC. In December of 2022. So we have the right to clap and thankfully Mrs. Brown and Mr. Culpepper helped guide you to a more correct outcome. So polite clapping at the last minute triggered you, Mrs. Riggs, but what could be interpreted as intimidating and veiled threats by another speaker against conservative speakers, which is against bylaw 148, seemed just fine. No response regarding decorum, no warning. And I will say, you've disrupted other meetings, Mrs. Riggs. Remember when you got up from your school board, illegally grabbed the sign of a speaker at the podium and threw it on the floor by the wall, violating the amendment, the First Amendment rights of that speaker who had to retrieve the sign while the clock was running. It was also a decorum violation by you. Remember in summer 2021, when you and the entire board stormed out of the meeting, not once, but twice, because speakers majority, the majority of speakers disliked the overwhelming messages of the speakers who opposed masking, CRT, and vaccinations. 
And how about when the board violated the First Amendment right of a senior citizen Marine veteran when he tried to bring a small flag to the meeting? You, as PRC chair, tried to justify that abhorrent action by defining the flag as a piece of cloth that might obstruct the view of others. That's pathetic. My point, you are chair, Mrs. Riggs, and your behavior should reflect restraint, dignity, and impartiality. You must earn our respect, and your actions at the last meeting did not do that. You should lead by protecting the rights of all people and not, and not use 148 Section E, which gives the chair some leeway, as an excuse to violate the First Amendment rights of speakers saying at a meeting that no one can clap. You have a duty to treat citizens legally and with profound respect to your superiors. You promised us that when you took the position as board chair. We all have the right to clap for bylaws and I intend to do so following bylaws when so moved. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dan Chang, please unmute. Good evening. Welcome. At the last policy review committee meeting, Mrs. Anderson acknowledged that parents have responsibility for their children. She specifically mentioned the responsibility to be aware of what their children is reading. She is correct. I'm sure Mrs. Anderson must be aware that in order to take responsibility for what the child, what their child reads, the parent must exercise their rights as parents and it is the duty of the school board to respect those rights. It is in fact without rights, you can't have responsibility. So thank you, Mrs. Anderson. Our Virginia code agrees with Mrs. Anderson as code 1-240.1 states a parent has a fundamental right to make decisions concerning the upbringing, education and care of the parent's child. That involves library material. Thus the changes to policy 6-65 must be passed and passed unanimously because for a parent to take the responsibility for what their child is exposed to in the schools via curriculum, Chromebooks, or via library material requires parents to exercise their right to know the material that their child is exposed to. There is no reasonable justification for the school board administration to deny any of the changes in 6-65. Parents are busy enough with raising their children and other family and professional responsibilities to have the time to call through the entire BBCPS library to know what books should they opt their children out of. They need assistance with this. A list does that for them. No books are removed. We have a school board, we have school board members and library media specialists state the exorbitant amounts of time it will take to review the books through, though the LMSs are paid by the parents and citizens to oversee the library material. If this is such a major task for many LMSs, how is it reasonable to claim parents should be able to know what is in the libraries for their consideration to opt out their children? It is a weak and defective argument. Mrs. Anderson's recognition of parental responsibilities and thus parental rights flows through all aspects of the schools, including Mrs. Owen's resolutions. Code in our culture state that the parents are the persons who make the decisions, not to just give input. Regarding the care and upbringing 30 seconds. of the child, and we all know this, parents decide names, pronouns, psychological counseling, et cetera. Because parents, as Mrs. Anderson stated, have responsibilities, thus they have the rights. It is the clear, it is clear and simple, Anything done by this board in attempt to weaken parental rights is wrong. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brian Sullivan. Please unmute. Welcome. I come here today to voice support for the LGBTQ plus resolution. All our students are precious and their success is important to the overall success of the Virginia Beach Public Schools. Any form of discrimination, which predictably translates into bullying, is detrimental to the entirety of the Virginia Beach School community. Feeling a lack of belonging and an increased sense of social isolation are historically recognized social factors that drive suicide. As someone who has spent 30 years working with at-risk youth, I can attest the depths of this type of despair. It is the inclusiveness that is generated by a resolution such as the one before us that actually keeps 
everybody safe. It creates hope. Experts in the field keep reminding us that a trusting school environment is the basis of school safety. Mm -hmm. In fact, one could argue that opposing the type of resolution is an act of hostility that willfully and knowingly creates an unsafe school environment. Inclusiveness and employment is beneficial. Organizations like the OECD and the McKenzie and Company they are reminding us that diversity in the workplace is sought after because it increases profitability and overall success. Businesses have understood this model for hundreds of years. Diversity and inclusion drives innovation. Accordingly, diversity and inclusion are important to college recruiters. Do we really want Virginia Beach students to garner a reputation among college recruiters that they have difficulty getting along with others? In closing, I would just like to, again, thank school board member Jessica Owens for this resolution. It benefits the entirety of the Virginia Beach school community in many positive ways. It will also act to provide a well-respected educational experience that will benefit all of our students, as well as the future they will be participating in. This resolution can save a life. Thank you again for this opportunity to speak. Our next speaker is Jerome Bell. Please unmute. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would say this, you know, no one tried, no one complained about how long training was going to take when you ran that diversity training, you know, that you did mighty fast into the schools. And I hope Mrs. Owens is still listening. You know, why did you add and adults to your rewrite? I thought this was about the safety of kids, yet you now slip in and adults. That in itself make your resolution voided and its intended purpose a total bullshit. It's truly not needed anyway. Anyway, these kids keep saying that these LGBTQ students are being discriminated against. How many kids have been suspended or written up, uh, discriminated against, or attacking these kids? Can someone on the board please give me those numbers and the percentage? One girl even said that someone called her an F word. It's actually calling someone a name a discriminatory act. How many non- LGBTQ girls within the school system on a daily basis get caught bitch, slut, or whore. How many times is nigga said on a daily basis describing primarily the black males? Some have said the LGBTQ kids are more likely to have violence perpetrated against them, yet most of the violence in the schools are perpetrated against straight black kids. Most of the fights are straight black kids against other straight black kids. Where is the resolution for these kids, Mrs. Owens, and their safety? People have referenced the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, Amendment, albeit inappropriately, because the 14th Amendment was actually written for newly freed slaves uh, of the 13th Amendment, but people who use the 14th when they have agenda, so you know what, I have an agenda too. If this resolution is voted for and passed or get for one protective class, I submit, I want a, a resolution submitted for the safety and for the supportive educational environment for these black children to be safe from violence, name calling that they suffer through daily in Virginia Beach public schools. And I will personally see to it that a class action lawsuit is started for the protection of these black children whose equal protection rights are being violated in accordance with the 14th Amendment of the United States. In these meetings, I have only heard these, these uh, transgender kids would have called themselves names, you know, but these are the names that they're demanding that we reference them by, they, them, he, and she. We even heard the Little Rock Nine mentioned to try to push this agenda. Why do these groups always try and wrap the oppression and true discrimination of black people during the 60s in the Civil Rights Act like it's comparing apples to apples when it's truly comparing seconds. apples to bananas? And being a black man whose people have actually been oppressed, I'm sick of it and it needs to stop. Fight your own battles on your own morals if you choose, but your agenda is not and has never been the black agenda of the civil rights. Truth be known, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were written specifically for newly freed black slaves and black people. They were called black rights, not civil rights. This is about the kids wanting their way away from their parents, and you guys are giving And that is time. Our next speaker is Anastasia Wells. Please unmute. Hello. Welcome. Several board members argued against 665, stating it was, quote, unnecessary and, quote, already covered by existing opt-out policies. 
Please explain to me how then does that same logic not also apply to the resolution where existing anti-discriminatory policies already exist. The mental gymnastics here are impressive. I'm in favor of 665 labor materials, library materials, and implore the board to vote yes. This policy offers a balanced approach to giving safeguards for our younger elementary students while increasing the transparency for library media containing explicit and lewd content at the higher grade levels. This policy does not impose a significant burden on staff, nor is it calling for a book ban. The lewd content is clearly defined and the policy identifies how it applies to both existing and future materials. This policy is the bare minimum step that this board is obligated to take to protect and preserve our youngest students. The push and desire for sexual and explicit content in our libraries is confusing and disturbing, and this is not even a religious plea. As we all know, more is caught than taught, and media is a tremendous, has a tremendous capacity to teach. Excessive media where the content is violent or sexually explicit increases high-risk behaviors, skews children's worldview, and alters their capacity for successful and sustained human relationships. Exposure to pornographic material increases the likelihood a child will develop an addiction as well as a mood and anxiety disorder. So why would we then knowingly and willingly endanger our children in this manner? The bare minimum this board must do is vote yes to 665. Regarding the resolution, transparency and honesty would really save us all a lot of time. This resolution is not about celebrating how the LGBTQI plus students have overcome adversities. It's about thwarting the model 2022 policy. The semantics used in this resolution and in public presentation continue to dance around the facts. The timing of this resolution is not lost on us. Virginia Beach Public Schools were once a gravitating factor that drew people to this area, but it is now quickly becoming the reason that families are looking to move or leave the public school system in its entirety. Even in its new form, this resolution is paving the way for, quote, gender expressive students to occupy spaces and activities designed with respect to biological differences. I know, love, and cherish my LGBTQ plus friends and family and empathize with their position. 30 seconds. However, this resolution is directly aimed at the model policies and is ultimately posturing teachers and school staff to intervene between the sacred child-parent relationship. I will not co-parent with this board, and I ask the board to vote no to this resolution. I leave you with this. A child's innocence is the one gift that once stolen can never be replaced. That is your responsibility. Protect the innocence of our children that are here in the school system under your purview. Thank you. Our next speaker is Annie Palumbo. Please unmute. Welcome. Good evening. Well, thank you. It's 1130 at night and um, we all have to work tomorrow. Most of us, I get up at 6 a.m. So um, letting the kids stack the deck in the front is ridiculous. You know, summer's right around the corner. They're not going to be in school anymore. It's funny. They're too little or too immature to stay up late to speak, but they could choose their pronouns. Unfreaking believable. Anyway, as I'm listening to this meeting off and on tonight, I've never seen such a lack of morals and such manipulation. Here we are, parents, grandparents, and citizens trying to prove to you that we aren't book burners. How have we gotten here? Why are we trying to prove we aren't book burners? It should be you proving why you aren't pedophiles who are distributing pornography to minors. Unfreaking believable. We certainly live in a clown world. It makes me so sad for the 64,000 students in Virginia Beach Public Schools. These books are straight out pornography. I read some of them tonight again. Have you read any of them? I bet you haven't. So I'm not in favor of parents opting out because these books should not be in our libraries. How are we even here? Why aren't all of the adults that are on the dais saying these books are pornography? They should not be in our schools. Shame on each and every one of you. You know this is wrong, yet you are cowards. You are too afraid what the in crowd will think about you if you go outside the line. You have no business being within five feet from a child, much less in a position making decisions for what is good for these kids. Ms. Owens, your resolution is a joke. It's nothing more than words. Anti-discrimination policies already exist. So what is this really all about? Just trying to get on the bandwagon of the latest trend? I have a question for you. What about the rights of the heterosexual students? Do you care about them? FYI, Governor Yunkin's model policies will, will squash all of this and stop wasting everybody's time. Anyway, I always try to think, what would Jesus do? I could tell you one thing, 
Jesus would not have these books in your mind. So with that being said, I'm going to take the remainder of my time to pray for our schools and for all of you. Jesus, please bless our schools in Virginia Beach. Please change the hearts of some of these school board members who think that it's okay that pornography is in our schools. Bless the hearts of these speakers who, thinks, who think that, oh, these are book burners. Change the hearts of these people. Bless our children. Protect them from anybody who wants to cause harm on them. Remove these books. 30 seconds. Rise up, rise up people to fight for this like we are and help them to not waver and start trying to defend themselves saying, oh, but we're not book burners. Please, we're not book burners. Help raise brave men and women to say, we're not book burners. They're the pedophiles. And you know what? You guys can laugh all you want because I'm praying, but that's, I think, what Jesus would say. This is not right. You guys should not be distributing this. So God, put a hedge of protection around those children in Virginia Beach schools and change the hearts of those that, that are on that diet. Time. So don't like we eat. Our next speaker is Vic Nichols. Please unmute. Thank you. I'm for policy 6-65 and against the transgender resolution that opposes Governor Youngkin's proposed policy. No kids on the school board. Their brains don't mature until they're in their 20s. That's by medical, strict medical evidence. In the documentary, Hitler's Children, the Nazis put children forward in the same way. Their mental health is horrible due in part to being treated as adults when they're not mature enough to handle it. Girls are worse than boys due to the hardcore porn and the libraries treating them as objects, as was read earlier in the meeting. Parents have to sign off for kids to be photographed or quoted by name by reporters. Has the school board done that for these same kids as the video is the official meeting record? I believe the speaker order is illegal. Any content-based restrictions must be necessary to achieve a compelling state, or in this case, school board interest. Policies must be consistently enforced on a content-neutral basis. Having the one viewpoint kids speak first means that the board is promoting viewpoint discrimination. This restriction is not absolutely necessary to achieve a compelling government purpose. Therefore, it is unconstitutional. Remember this. Pedophilia being legalized is next. Your school curriculum, it's porn that they can obtain here, as otherwise this material given to minors would get you charges. The teachers, the administration, members that advocate any material desensitizing vulnerable kids to aberrant sexual concepts does half of the predator's work. Prove me wrong. I'm welcome to hearing that. You all know how to contact me. Prove me wrong. Thank you. Speaker number 10 is not online, so we will go next to Ivy Riley Plurk. Please unmute. Welcome. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. My name is Ivy O'Reilly Plurk. My daughter, who is a transgender woman, graduated from Green Run, and I have family members who will soon be starting the Virginia Beach uh, City Public School System. I am here to speak in support of the resolution that will protect students from discrimination and harassment. I am also a proud member of the LGBTQIA community as a bisexual woman and have worked as a volunteer and activist for years to support and uplift my community. I believe it is all our responsibility to make this world better than we found it, especially for our children. LGBTQIA people are being targeted in this country. This is a fact supported by data and discussed worldwide by human rights groups and organizations. Black trans individuals are at the highest risk. Our kids see this and feel the effects in their daily lives. They need to feel safe. Approximately 45% of LGBTQIA youth have considered or attempted suicide in the last year. And 40% of homeless youth identify as LGBTQIA Young queer people who feel their schools are uh, queer affirming report lower rates of suicide attempts. While we all wish these kids had a comforting and supportive homes, that is simply not the case. Studies show only 24% of queer students feel supported at home and fewer than one in three trans and non-binary youth feel supported. This makes school a necessary safe space for students Inclusion and diversity creates an environment of empathy and community. 
Transgender, non-binary, and gender non-conforming people are currently the most targeted within our communities. We must remember that gender dysphoria is a condition and can be treated with social transition and a supportive environment. This includes recognition and acknowledgement of pronouns and cho chosen names, ability to use the bathroom that best corresponds with their gender, access to LGBTQIA plus books and materials, and so much more. My own daughter found a safe haven in an after-school club that had nothing to do with being transgender, but was welcoming, whether she was in or out of the LGBTQIA plus community. We know marginalized groups require laws and policies to protect their rights. Please remember this seconds. resolution is about protecting the people within our school system because yes, adults are also students in this school system. There is nothing in this current resolution about sports, merely about something schools have always said they are against, bullying and harassment. Please do not let the harmful voices of some threaten the students of our Virginia Beach school system. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Our next speaker is Arthur Basseri. Please unmute. Good evening. Thank you, everybody. I'm the father of a gay Eagle Scout. Uh, my, um, I, I knew my son was gay a long time before he knew. Uh, and because of that, um, that, the other part about him is he's a, he's a caring old soul. Uh, he's very sensitive to injustice, and uh, he uh, uh, was just a very sensitive person. Well, again, I knew he was gay before he did, and uh, for throughout his middle school years and early high school years, uh, again, before he knew he was, before he came out to us or even himself, we made sure that uh, we provided a safe, understanding, and inclusive environment for him because we were afraid he was going to commit suicide. For five years, every day, I wondered if that was going to be the last day we would see our child alive. He was that, it was that scary. And I, I'm not kidding about this. Every day, wondering, is he going to commit suicide today? Are we doing everything we can to provide that environment, let him know that he is accepted once he accepted the fact himself that he is gay? Um, and we did that. We provided that safe place. Uh, when he came out to us, he thanked us for understanding and for accepting him. Um, and so this resolution, uh, what it does in my view, is to provide that same environment that we gave to our son, that just that gives them that environment at school. And so many of these children just need to know that they're safe, that they're understood, and that there's not gonna be any um, discriminatory actions from the school board or the schools towards them. Um, we need this and they need this to help keep them alive. These kids are in discernment. They're wondering, they don't know, uh, you know, am I gay, am I straight? What's going on with me? And this uh, proposal will help provide that environment in my view and give them that, that open space. So I, I believe it, it sends that positive signal to our youth that they need 30 to seconds. keep our, our vulnerable children alive. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Speaker number 13 is not online. So our next speaker will be Sandra Scheinebarger. Please unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Oh, thanks. Good evening. Um, regarding the resolution from May 9th, I wanted to point out again how well spoken and seemingly well adjusted the transgender students with parental support for their gender issues were. Uh, fostering dysfunction in the form of keeping information from parents is not healthy. Uh, I like to think we can trust our teachers who are all trained professional mandated reporters to follow guidelines for reporting suspected abuse. Speaking of trusting our schools, I support policy 665. Um, the current policy in place is insufficient 
Um, my grandmother was a school librarian, so I consulted her regarding the four to 500 books being added annually. As I assumed, she confirmed that a likely reason for adding such an unmanageable number was so the department could keep their taxpayer funded budget amounts for the following year. Since a book provides that provided instructions for a sex act found its way to our library shelves, school library shelves, one cannot help but wonder if overspending was the main reason. It makes one wonder if our school libraries might be a little bit overfunded if someone is ordering books just to spend money. I appreciate the efforts thus far to generate a guide list of materials that have sexually graphic content. I look forward to seeing this reasonable compromise be approved so we can move on to other important items. A willingness to work together would really be nice to see, and sadly we did not see that from a couple of school board members, one who wanted to just strike the item. I support proposal 7-45. VBCPS is not able to accommodate every sport that exists and should want to still support outstanding achievements for our students. I'm not talking about just winning games or winning a champion, just, just something extraordinary uh, to, that they achieved. Um, our elementary schools are recognizing activities outside the classroom on a smaller scale, so that's aligned with the proposal. This is um, a reasonable adjustment to the current policy. Um, where one would think reasonable exceptions could and would be made in support of keeping students on the right track and steering them away from default illicit activities that are sadly pushed on teens and have been for decades. 30 seconds. Well, while I understand the rules, it is concerning that a current policy is borrowing a real reasonable request to have the school board publicly support a student who has excelled in ice skating. Um, the BMX rider from um, Princess Anne High School who went all the way to the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, he should have been recognized and supported by BBCPS as well. And students who win skateboarding, surfing, or even roller skating contests, they deserve recognition. And um, that is and time. Ms. Martin. And our next speaker was is Rob Bowen. He was in person, switched to online. So Rob Bowen, please unmute. Welcome. Thanks, school board. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, Regina for getting me moved to online. Um, when I saw the list come out, I thought I had uh, scheduled to or signed up to get pretty early on the list, but it looks like 21 kids made in front of me, even though I was number 11 for adults, which I think needs to change. Um, they can learn from, you know, not being treated differently than everybody else in this entire school district, parents included. And um, plus, you know, it's 1137 right now. Two weeks ago, I think I spoke right at midnight because I also had to change um, to online because the list was just too long. Um, so thanks, Virginia, for getting me out and put here. Um, so I want to talk about the uh, the libraries. You know, the library the librarians know what books are in their libraries, and it's even uh, ridiculous to even have some of the books that are already there, especially the ones that uh, Manning read from. Like these books are irredeemable. Like trying to justify, you got to look at the entire book when you have excerpts like that. Um, like nothing good can come from any of that and like how are these books even getting into the libraries themselves um is there a you know a, a supplier a buyer in the on the on the board or in the administration that you know sends the schools these books or are these you know curated by the librarians themselves like they should know what books are coming in and especially with this new policy that you know even the new books are going to be you know read through like I think that's a really great idea and to to target those to put them on a list so that you know we can we can know what's in our school's library because if they're, if they're saying that the parents have to read every 10,000 books then they can read 10,000 books too. Um, and then going to Owen's resolution I think it's ridiculous and I think the temper tantrum that Melnick gave about the library uh, resolu or the, the library policy kind of really shared the exact same thing with the Owens resolution. 
There's already stuff on the books that y'all voted for and is in place that protects all seconds. these things. And so it's ridiculous to have something that targets one group where it leaves out others that has been said with, with other speakers. And I think that it's just needs to go away. And um, I do think like what Callan said, uh, we are coarsening society and the school library should not be a source of that. Good night. And Madam Chair, that was our last speaker for this evening. Okay, we are going to go to our consent agenda. School board, um, we're gonna start with the resolution. Juneteenth will be read by Ms. Martin. Um, the recommendation of the general contractor, corporate landing, middle school, central heating, and cooling plant air handling units, the AHU and heat recovery unit, AHRU. Are there any objections to the school board voting on the consent agenda items? And if so, please identify any item that should be moved to the action agenda. Hearing no call to move an item from the consent agenda, I call for a motion to approve all of the items on the consent agenda as presented. So moved by Ms. Uh, Brown, do I have a second? And seconded by Ms. Martin. So now Ms. Uh, Martin, would you please read the Juneteenth resolution? Whereas Juneteenth commemorates the day freedom was proclaimed to all enslaved people in the South by the Union General Gordon Granger, who arrived in Galveston, Texas, proclaiming the authority of the United States over Texas in the name of then President Andrew Johnson on June 19, 1865, more than two and a half years after signing the Emancipation Proclamation by President Abraham Lincoln. And whereas, not caring so much to which day of freedom had come as to the fact it had come, the freed men and women referred to this day as Juneteenth, which provides the historical reference for Juneteenth National Freedom Day, also known as Emancipation Day, Emancipation Celebration, and Freedom Day to commemorate the June 19, 1865 announcement of the abolition of slavery in the state of Texas and in the general in general, the emancipation of enslaved African Americans throughout the Confederacy, and whereas Americans of all ethnic backgrounds, creeds, cultures, and religions share in a common love of respect for freedom, as well as determination to protect their right to freedom, the freedom to choose a life direction, manner of earning a livelihood, and creating a community in which free people live with dignity, and whereas, although remembering and celebrating Juneteenth promotes the unique lived experience, plight, and persistence of African American, African, and Black peoples, it, is also, it also provides an opportunity for those not of this demographic to seek knowledge and awareness, obtain skills necessary to interact and communicate in a global society, and to learn from the past to better serve all current and future generations. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Virginia Beach City Public School Board observes Juneteenth and other months of cultural remembrance as the first step to acknowledging our core values and commitments to advance educational equity, cultural competency, and accountability, and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board, adopt, adopted by the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach this 23rd day of May, 2023. Thank you. So we've had a motion um, to accept this and a second. All in favor, please raise your hand. Ms. Owens, how do you vote? I vote yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have nine ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. We're down to action, personnel report, administrative appointments. I call for a motion to approve the May 23rd, 2023 personnel report and administrative appointments. Do I have a motion? So moved by Mrs. Melnick, seconded by Mr. Culpepper. Is there any discussion? I call for a vote to approve the May 23rd, 2023 personnel report and administrative appointments. All in favor, please raise your hand. Ms. Owens, how do you vote? 
I vote yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have nine ayes. The motion did pass. Okay, and there are no administrative appointments this evening. Our federal grant applications to call for a motion to approve the federal grant applications as presented in the agenda packet. Do I have a motion? So moved. Mrs. Anderson and seconded by Mrs. Martin. Is there any discussion? If you remember, I just wanted to say there was an, um, uh, a memo that went out from Dr. Kip Rogers on, I think it was May the 2nd, about that grant. Okay, It talks about the Title I schools, the Title II, and all of that information if you want to go back and look at that further. Um, so all in favor, oh, yeah, all in favor, please raise your hand. Ms. Owens, how do you vote? I vote yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have nine ayes. The motion did pass. The next one is the new assignment of school board member to the PPEA planning advisory team for the Williams Elementary School in the Bayside 6th grade campus planning advisory team. I call for a motion to approve the new assignment of the school board member Kimberly A. Melnick to the Williams Elementary School and Base High Sixth Grade Campus Planning Advisory Team, replacing school board member Jessica Owens. Do I have a motion? So moved by Ms. Martin, seconded by Mrs. Anderson. Is there any discussion? I call for um, a vote to approve the assignment of Kimberly A. Melnick to replace Jessica Owens on the Williams Elementary School and Base High Sixth Grade Campus Planning Advisory Team. All in favor, please raise your hand. Ms. Owens, how do you vote? I vote yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have nine ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. Now we are at committee organization. Um, our board reports. Does Do any school board members have anything to report? As a reminder, this is time for short reports. School board members may file full reports with the clerk to be distributed to other school board members. Okay, I do have something that I wanted to uh, report. Uh, I attended the um, very first graduation of our dual enrollment veterinary assistant graduation last night at the, the, um, uh, the ATC Center. There were 17 graduates. Um, it was, you know, a, a, uh, 17 girls actually that um, had, they got 17 credits for this. So it's the dual enrollment, which gave them um, um, the 17 credits towards TCC. And many of those girls are going to be going uh, further their education in veterinary school and moving forward. So it was really nice to see that. Um, the other thing is I wanna remind you guys, I didn't do this in administration, is don't forget our next meeting is June the 6th. And that will be our um, evaluation. It starts at four. For Dr. Spence, he sent us an email today. Um, you need to go into the email with the link that he provided because that's very important. It is a lot of information. If you didn't get a chance to click on it yet, which you probably haven't, so make sure you click on it sooner than later. You're going to need it to um, help you evaluate him fairly and concisely because there's, like I said, there'll be a lot of information in there. He has every department share information about him. Yes, Mr. Callan. Right, okay. So Mr. Callan will be out of town that day. Okay. Remember, if you cannot um, attend and you, you do want to leave any kind of comments or something, you can with the, sh the forms we provided you, and you can leave them with me if you want, if you get that opportunity. I understand if you don't, yeah, but um, you have that ability, okay? And the, the way we will evaluate him will be much like the way we evaluated our attorney tonight, okay? All right, thank you. Um, the, we don't have a reason to return to a closed session tonight. Right, that's what you and I talked about. So because of that, I am going. 
Well, yeah, I said our committee assignments will be talking about it. I said that in administrative matters. So don't forget about that too, okay? So this meeting is adjourned.